not yet. He did his part last night. Okay. Um, welcome, everybody, to the strategic planning workshop of the Villa Redoso Council. Uh, the mayor's running a little late. He'll show up here shortly. Uh, please stand with me for the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag and to the state of New Mexico flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I salute the flag of the state of New Mexico, the Zia symbol of perfect friendship among united cultures. Thank you. We have an agenda here. Uh, we got through the first two items, the legislative update from Senator William F. Burt. I don't know, was he coming in on Zoom or? He's up there. So. Yeah, there he is. Senator, the floor is yours. Thank you for your service up in the big city of Santa Fe. Well, thank you all very much. I'm, I'm honored to be here with you guys. Uh, uh, always a, a joy to see some smiling faces, uh, which we don't always have here in Santa Fe, uh, <laughs> as you may well know. Uh, and and I, I don't have, I haven't set aside any agenda, but I can uh, give you some quick overview of uh, the legislative session. We're into week two. Uh, this is a budget session. So uh, several bills, almost 200 bills have been uh, introduced into the Senate side, comparable number on the House side. Uh, and we only have about 20 days left. So getting bills through you know, committees and back the floors and getting them voted on is going to be somewhat of a challenge, especially when you're dealing with a budget. Uh, the budget uh, this year, as you know, we're, we're uh, flush with money. And for some reason, the state of New Mexico just feels if we got money, we're going to have to spend it. So they have laid out a plan to spend that. Uh, the uh, budget for our state, which has about 200, uh, excuse me, 2.3 million people in it, is going to go from $7.6 billion to $8.4 billion, uh, $800 million more in reoccurring funds, which quite frankly scares me to death uh, because if oil and gas goes south um, and marijuana, excuse me, cannabis is not up and running properly, or there are some hitches along that line, um, we may or may not be able to uh, fulfill that obligation to the people of New Mexico. So we're gonna be watching the budget process very, uh, very uh, closely. Uh, we do have the agencies coming before us. I am on Senate Finance. Uh, they're coming before me on Senate Finance to uh, talk about uh, their budget requests, why they need the increase and uh, uh, how that, that increase will be used. Um, there is not, one agency uh, asking for a flat budget or uh, also providing uh, much in the way of results over the last year or two years or three years as to why an increase in their budget makes sense. Uh, but that is uh, the way things are done here in Santa Fe. So we're doing our best, uh, quite frankly, to hold the line on some of the spending. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, we are in the minority, so we'll, we'll try and do our best. Um, that is a quick overview on the budget. Um, uh, personally, I, I would say that one of the bigger bills I think that we probably all are interested in is a bill uh, to take the uh, state income tax off of Social Security, which is a double tax uh, as far as I'm concerned. We're one of about 10 to 12 states left in the union that has not addressed this issue. Uh, it is high on the governor's priority list this year, and, and I'm sure that somehow we will be able to uh, uh, get that legislation done. And it basically, again, it would just take the state income tax off of Social Security uh, in the state, which will give uh, everyone on Social Security uh, more buying power, more dollars in the bank each and every month. And uh, that would be a good thing. Plus, they wouldn't be taxed twice. They, they're taxed when they... Uh, put it in there, they're taxed when they pull it out, and, and that just this double taxation should have never been in that position in the first place, in my 
opinion. Um, uh, the uh, one bill right now that I am running is a bill that I've run a few years before. Uh, it has been uh, deemed germane to this 30-day uh, session. And I think the governor is taking a very close look and, and uh, a positive look, hopefully, towards this bill. Uh, and this would do the same thing with military retirement pay. There are 150,000 veterans uh, from the United States military uh, uh, living here in the state of New Mexico. However, uh, of the hundreds that uh, um, leave uh, the military each and every year out of the state of New Mexico, uh, the last few years I heard about 95% of them leave the state because of this one particular issue. It again is a, 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 an obtrusive tax on income. We again are one of 10 to 12 states who have not addressed this. Uh, states like Texas don't have any income tax at all. And uh, so they, they get a pass on that. But many states uh, that do have state income tax uh, have addressed this issue specifically. And we're hoping to get this uh, resolved this year so that not only will we take some of the burden off of our veterans who have uh, given us and sacrificed so much for us uh, here in New Mexico and the United States, but also, and I think the bigger deal, unlike Social Security, there is a payback on military retirement because these folks are 42 to 46 years old. Uh, they will not go fishing or play golf the rest of their life. They will get another job with someone. Uh, they will start a business here in New Mexico. And when they come to New Mexico in uh, active duty, they rent or live on base. Uh, they bring the cars with them and they claim another state as their home state. So taxes are paid in that state. And, and we just see no benefit from that. But if we get them to stay in the state, uh, they will pay all of those taxes. They will buy a house. Uh, we get the uh, uh, mortgage uh, the tax on their house. Uh, two income households will tax their new uh, incomes. Uh, goods and services will all be taxed and we will get all of that. Uh, plus all of these folks are usually uh, major rank or better or non-coms, uh, command sergeant majors and things of that nature who have been in the military for over 20 years. They have a college degree or equivalent thereof, uh, well-educated. Uh, they've managed um, uh, hundreds and maybe thousands of individuals in their time. Uh, they've worked with million dollars in budget. And so these are well-educated uh, well-trained uh, people in the state of New Mexico that will create an employment pool that, quite frankly, right now we don't have. Uh, they will all um, uh, go to work and uh, be able to provide a well-educated uh, pool uh, to draw from. If the state is looking to bring in, again, the next wave of, of high-tech businesses, again, Elon Musk, uh, Teslas, and things of that nature in the state, we then will have a pool that they can draw from and will not be uh, excluded from running uh, to bring those industries to the state because we just don't have the employment pool. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, I'm hoping the, the governor, I'm waiting actually for uh, word back from the governor's office to make sure she's going to support that. Uh, and if so, we could get that done. And that will be, in my honest opinion, a real boom to the state of New Mexico from an employment standpoint, as well as the population uh, with uh, well-educated people coming or uh, staying here in the state. Um, I can I can talk all day long, as you know. I, many of you know I'm a, a broadcaster, so I'm former disc jockey and now a politician, so I could talk all day long. But I really... I'd like to hear uh, from all of you if there, if you have questions about certain legislation you have heard or uh, things going on here in Santa Fe. Uh, if, if you have any questions, I would like to field those at, the, at this time and, and help you guys out as best I possibly can. Uh, yes, thank you, Senator Burt. And Council, do you have any questions for our Senator up in Santa Fe? Um, Senator, I do have one question because it is a, a red flag for all of us in most municipalities about that 800 million reoccurring costs that the governor's pushing so bad for. What what should we do, or what can we do to really uh, have that evaluated and seeing if that's that's proper, especially if she's talking about taking away uh, oil and and gas tax um, and reducing that production. Well, let me let me give you uh, uh, maybe a, a little bit broader view of that. 
this $800 million increase will go to the agency. So uh, public education. Uh, uh, first off, I will tell you, every public employee is probably going to get a 7% uh, pay increase. Some sectors, such as police and teachers, uh, maybe the judiciary will get a little bit more than that. Um, we have been told time and time again, we cannot attract um, uh, some of the right people into the state uh, because we don't pay enough. Uh, we're always behind the pay curve to our neighboring states. And uh, so if we want to be able to attract uh, the proper talent to, for our police departments, uh, fire departments, uh, first responders, as well as our, our, the, the education field, uh, not just teachers, but certainly administrators, uh, counselors, uh, the like, and certainly healthcare, uh, providing uh, uh, from uh, those who are paid by the state, uh, nurses, doctors, so on and so forth. Uh, we need to increase their pay so that we can uh, attract and be competitive with our states around us. So that's what the money is going to be used for. It's not just a, um, a boom to add here, there, and everywhere. It will go into each of the individual agencies. It's, it's an increase uh, for each agency and their operational budget. And so that's where that money is going. Um, the best I can tell you to do is the governor is looking at polling. She is running again this year uh, for second term uh, in the state house. She has looked at that. She knows uh, oil and gas are critically important to the state. So she's backing off of that a little bit. Uh, Social security is a hot button with most people in the state, the voting public, quite frankly. So that's why all of a sudden <clears throat> the social security issue has risen to uh, the top of the file. And uh, that's probably why uh, we are going to probably pass that bill as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not, it's not necessarily willy nilly spending by any stretch of the imagination. It's increase in all of the state agencies, uh, healthcare, uh, <clears throat> cultural affairs, uh, health, uh, I think you said healthcare, tax and revenue, all of these agencies uh, to increase the level of uh, and attract people. Uh, we have found through uh, most of the, those agencies coming before us, uh, they have uh, anywhere from maybe 12 to 20 to 25% uh, vacancy in those agencies. So it's hard to get the work done that they're, they're obligated to do without enough people in those chairs. And it takes about six months to hire someone in the state of New Mexico, which is ludicrous. Uh, we can cut that down dramatically. Uh, we're working on that with uh, licensure, but it also uh, is tough to attract them, anyone, quite frankly, with uh, uh, the rate of pay. So we're trying to increase the pay to uh, make that happen. We have wonderful benefits in the state of New Mexico. If we can get you here and you can get uh, a tenure, we, we have a pretty good uh, public employee retirement plan, but uh, it's getting them here and getting them into the state and that's what we're trying to do as best we possibly can you probably will see some some signing bonuses from some of the bigger agencies for uh, teachers uh, possibly uh, police officers and uh, uh, maybe healthcare workers so we'll see well thank you senator for for expanding on that and and i hope it holds true for a year from now um, that the governor would stick to these words as far as the raises and stuff one thing um, that, that I would like to endorse as well, you have uh, three members of, of a local, previous members of a local school board, and our biggest beef was always the state being in control of our local uh, school district. And we would ask if anything, I mean, you mentioned about the 7% uh, increase for educators, that which is all good, uh, however, there's still parameters on the local districts that can limit uh, what they can pay out within their budgets and means. So, um, you know, it's that big brother, you know, they want to keep <laughs> control of it. And uh, I think our local government, as you know, Rio Doso, we try to take care of our issues the best we can. Uh, the other issue, and you're familiar with this, is the turnover of cabinet secretaries. Um, oh you know, we especially with uh, Homeland Security, you know, we're trying to get our sewer project done. It's going on 14 years. This summer will be 14 years. Um, we and, you know, they change seats quicker up there than uh, probably changing the roll of toilet paper on the dispenser. So um, if any help 
that you could help us up there to keep the, the new cabinet secretary informed and not make us repeat repeated processes uh, for us would help us a bunch. Well, I, I appreciate the comment because uh, I have had uh, real difficulty uh, dealing with the administration who evidently is very tough on uh, her staff. And we've had uh, multiple uh, key people in, <clears throat> that we work with in the legislature and her staff who have left. Uh, uh, we've gone through, I think we're on the uh, uh, second or third um, uh, secretary and uh, education. Um, uh, Ryan Stewart during the, the get go, the pandemic came here from Pennsylvania, did not move his family out and literally for months uh, was doing everything remotely from uh, Pennsylvania. And I think it's wonderful you can do things by remote, but if you don't have a commitment, you don't move your family here, you don't make a commitment to New Mexico, it is hard for me to uh, be supportive of you of, of that particular secretary and their uh, uh, agenda, if you will. Um, and, and so I agree with you 100%. Uh, and it may say something about the administration, uh, how they, people are treated within the administration, and why we don't seem to progress as much uh, with this administration, um, because uh, there is such turnover, um, and uh, turnover uh, equates to uh, uncomfortableness uh, or not happy within those positions. And so people move on. And, and like I said, it's hard to get anything done if you don't have consistency in, in what you are doing. So uh, we're looking at this, we're trying to work with the governor uh, to be more consistent. Uh, you know, we're the appropriators. We love working with the different agencies, but about the time we s start to develop a relationship with the secretary, all of a sudden uh, they, they are upset or they get a better job and they go somewhere else. So you almost have to go back to score one. Anyone who owns a business knows it's better to find the right people initially and hopefully keep them happy. Um, give them the tools they need to really do their job properly and allow them to do that job. Uh, we don't seem to have that formula in most agencies in the state. Uh, so we're trying to work with uh, the secretaries and, and uh, uh, be as, as workable as we possibly can from the legislature because we can't get our work done if they're not there and they can't uh, move their agendas if they're not uh, working well with the legislature. So we're trying to get this done uh, but I, if, if they're not happy, uh, they're going to leave, and it's it's not good for the state of New Mexico. Thank you, Senator. And once again, I'll ask the counselors, do they have any questions for our senator? Um, and, and, and if I may, I just, hey, there's nothing out, uh, out of bounds. You're not going to offend me or, or upset me or anything like that. There's some there's some tough things in the state right now, and if, if there's something that I need to know about or if there's something that uh, you have heartburn over, uh, I can only do my job as well as I am informed. And so um, uh, let me know if you have something on your mind. I'm more than happy to try and work on that. We do have a question for you from uh, Tim Dodge, our village manager. Yes. Hello, Senator. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Tim. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for joining us today. And thanks for all you do for the state of New Mexico. We will be up in Santa Fe next week. So we hope yes. we can schedule some time with you. We're going to sit down Looking and talk a little bit more about our priorities and our our strategy on how we're lobbying for different issues. So um, Good. I hope you're available, but uh, we will get into the roundhouse and go see you. Good. At least the roundhouse is open. That's a good thing. Uh, don't bring your gun and bring your paper that you've been vaccinated. That's how you get in, just so you know. We appreciate you, Senator. Well, thank you for your time, Senator Berg, that, uh, and I'll let you do. Uh, it's my pleasure. On a, truly, it is an honor to do this job. I, I uh, uh, told you 12 years ago, uh, I, I don't come. I don't want to be governor. I don't want to necessarily go to D.C. I mean, what a what a mess that is. Uh, I am here to serve the people in my district. Uh, uh, Lincoln County is an incredibly important part of my district, and I love working with you guys up there. So never hesitate to call. Uh, everybody should have access to my information and uh, I really, I, I love working with you guys. I know I have a, a date with the mayor after I get out of the session to kind of come look at the, some of the sewer and, and the uh, 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 drinking water issues and some of the other things here in the city that uh, maybe we can help you with as well. So I look forward to that. I look forward to seeing all of you next week. And thank you very much for allowing me the time to visit with you. Thank you again. All right. Have a good day. Thank you, you too. 
Okay, moving on. Um, I've been asked to rearrange the agenda right quick, so... Or do you want to go over the overview first, or... Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, we can start with the overview, and then when we get to the community okay. services part, then that's where we can look at it. At well, change. let's move forward with the overview <coughs> of the process. Uh, Mayor, Mayor Pro Temp, uh, counselors, you know, as uh, we have at every strategic planning <coughs> meeting, we go back and review the, the form of government just so that any new staff can have an opportunity to look at the organizational chart and really understand, you know, what the differences are in the forms of government. Um, there's, there's several different forms of municipal government in the state of New Mexico, and uh, we just believe it's important to go, um, you know, every year and, and review that just to make sure everybody has a clear understanding of that. So um, Ron has a, a, a uh, section of the state statute that he's going to actually go through, so he's going to actually be covering this part of the presentation. Mayor Pro Tem, members of the council, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, whenever we have directors' meetings and we, we discuss the different forms of governments, Tim's always, Manager Dodge is always saying, it's just a civics class, and, and there's a lot lot of uh, residents or even staff that don't, don't uh, truly understand the forms of government in New Mexico. So um, a municipality, uh, any city, town, village, or county which has incorporated, whether under general act, state statute, or territorial law, there's also special act of charter. So uh, districting, all municipalities with population of 10,000 or more must elect their governing body members by district. So we're below that, below that 10,000. So when we have our election coming up in March, we're at large. We're not by district. It's uh, so anyone over the 10,000 or more each are voted by certain districts. Um, we are a mayor council uh, form of government or municipality. Our mayor is our chief executive of the municip municipality, presides at the governing body meetings, votes only in case of a tie. He also supervises appointed officers, and that would be the police chief, the village manager, and the village clerk, and we also have the uh, emergency manager also and the treasurer. Um, and the attorney. And the attorney also, yes. Thank you. So also the, uh, the mayor is also the chief law enforcement officer of the municipality. He does uh, delegate those uh, authorities to the police chief and to the law enforcement officers by commissioning the officers. But but as, as the county sheriff is the, the lead law enforcement of the county, the mayor is the, is the uh, law enforcement authority of the municipality. The governing body is a legislative branch of the municipality, consists of the mayor and not less than four more, of the, uh, more than ten councilors or trustees. The uh, governing body controls all finances. They are the board of finance, the property. They pass ordinances and resolutions and uh, approve the, uh, the appointments of the mayor, and that would be for the village manager, that would be for the police chief, that would be for the treasurer, and that would be for the village clerk and for the emergency manager. The municipal judge is a branch of the municipality. That's the judicial branch. The judge tries alleged violations of, the, of municipal ordinances, determines innocent or guilt of alleged offenders and passes sentences. So the, the, that is separated also uh, by the municipality. In any municipality with a population of a thousand or more may establish the office of manager by ordinance and that's what we have by, by uh, manager Dodge. That, that position there was established by ordinance and he has the uh, uh, and chief administrative powers of the municipality and that's with the handling of the uh, of the day-to-day uh, -day and the personnel another type of, um, of form of government is a commission manager municipality and uh, these are our uh, voter have board powers uh, they they uh, the mayor council municipality it's 3,000 or more population may vote to become a commission manager on the governing body side, a five-member commission representing five districts. Uh, same legislative and financial duties as the mayor council form. 
but do not approve individual hirings and firings, which is authority of the manager on the commission, manager form of government. A mayor, a commission elected by, by the other commission to preside. So the uh, mayor, he's not elected. He is voted by the commission. On the judicial branch of the municipality, exactly the same duties and powers as a mayor uh, council form of government. The manager is a non-elective chief administrator of the municipality appointed by the commission and serves at their pleasure, supervises, hires, and fires all municipal employees, enforces all ordinances, and implements policies. Charter form of government. This is any incorporated mis municipality may adopt a charter form of government, but only larger municipality, municipalities have done this so far. Uh, it's defined by a commission of citizens adopted by a majority vote of the electorate, organized in whatever way to uh, charter prescribed as to number of titles of the governing body and method of uh, election terms. Tim's been involved in, in <coughs> those types of uh, governments when he was in Las Vegas, had a, was it a charter form of government? So he's had some experience in those types of different governments. And I think before that, what was before that, Tim, before you had the charter? A mayor council administrator. Okay. Yeah. But Ron, Ron, go back a minute because you know one of the things I want to point out is in a an a mayor council form of government when they enact a, 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 a manager position, it refers to the same duties as uh, listed in the mayor commission. I mean the uh, manager commission form of government, and then it, it goes on to talk about the administrative duties. So the executive. In a mayor council form of government, the executive authorities still lie in the mayor. And that's one of the things that, you know, I pointed out in the past. Um, in, a, uh, in a commission form of government, it doesn't take away. When you go to a commission form of government, the, com the mayor in a commission form of government doesn't have the same responsibilities as a mayor in the mayor uh, council oh, form of government. So I want to make sure that that's clear. And it, it's a, a executive authorities, Ron. It's not administrative. He doesn't uh, take on the administrative. Right. So the, when, when we're looking at the personnel policy right now, there's a recommended change in there because before, you know, it recognized the manager as the chief executive officer, and that was incorrect. So as the personnel policy comes forward, we're going to have language that uh, clearly defines what form of government we're in. And any time, just like, uh, you know, during the pandemic, you saw... Um, several recommendations coming um, uh, from administration to the mayor to issue certain um, executive orders, and that's his executive power. And in those executive orders, oftentimes there may be ordinances or laws or rules that are in place, and, he, and it's a it's a temporary order. If the governing body uh, doesn't agree with that, the the council doesn't agree with it. When they're convened as a governing body, then that's the time that they would legislate to make that type of a change and say, you know, we either need to make a permanent change or in, in, uh, concur with the executive's position or, um, you know, take whatever action that the council would at, at that time to choose. So, you know, moving on to that um, is the first organizational chart that we have that shows the mayor council form of government. And, of course, it starts off with the citizens. And then from, from there, this is the executive um, organizational chart that we have. And what I want to point out is, is when we're convened in, in a, a council meeting or a governing body meeting like we are right now, um, there's different roles that different people play and in, in different responsibilities that they have. Um, right now, in, when we're convened, of course, the mayor's overseen. Uh, right now, in, in uh and the mayor's absent, Mayor Pro Temps uh, takes the chair, and the Mayor Pro Temps still has voting uh, power. He can make a motion, and he still has, you know, those type of, a, of authorities as well. When the mayor's seated, the only time that he has a vote is when there's a tie. Correct. And, and other than that, he administers the meeting and, and whatnot. Um, your, your police chief is actually your sergeant at arms in this type of a setting. You know, he's still the chief of police, but in this setting, he's actually has a direct relationship to the governing body and to the mayor. Um, of course, the village clerk is, is the um, appointed official in this setting. He's working directly as the chief records keeper in, in actually making sure that the meetings are being 
administered appropriately. Um, and then the attorney has a direct relationship to the governing body as well as the counsel for the governing body. And then, of course, I, I, I work directly in this setting for the mayor and council as well, in helping to administer policy. The boards and commissions um, report directly to um, the governing body as recommending boards to the governing body. They do work with the departments to develop that uh, position, but they're uh, making recommendations directly to the governing body. The municipal judge, and this is one of the things that you know I'm, I'm glad to see um, you know, Judge Potter come in, and he's been real good to work with. As I've seen state statute, when it comes to him administering the, the bench, the judicial part of his, his duties, he has, he has uh, an autonomy that exists that we can't interfere with, either from the administrative side, <coughs> or, or the executive side, or the um, legislative side. He has autonomy. But when it comes to the, the administrative, when you look at the state statute, it actually talks about um, the village or, or municipality providing for the administration of the courts. So on the administrative side, um, we should have a direct responsibility for the courts. And we'll continue to work with the judge to make sure that that's clearly identified within our personal policy and that everybody understands their roles in that relationship. Um, Mayor Pro Temp, counselors, are there any questions on, on this organizational chart? We've stated uh, the sections of statute that apply to this, um, exe uh, the executive organizational chart. Nope. No. None. Yep. So next on the agenda, um, the evaluation process overview. Mr. Dick Cook. I'm, I'm sorry, Mayor Pro Temp, we did miss the, the administrative organizational chart. And there was, there was some uh, changes to that. So. so you want to review that before Dick? Yes. Okay. Just stay there. <laughs> on, on this one, um, Counselor, and, you know, this, the, the color coding on this really uh, represents the way that we're going to be presenting today and the way that we work um, as we get into this, recall, you know, er, every, uh, every so often we do a comprehensive master plan. And then from that comprehensive master plan, which, you know, included a lot of community outreach, we've uh, uh, developed goals and objectives out of that. And each one of the goals and objectives is, is tied to the strategic planning processes that are going to be introduced today and that we've used for the last couple of years in helping to guide the departments. So what we do is we break it up into, into teams, and we've got people that serve as the team leaders for each one of the areas, and that's why this chart's color-coded, because they work together in developing that. Um, uh, this year, we, we've actually reversed the order on, on how they're going to be presenting their, their plans um, so that the departments that went last last year get to go first this year so they get a little bit more uh, fresh time with the, with the governing body. But... Um, Starting off, of course, you know, the mayor's the chief um, executive officer, and he has direct relationships to several of the appointed uh, positions as it's depicted in this chart. Um, from there, it flows down to the um, chief administrative officer, which is myself, and you can see the black lines and how that flows throughout the organization. Um, this year, there's been two positions that have been added in, in uh accordance with the direction from the governing body that have been added to uh, my direct uh, relationship, and that is the convention center um, manager, which is Tim Roberts. He's here with us today. I think everybody knows him. And then our, our newest um, hire is our, direct, our director of tourism, and, and that's a, also a manager-level uh, position, but she's our director of tourism, and it's Elizabeth Ritter. I believe everybody's had the opportunity to meet her this morning. And, uh, you know, those are the two main changes that have, have occurred since last year to this organizational chart. Okay. Is there any questions on this? No. Nope. Mayor Pro Temp, counselors? No. Nope. I don't see any or hear any. I like the way it's broken out by teams. Um, you know, really, really differentiates uh, across the board. Mayor Pro Tem, counselors, you know, that's that's one of the things that, that you know, is, as you'll see today, you know, Dick's going to be talking about 
um, you know, the evaluation process and this and the whole process on how we plan and work together. Mm -hmm. The whole concept on how we work on almost everything we do is we work as a team. And, you know, um, snow, snow removal may be, you know, the, the main objective of the streets department, but every department gets behind them and helps them out. So if they have resources in, in other departments, there's no lines that, that we won't cross to help. And just like during the summer events when uh, we're operating grindstone or special events, we lean on the other departments to make sure that we're giving support uh, to to uh, the parks department so that there's always you know additional staffing so we always try to work as a, as a team concept to try to to you know build on on each other and make each other better and, and help to critique so we really work on a team the team concept that's good yeah. so moving on now to our evaluation process overview Pro Tem Council, Manager Dodge asked me to try to put together a tie between our tactical plans that we do every year and our evaluation process that we've developed to ensure that the goals in the, ta the tactical plan are met each year. <clears throat> the tactical plan includes the top prior five priority goals for each uh, department. There's established that the departments have other goals too, but in the tactical plan, the top five are featured. <clears throat> They're tied to a one-year budget that is intended to complete the tactical plan as approved. The department organization chart is brought before council each year before, in order to give the organization that can accomplish what's planned in the tactical plan. <clears throat> the tactical plan is actually prioritized departmental goals, and we call them improvement plans. They include things like capital outlay, the capital equipment replacement, the debt obligation, and everything else that goes into to planning for a year budget. <clears throat> <clears throat> Management, which includes the directors, uh, executive staff, and managers, set the performance standards and evaluations that we do. <clears throat> Each department has their own policies and procedures, plus the village has policies and procedures that have to be followed. Management is accountable, accountable for the results that we get over the course of a year. They're responsible for the analysis of progress and making adjustments as needed throughout the year and they're responsible for creating an environment so that our employees are productive and, uh, like Tim said, provide a team so that we complete what we said we're gonna complete. And it also keeps us focused on the big rocks. The evaluation process we have is a quarterly assessment of every employee's performance based on the goals that are planned achievements throughout the tactical planning and budget year. At the beginning of the year, each director and manager gets with the people they supervise and establish goals for them to accomplish throughout the year. Some of these goals are identified as pay for performance goals. If an employee accomplishes the goal, pay for performance, an employee can earn up to a 4% pay for performance incentive. And these goals are normally things that advance the village forward. Uh, they may be a, a skill needed in a department for uh, making the department wider ranging or improve conditions so that they can can uh, produce a higher level of product or whatever. <clears throat> Supervisors and managers can earn up to a 3%. Directors can earn up to 2%. All these pay for performance goals are established between the employee and his supervisor 
that all of that are the performance goals are reviewed by the deputy and or the village manager. <clears throat> These pay for performance incentives can be paid as soon as the goal is accomplished, whether it's one month after the beginning of the year or at the end of the year, the incentives are paid at that time. A personnel sheet is filled out and the next pay period, the employee gets his incentive. Dick, so you don't have to wait for the next quarter? No. <clears throat> there are four evaluations made each year. The first quarter runs from July 1st to September 30th with the evaluation in October. So we work a full quarter and then the next month we evaluate. The second quarter runs from October 1st to December 31st with the evaluation in January. The third quarter runs from January 1st to March 31st with evaluation in April. And the fourth quarter runs from April 1st to June 30th and serves both as a quarterly evaluation and a yearly summary. Also at that fourth quarter meeting, that helps establish the priorities for the following year. And this is for every employee, every regardless employee. of tenure here. Right. Because when I was here or as a director, this was basically for our uh, probationary employees to go over. And then after that, we went annual performance. Mayor, but Mayor Pro Tem, um, you know, th this, uh, this process, um, it's for every single employee. And we've been 100% compliant with the process of getting every employee evaluated. Um, you know, right now we're, we're actually in a, an evaluation period and, and they're due by the end of the month. So we're, we're kind of pressing the... <laughs> You're pressing on pressing it now, it right huh? Now. But um, this did go back to the evaluation committee to, to review again the process. And you know, over the last couple of years, we've been tweaking this. Uh, this year, the evaluation committee came back and reported to the directors that they, that they actually... Um, feel com very comfortable with the whole process and the directors 100% uh, agreed that they want to keep this process in place. It's, it's simple, it's direct, and it keeps everybody on task. And then it gives people incentive to make sure that, that they understand what their goals and objectives are and how they're going to continue to improve. I love it that um, we pay the incentive goals immediately. I think that's good. And the last slide is just time tying everything together. I mean, we have a comprehensive plan. Dick, hold on one second. I, uh, Mayor Pro Temp, I think. Well, I was just going to ask on, on that, since Susan mentioned it, the, the pay for performance incentives, are those one-time payments or does that add to their salary? Uh, Mayor Pro Temp, Councilor, it adds to their salary. Okay. Yeah. And it, it's, it, um, we work within the, the, uh, the, uh, the steps that we've developed, mm -hmm. the whole tier system, so uh, we budget for that. We budget at the maximum liability that we could achieve, and then we work within that 20-year uh, step plan. Okay. I just wanted to be clear. Sometimes incentives are one time, so I just want to make sure that it was... It used to be so, that way. Yeah. The last century, you could have a one-time mm -hmm. merit. And yeah, exactly. That mm -hmm. was... Everything is tied together. A comprehensive plan is a 20-year plan. It was proved in approved in 2019, I believe. Our strategic plan was developed from that comprehensive plan. It's a five-year plan. And that five-year plan is broken down into one-year plans, which is a tactical plan plus the budget, which is a yearly operational plan. And so we have our goals. We have our first quarter evaluation, second quarter evaluation, third quarter evaluation, fourth quarter evaluations. And so it's cyclic, year after year after year. All the plans are tied together. And if there needs to be an amendment or something to a comprehensive plan or the strategic plan, uh, you do that. And then the tactical plans are, are made from the adjustment that has been made. So we think it's a really great system. Uh, both the managers and employee, for the most part, embrace it. and. Uh, Give us stepping stones to go through the year so that we are sure that we are reaching our, our what I call the big rocks or the major things that we're trying to accomplish. 
Are there any questions? Thank you. Very well. Did a very good job. Thank you. Moving on now is to review the village mission and purpose statement. Mr. Seno. Mayor Pro Tem, members of the council, um, here today we present to you the, uh, the current uh, mission statement and the pur purpose statements for each uh, department. We do have uh, included one for the Wingfield House uh, that uh, Tim Roberts has provided. Uh, the mission statement is, is the same as the last several years. Uh, if we have any questions on that, um, we'll sure answer that. I can, uh, can also read that out loud to everyone. The Village of Riodoso is dedicated and committed to provide friendly, innovative, and quality government services which will promote a healthy and safe environment while enhancing opportunities for all citizens and visitors who live, work, and play in nature's playground. Mayor Pro Temp, uh, Council, yes, sir. do you feel that this uh, mission statement is still a valid mission statement? That's where I was saying it's the same one we had last year, right? And I mean, it's it's been for a while, and it seems to be working. It works. It was hashed out for quite a while just to get here. I, I yeah, see no reason to change it at this yeah. time. <laughs> but it it covers it all. And living in nature's playground, which I used to like, uh, playground of the Southwest. <laughs> that's what. Uh, but I mean, yeah, we could live with that, and so. Just for my clarification, and I, I'm sorry I didn't talk to you about this, uh, Manager Dodge was, so what's the difference between our purpose statement and our vision statement? Mayor, Mayor Pro Temp, as we get into the department reports, each one of the, the departments will be proposing their, their purpose statements, which, you know, most of them have already been approved by the governing body in a previous meeting. Right. So that, that just gets down to the department uh, level. And then it ties back to the overall mission statement of the village. So, okay. So, um, my, my recommendation is that we don't read through each one of the purpose statements right of now. Of course. But as the directors come up, they will be presenting that. And then if you concur with it, then we just continue to, to move forward. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a couple that have made adjustments to theirs and a, um, a couple of new ones, as, as uh, Deputy Manager Shen has, has, has said. So, um, you know, with this... Um, you know, that's all we're asking is to make sure that, that the governing body is um, comfortable with the current mission statement. There's no need for change. Good. Considering you've got evaluations due at the end of the month, let's move on. Because <laughs> that will take a day. <laughs> and thank you for adding the Wingfield House uh, purpose statement. Appreciate that, Tim. And, and Mayor Pro Temp, if I, if I could just for a second, not to distract, but can I share a little story with you? Sure. You know, they don't have a joke in it, for, does it? For, for those of you that have, have been in my office, you saw that, you know, one of my granddaughters painted a sign for me, and, you know, she used living in nature's playground and, and it has the, the R and, and whatnot. So that was the oldest granddaughter. So, you know, about a week after um, she did that, and I'd given the oldest granddaughter like $30 for painting that sign. I bought all the materials for her. So then the youngest granddaughter, I was on FaceTime with her, and she was all, uh, Papa, can I... Uh, draw a picture for you and I was like sure so she draws a picture for me and she sends me a picture with a mountain in it and and um, a little cabin in it and her standing outside the cabin and she put um, she put on there um, life is cooler on the mountain <laughs> <laughs> there you go so she came up with her own little her own little statement and she says I have apple pay papa <laughs> 30 dollars <laughs> I just want to share that. that is good. That's a good. That's a good one. Well, Tim, I drew you a picture. It'll be in your office. <laughs> Do you have Apple Pay? <laughs> no, I take cash. Uh, the next item is the tactical plans review and consideration of department tactical plans. So, is this where we're going to these subcommittees, community service, and all that? Yes, I'm Mayor Pro Temp and. Um, if, uh, if I may, Rod, hold you and Samantha back, because I'm going to ask Team Tourism to come up first. Mayor, Mayor Pro Temp, um, uh, Rodney and Samantha are the team leaders of, of that, and 
Oh, okay. Yeah, we wanted, um, we would recommend that Samantha present first and then Team Tourism. Okay. We want to kind of give an example. We have a couple of new members on Team Tourism, so we wanted one department. No, I like throwing them in the hot seat first. <laughs> Let's see what they're made of. Man. Let's see if they could handle it. Well, they, uh, they do a, a great job for us on Facebook and all that other stuff, so yeah, it's our PIO officer. <laughs> no. Af after these guys. Oh. Poor Sam. <laughs> No, I'm flexible. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for taking the time out to hear um, our goals and provide us direction for this upcoming year. Um, I'm one of the departments that has changed up my purpose statement just slightly. Um, I wanted to be more inclusive of just um, residents, and so um, mine reads to develop a resilient strategy for economic development that promotes economic health and vitality for all stakeholders in the village of Rio Doso one that is recognized for maintaining the unique community character and enhances the quality of life of the community. So with that, um, my organization oh, chair on has a... Samantha, on, uh, on that, um, Mayor Pro Tem, counselors, are you comfortable with that purpose statement and the changes to it? I am. Yes. I yes. don't see no good statement or purpose. We just like to go through and validate that at each one. So. Okay. I don't have any changes in um, positions. Um, we do have changes in roles, such as um, David Myers now uh, with another 12 hours of ride along. He'll be able to inspect plumbing and mechanical, so we've added that capacity to the department. Um, so it'll make uh, inspections more efficient. He'll be able to do the electrical, plumbing, and structural while he's out there. So that's really beneficial for us. Um, How soon do you think he'll get that? He's out riding with the state today. Um, so that'll be eight hours. Um, I would say before the end of February, he should okay. be ready to be on his own. I was thinking it would be like six months from now or something like He's that. He's a go-getter. <laughs> okay, so good. It'll definitely be soon. Does he have to take a test then? He's already completed the test. Oh, okay. um, the last step is the 40 hours of ride-along, and um, he's more than halfway complete, so it'll be <coughs> quick. And I know the contractors are excited about having both of them being able to do that. Yeah. So, Sam, this makes it look like your department is full as far as positions that are budgeted? Yes, okay. I'm fully staffed. Okay. So that, That's something that I'm going to be watching is to see, because we've got issues in some departments that are understaffed, but I just want to make sure that you didn't leave out any, any positions on this. No, thankfully I'm fully staffed. Um, I have been for about two months now. Bragger. COVID. Quick, yeah, knock on the table. Been a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem, um, yes, sir. Samantha, can you talk about the change in your GIS planner position as well? Yes. So when I went out to fulfill the GIS coordinator position, I added some additional duties, um, and that is planning. So um, they'll be able to consult with the public when they come in and have questions on Chapter 54 in addition to me if I'm not available. And um, she also is able to create the case studies and um, just have on-site visits too when people have questions regarding variances or conditional uses. So we've added that capacity to the department as well. I'm not the only one that can answer those planning and zoning questions. Um, so that's been an added benefit as well. And as you can see, we have Stephanie Warren back in the department. Very good. Uh, who? Is Stephanie the one that can answer questions for Chapter 54? Yes, okay. and she also, um, when she first was hired on with the Village of Redoso, was the short-term rental administrative assistant, right. so she has that yeah. um, capacity as well. So she's able to kind of just be very versatile with us, and yeah. when the inspectors have questions on planning and zoning, she can fill in. She's um, typically officed back there all day long, and so it's good to have her okay. be able to answer those questions mm -hmm. immediately. Sam? Is she working on addressing still? Yes. That's been a mm -hmm. She's long taking on that 
We ongoing actually, process. Um, just to provide you all a quick update, she is starting on Highway 70 on the east end and, and working up towards the west end of Highway 70, and then from there she'll go down Sudrath and then Meacham. So we can make sure that the arterial streets throughout the village are properly addressed, and then that'll help us address the um, smaller side roads through the uh, subdivisions. Mayor Pro Tip and Councilor, uh, in the tactical plans, it's actually a multi-department effort that's being made. Um, so they'll they'll be giving a, a more detailed description of the efforts that are being made in that area. Okay. Okay. You want to go over your goals oh, or? Yes. Um, so Did the first know? goal is a continuation from last year. With the rewrite of Chapter 54, um, we have since procured uh, Site Southwest to work with us on um, assessing and a complete rewrite of Chapter 54. Some unanticipated uh, changes were brought up throughout the year, such as what um, happened with Alsips having a service station be considered a gas station, um, things like mobile vending for food trucks. Um, just a lot of different challenges arose as people were trying to be creative and come into the village and uh, do developments. And so multifamily housing um, in the past had been conditional use, and we're trying to work that into a principal permitted use in certain zones where appropriate. And so, um, as you all know, an extension was approved. Um, and we're anticipating completion uh, and bringing it to you all at the May um, meeting and so Mayor, Mayor Pro Tim, Samantha yes, if you could go back to the form and follow the, the form and then identify any any changes or additional needs that you may have so when you're presenting please do that so with our um, first step was to assess the current zoning codes and that's where it has been identified that there are more changes than anticipated needed then we uh, created a group of stakeholders composed of contractors staff um, realtors and just locals that have tried to use the code and um, ended up in I don't want to say hot water but developed without proper procedures and so we're just trying to make the code more useful and so having their insight to how our code has created uh, challenges for them um, has been helpful then site southwest has broke up the chapter 54 into three sections and so we have uh, two so far that are in draft that we've reviewed. Um, getting the format correct so that it's user friendly, that's been a, a challenge. Um, but looking at other communities and, and having more visual graphs in there as opposed to just written language, I think that's gonna be beneficial to us. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that we're trying to add in is just more visual aids. Um, and so we have not gotten to steps four through six at this point. Um, P and Z, we, we continue to invite our chairman, Alan Briley, and uh, Ron Michelina is a commissioner, and he's been involved in the process. Um, but to avoid a quorum, we have just those two from P and Z um, serving with us on the stakeholders. So, Sam, if this is planned to come to the council in May, is are, are you planning that being going through PNZ in April? We're going to have to take it to them for uh, review and recommendation, so that is correct. Okay. Councillor Cornelius, have you seen the draft? Uh, first and second. The first draft. ones, we haven't gotten the next one yet. Push or that draft on him, Samantha, Samantha. And send it to me. <laughs> yeah, get it to him today, and that way we only got two more months with well, John I, here. Well, you don't have to be a counselor to be on that committee, so if the oh, mayor good. still wants me, I can do that. Good. I think you need to be on that committee. <laughs> yes. As long as well, you're here in town, you need to be no, on that committee. No We're retirement. appointing you to that committee, John. Uh, can I? Ask, sure. Um, Sam, what about the, and you may, I may be, uh, doing the car before the horse. Have we already paid this hundred thousand dollars? So the they no, are billing us in payments as work's oh. being done. We have not expended the amount. Um, it was rolled over from last year's budget and is in my budget right now. Um, so I do not need any additional resources. Okay. Um, 
it, it has not been paid out in full, but it is in my budget already. Okay. Any other questions for Mrs. Mendez? Now I'm going to call on Team Tourism. Wait, I oh no, no. no. I, I do. I have. That was just my first. Book. She's got oh some more pages. <laughs> I have a few more. <laughs> Sam, I'm, I'm trying to move this meeting to be completed in one day, folks. <laughs> one day. I think the train has left the station. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just go right ahead? So I. Now, is, I, I noticed, in, I didn't see anything about blighted. You know me. Mm -hmm. So where does, this, where does the blighted come into? Is that chapter 54? Um, actually, it's chapter 32. It's in vacant building standards under blighted. Um, that was an ordinance that we brought forth to you all. And then right. remember, we developed a form so that if they were maintaining a vacant building, they were meeting health and safety standards, especially if our emergency responders were having to enter the building. Um, that isn't specifically mentioned in um, my goals and objectives. It is definitely an ongoing goal that I could add into here because I think that we should have a a tactical plan and just to provide us direction this year and moving forward on how we're going to be more aggressive on that. I know we did mm -hmm. see some progress last year, um, especially on Paradise Canyon, getting rid of that trailer that had right. fallen over on the on the uh, fence, on their neighbor's fence. But I think that um, that would be uh, worth adding as a goal in my tactical plan for this upcoming year. So if, if you'd like, I'd be happy to um, develop that and uh, list out some steps that we can take to be more aggressive and um, work close with code enforcement on yeah are, those are we doing anything with code enforcement on that I yes mean, we definitely are okay um, but usually it's on a, a complaint process I'm where, complaining. <laughs> where I mean you know before <laughs> that I remember if they saw something they're chasing the dog or something and they said oh yeah. shoot look at that dilapidated yeah. place and then they kind of take the initiative to start investigating it. Mayor, Mayor Pro Temp, um, Counselor, you know, the, the, what you're talking about is exactly the process that we're going through today and, you know, uh, the governing body really expressing where they'd like to see a greater emphasis on. Right. So on, on this effort, if the, if the council agrees, um, this is really a, a, a couple of departments involved with the process. We can make sure that there's a tactical plan uh, to work on blighted properties and uh, lean and clean or whatever you call that that program but um, that should be depicted in both departments in the community development and then in the uh, police department under code enforcement so chief if you can address that and Samantha and start uh, working on putting together a tactical plan that we'll bring back to um, the governing body in a, in a regular workshop and uh, propose that as an addition to the current tactical plans that are being proposed today Okay. That sounds like a plan. That, yeah, that will work really yeah. good to, to go with that. And definitely start with our facilities. Get rid of that old water department building. We've been saying <laughs> that for five years. Live fire exercise, I say. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>. exactly. <laughs> Chief is going, yep, okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. One of our first steps will be to be proactive, you know, when we're yes. in the community. And so I think that'll be great. Thank you all. I Thank agree. You. Um, so that kind of leads into my next goal. We Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, so yes. to, just so that we can show how it ties back to the comp plans, mm -hmm. let, let's start off with that section of it and then go through, go through the form. I think Rodney just explained it to you. Okay. So this next goal is tied to the comp plan 5.2 to prevent property from extended periods. Of vacancy and neglect and it meets objectives 3.2 to strengthen and observe development ordinances and standards to effectively plan and manage land use as well as 3.3 uh, to create a functioning economic development committee that identifies signature pro projects to enhance economic vitality and objective 3.4 to develop a comprehensive economic development strategy and funding model that identifies the highest and best use of land um, Last year, 
we started with this. We created the Metropolitan Redevelopment Area, and it was adopted by um, ordinance. And so all of Sudrath down to Highway 70 and to the Circle of Upper Canyon was included in the Sudrath Corridor for the MRA. Um, that's the first step, you know, to have your plan, identify your projects, and uh, have the area that will be improved. So this year, I would really like to, one, learn more about the tools that are uh, stated in state statute that we have that we can use to improve the Sudworth District for vacant and abandoned buildings. Um, there's different changes that we can make to... Um, such as the, the LIDA ordinances or um, tax increments for certain areas, if that's something we wanted to look at. Um, we also have had discussions about creating a fund working with the uh, Redoso Main Street Association to maybe do a facade improvements down there. Mm -hmm. And so just seeking out either grants or other funding, um, working with them to to do some improvements because some of those buildings in the Midtown area um, are in need of a facelift. So uh, putting these MRA tools in, in action um, is one of my top priorities for this year. And I think that'll help with some of the, the uh, vibrancy, such mm -hmm. as that tall pink building near Domino's and, and trying to get some movement on that. Good. Yeah. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, sir. Um, counselors, if I can add to that, um, you know, during the upcoming budget process, one of the recommendations that we're going to be looking at is making sure or, um, you know, proposing or recommending that we set aside money to go into a fund to assist with the MRA plan. Um, you know, the MRA plan is actually one of the three tools that we have as a, as a municipality to actually grant money and not violate, violate the anti-donation clause. So right now we have... Um, um, some ARA monies that, that we can take a look at. The final rule did come out on that, and there's some potential for us to um, utilize some of that fund to help assist some of the businesses in that area. Um, and then in addition to that, we have submitted on the junior bill a, a legislative request for $500,000 to go to uh, those type of programs. So we're looking at, at various options on how we can start to put money into uh, various grant and loan programs to assist those those businesses down in that metropolitan redevelopment area. Good. Anything else from council on that issue? Uh, Sam, on that one, uh, it has resources needed, a hundred thousand dollars. Do you is that something you still need, or is that something in your budget already? Um, that's in relation to what Manager Dodge was talking about. Um, I guess I was very conservative. Uh, okay. The junior bill is for five hundred thousand. So yeah. I mean, it, more yeah, hundred thousand isn't going to go very far. Not going to go very, yeah. yeah. Some paint, but yes, if we could find um, the resources of up to five hundred thousand, I think that would go a long way in improving that district. So. That's just that was just my estimate for my plan. You were being nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on how it's structured. I mean, if you do a, a matching grant um, to the property owners there, you can stretch it even further. I've seen it one to one or two to one even. Um, so there's different ways of handling that. Yeah. I believe the hundred thousand you're looking at is for sh Chapter Fifty Four really right, and that's going to take all no, of it. No, there's another on the bottom bottom of this page. Oh, okay. Uh, it says. Uh, there's a hundred thousand for that one too. If you go back up one. above, so you can yeah, it's okay. got a hundred thousand. Right. Um, so my next goal is tied to the comprehensive plan policy 2.1 to ensure zoning allows for more housing options. Um, and goal one a variety of housing types and prices um, are available to meet the housing needs of village residents, continuing to prioritize the acquisition, acquisition of additional property appropriate for affordable and workforce housing. In this tied to the plan on objective 6.5 to develop affordable housing to recruit and keep employees. Um, and so resources, we need to continue to develop our um, private public partnerships, um, seek land for sale and uh, just look through funding through grants. Um, as you all know, we 
entered into the development agreement for 56 units of um, apartments up on Meacham. That was uh, one step of our um, goals that are set out in the affordable housing plan. So this year, um, in addition to potentially developing other uh, housing options on our land, such as that 603 Meacham, or we'd like to... Um, well, we have changed our R2, R3, and M1 and M2 to allow for multifamily housing as long as they meet uh, the uh, setbacks of the lots and um, they can have up to six units per lot. And so we're hoping that uh, developers or homeowners, landowners will take that opportunity, especially in the M1 and M2 districts, to add a few multifamily units, such as townhomes or uh, sites of that sort. Um, other goals listed in our affordable housing plan is to work with code enforcement, and um, that's an ongoing process that we have with, uh, with them and we'll continue to reach out so we can get some of these homes that haven't had a warm body in them in probably 40 years, you know, that just, just trickled down through the family and they're not taking care of the property. So maybe we can promote um, them to sell or, or enhance the property and rent it out. Um, streamlining processes, that's always an ongoing um, effort that I have in my department to make it... Um, more friendly for developers and so we try to get them through chapter 54 and to development easier um, we had a local contractor come in with an idea of developing tiny homes um, kind of across from fun trackers and so we're, we're helping him uh, with the land that he currently owns to potentially put some long-term rentals there on that tract of land and so we're just continuing to help people when as soon as they reach out realtors developers um, anybody that needs help getting through the multifamily housing process and so appreciate so that's that. good yeah. you were talking about the generational homes that are in neglect can we buy those and with workforce housing money and then rent them out or is that in competition with somebody that we can't do no um we can have the option to purchase these homes uh we have talked about that and that is an option that we have been exploring um even going out for a qualified broker to come on and help us with the rentals and, mm -hmm. and the agreements and so that's something that um, we're looking into and we definitely want to continue um, researching. We haven't looked at purchasing single family homes at this point, but it is an option. Well, we've got an ordinance where we can put an apartment or an ADU with them. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And we have been seeing uh, more of those questions come in too about um, developing long term rentals on their single family residence. And so that's a positive. For the community, I think. Mayor Pro Tempa, counselors, is that the strategy you'd like Samantha to add to her tactical plan? That would be, yeah. yes. I, I mean, so. to at least, you know. I think it's something to look at on a case by case basis. Right. But not Get an inventory of what's the possibilities, and you're right. Well, I'm, I'm glad, glad you're getting questions on ADUs because when I bring that up, most people don't have a clue. Yeah. I would like to. Here's Judy. Uh, I'll make Judy and Toy mad. Jeez. On those ADUs, mm -hmm. I still think we should leave them under, let them tie into existing water and sewer services. Because if you add enough, they would be paying the uh, extra usage. usage. But if you add another $100 to the cost, we get out of affordable pretty quick on those small units. The only issue I can see with that is the potential for generating more waste, um, and there's no billing for the number of trash bags you put in the dumpster. Yeah. Um, so that that would be something, and especially as we're going out and doing evaluations on our costs uh, for solid waste. Um, uh -huh. Water, water. I agree. 
I mean, it's water still and sewer and uh, water and sewer. It's still you would in, it's probably wastage. reduce the forestry waste because you have a house on it now. True. And Dick will make us cut ten feet back anyway. So. Yeah. <laughs> But that's a good tech plan to add for this year is yep. establishing that. And then the village can acquire, we can get the rent from that? Once we own it. Yeah. Mayor uh, Pro Tem Council, yes, we just have to be able to establish that it would be at, at a market rate. Mm -hmm. Okay. And go back into a workforce housing fund. Yeah. You know, right. just keep, yeah. keep building that. Yeah. So. No, good. Um, Sam, in here it says that um, Mesa Apartments is supposed to submit their application for tax credit this month. Do we know when a decision will be made on that application? The applications are due um, this Friday, and um, the awards will be released in June. Okay. Um, but they were saying that they should know something by mid-March. Oh, okay, great. Ranking. But there is an unprecedented amount of money this year, so hopefully. And there's quite a bit of, of other communities that are that are wanting to get their piece of it too. So, mm -hmm. and we were first to submit our application to them, and so they were thinking that that also provided us a little bit of leverage. So uh, great. Okay. Um, reduced fees or fee waivers for affordable housing. Um, with Mesa Apartments, we did work with them and uh, entered into partnership, but this is case by case and also would uh, be brought to the governing body as, as projects are brought forth. Um, there is somebody that would like to, um, to come and ask for uh, fee reductions as they rehab an old uh, hotel or motel in the community. And so as those come about, um, I'll be bringing them forth to you all and uh, hopefully we can see some improvements in our housing situation here in the community. Good. I um, can guess which one that is. <laughs> the other uh, partnerships with other governmental and private entities, um, it's important that we continue um, to work with MFA and other nonprofits so that we can provide um, services to our residents to provide them information to become self-sufficient and homeowners and uh, just work to um, improve their own um, personal situation. And so with our housing, uh, Workforce Housing Board, this coming February the 7th, we have an upcoming meeting and we'll be discussing all of these um, plans and see which they prioritize and we're hoping to put together some either virtual workshops or um, in-person workshops so we can work with the community and provide them resources. So Good. that'll be one of our strategies coming up in the near future. Mm -hmm. um, establish a land trust bank. Uh, we do have that already. And what, what's the amount in that, Judy? Do you know about that? Or? Not offhand, but I okay. Know okay. The uh, affordable housing plan has uh, indicated to continue to look for opportunities to acquire lots that are affordably priced um, and also those lots that are on foreclosure or tax lien sales. And that's something that we continue to do um, all the time as opportunities come up. And then, of course, we'll bring them back to you all. Um, infrastructure assistance. So we have done that through CDBG grants, geo bonds. Um, any any types of fundings, I think, the, I think the phrase is a cocktail of funding, so we can improve our uh, water, wastewater, and streets. And so we continue to apply and receive funding, thankfully, and we're going to continue those efforts through this year and ongoing so that we can make uh, improvements to the community to support development, and uh, such as the town and country. Um, the other um, goal listed in the affordable housing plan is to facilitate public education. Um, next is facilitate landlord education. That's something that we do um, as it arises, such as some of these blighted um, properties that either have roof leaks or decks and um, the tenants aren't getting enough attention from their landlords. We'll oftentimes step in and send a letter and tell them, this is a health and safety matter. Your, you know, your tenant's deck is about to fall off, and we'll go about it from a, a building inspector 
aspect as, as opposed to through the housing. And so that's something that we continue to try to encourage these landlords to make improvements to provide a safe house um, or living environment for our residents. That's priority. Um, the other re rehabilitation or replacement of existing structures kind of relates to what I was just stating. Um, this one, incentives for providers to operate in Lincoln County. Um, we have not touched on that, but I think that's a great goal listed in the housing plan. Um, and then working with local mortgage lenders, um, home buyer assistance, low interest loans, and broaden financing through USDA. I think those are just all educational workshops that we could um, facilitate to educate our residents on how they can take advantage of these resources that oftentimes many um, potential home buyers just aren't aware of. So I think that we just need to do more to get the information out there to our residents. That's nice. Mayor, uh, Mayor Pro Temp, Salas on, on the uh, Housing Trust Fund, um, <coughs> it's my recollection that we've used the majority of that money. The, the we, we just recently transferred 750 back into it. Mm -hmm to get up to our funding commitment that we have made of a million. So um, during this budget uh, process, um, you know, I will be visiting with, with Judy and then making a recommendation of additional resources to put into that fund um, out, out of cash uh, reserves. And, you know, the question keeps coming up, and um, I believe the mayor had a, a question last night at the State of the Village. You know, where's the, the village getting all the money on these properties that we're purchasing? Well, some of the per properties that we've purchased have been uh, directly related to the uh, watershed area where we're protecting uh, the village's watershed. And then there's been purchases for the Parks and Rec Department to add to uh, the properties. And, and all these um, strategies that we're um, looking at all tie back to the comprehensive master plan. Right. It, it, when we look at the, the green spaces that we purchased, you know, on the hall uh, property and then the other one that was adjacent to, to Meacham, that property looked at actually two different strategies. Could it be used to expand the green space or could it be used for housing? Once right. we made a decision to move it towards housing, then that property was tr uh, transferred into the housing trust fund and then supplemented. Um, so I, I just wanted to give that explanation that all, all those um, strategies or purchases are all related to the comprehensive master plan and um, then there, it's not uh, an afterthought or a you know, knee-jerk reaction. This is long-term planning on how we approach those projects. Yes. So, and I, I just wanted to give that explanation. The other thing that, that we've done is we've submitted a legislative request for $5 million. If we're funded, that $5 million will go into our housing trust fund, and then we'll use that to leverage other type of opportunities like... Uh, Samantha's bringing up, there is other opportunities like with USDA where they do uh, fund different types of housing projects as well. So I, I just wanted to, you know, really expand on that because I know the mayor keeps getting questions of where are we purchasing these pro properties and where does it come from? And oftentimes we, we take a direct approach of, of looking at those purchases ourselves because it's, it's our fiscal duty to make sure that we're um, making those type of, of land buys on you know the most uh, fiscal responsibility that we can, so um, that is one of the authorities that we're given to to work in executive session when it comes to land acquisition or water rights. Um, staff, administrative staff, goes out and works on that, and they come back to the governing body. We discuss it, and then once we get ready to to make a, a take an action, then that action is brought into to open session. So I just want to give that explanation. So that money comes out of just general fund? Yes. To purchase? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what we were touching on yesterday was right. that we've been good stewards of what we've had mm -hmm. and it's from GRT revenues and right. things like that. Yeah. <clears throat> we just print more money. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it is busy print. Next goal. Um, so my next goal is a continuation from last year. It ties to the comprehensive plan to offer community services for all residents and employees and the strategy that states enhance community collaborations to actively engage and communicate with the community. Um, 4.2 to leverage information technology to drive efficient and responsive service of delivery. 
Um, 4.3, to ensure transparent government with opportunities for partnership and clearly define the service levels and that are associated with our resources and ensure accountability and communications. Last year, um, well, in 2020, we started with the CityWorks software with uh, Eric and Ashley tying this in for um, the water department and work orders. And after seeing them get on that same software that's GIS based, we came on board for permitting of um, building permits. We also have the clerks on there for their liquor licenses. We're going to be uh, beginning to issue street cut permits, all using the City of Works software from the front counter. So we're trying to have all of the information in one database accessible for any of the staff that are working up here at our front counter as well as in community development. And um, we already have users with the streets and the water and uh, continue to build on the city works. The next step of the software though is actually putting it online so that permits can be obtained um, and their backup materials such as plans and fees can be paid online and that we can just generate the permit as opposed to them having to email stuff and then we stick it in city works. It's just not a very efficient process. So we'd like to get them uh, them meaning the public using CityWorks, and uh, that would be a link on our website. So the resources, we've already got the software, but because you're going to go online, it's going to cost us $35,000 more. Um, so that number is already in my budget. It's an annual fee, um, and so we already have um, the capabilities to go online, but we wanted to make sure that staff understood the software and the, the kinks were worked out and so now we're ready to um, to put it out to the public once it's fully functioning. It's not at this point. Have you called in a, just a group of the contractors, people that would be using this to see how user friendly it is because we had the same conversations about short term rental software mm -hmm. and it, it wasn't as easy rollout for some people. Mm -hmm. So can we put that together to make sure that it is functioning? So sometimes yes. when we get to we that, work on things, it seems apparent to us, but... Right. When we get to um, it being developed and functioning, we'll definitely um, have some test users and see how, of all skill sets, because um, with uh, the Muni Revs, we did see that. And, and it is a challenge because not everyone is as technical savvy as others, and so we want to make sure that that even, you know, the one with the lowest amount of information. Idiot proof, that's what we're looking yeah, for. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to yep. say. There you go. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mayor. You're welcome. Well, we ought to be able to get that tested. <laughs> yeah. I'll order that one. <laughs> Sam, you'll need to adjust your ending date because that date has come and gone. Oh, okay. That is a good point. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, Sam. Yes, sir. <clears throat> is City Works under the umbrella of WebMD as far as protection from cyber attacks? The reason I'm asking is we're broadening the base here for access. So it'll be from people at home with uh, their own internet con connectivity. So I'm just curious. Um, I am not sure on that, but that's something great to look into because we have transferred all of our permit data from the mid-90s into the city works, and so I think it'll be important that we look at that. I know it is backed up on, on um, our server system as well as... Um, with what they have, but I need to look into that. That's a good point. We had a rather long meeting about that, so that's why I'm asking. Mayor, Mayor um, Councilor, when we get into the finance department, we can address that issue under, under the uh, IT department because that, uh, that's all housed on our server systems, mm -hmm. and we've had those conversations um, even with a lot of the programs and data that we're collecting, and you know, so we will we'll. we'll uh, address that issue further. Thank you. Okay. Um, my last goal is linked to the comprehensive plan to think regionally in order to foster economic development on a regional scale. Um, this is linked to the strategic plan item to collaborate with Redoso Downs and other surrounding communities to discuss strategy and find mutually supportive approaches to economic vitality. Um, I'll work with Team Tourism on this. We previously had an analytics software, Buxton. Um, they were $30,000 the cost was once the one-year um, subscription expired in November. 
Um, I, because of state procurement, needed to obtain three quotes, but upon doing further research, there are, um, are other software platforms that have different types of data and display it in different manners that may be more meaningful, and the cost was less. And so with that, I was not able to renew just like that with the three quotes for Buxton. And so with the uh, collaboration with Team Tourism, I think it'll be important that I bring forth um, my research and show them these different platforms and see which one we'd like to go with. And so that is um, my uh, tactical plan here is to have a um, analytics gathered by a third party company to better understand our consumers visiting and those living in the village of Riedoso. The data gained will give us a competitive advantage to other resort communities and it'll be used um, for marketing, advertising, events, tourism, recruiting and retention decisions to benefit the village of Rio Doso and uh, to give us a higher return on investment moving forward so we're not just shooting in the dark when we're advertising to people. This will give us a, a better understanding of who these uh, travelers are. And so I plan on working collaboratively with Team Tourism um, and also regional benefits to identify different industries that we could potentially bring in. Um, one thing that I had started last year was working with realtors that had commercial listings um, to show them what could potentially be a good fit for that uh, vacant building. And so hopefully our new software will give us that uh, type of information that we can continue to build on to improve the community as a whole. Sam, one of the warnings I always give people is um, whenever <coughs> looking at switching a software platform, Make sure that the data you currently have can be imported into the new software because it can't always. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of software companies that uh, don't provide any um, any means to export and pull it into another program. So I, I, I've had a number, because I used to do that kind of stuff, and I had a number of customers that got screwed um, thinking they're going to switch to something that's going to be less expensive. So just make sure about portability. That's a good point. Those are all my department goals um, for this upcoming year, and I'll work to add in the blighted uh, goal into Thank my you. tactical plan, and we'll develop a strategy on how to implement that this year, working with uh, Chief Chavez. So. Sounds good. Thank you all so much for your Ma input. Mayor Council, <clears throat> Mayor, um, you know, one of the things that I know that you're interested in is the uh, metropolitan redevelopment. Yes. So there are strategies to you know, uh, start implementing that tool, and there's going to be some budget recommendations for that as well. So is that part of our goals? Yes. Correct. Yes. Okay, great. I just wanted to bring that up because I know you're interested in that area. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, um, Councilor, if we can move to Team Tourism now. We're, I'd ask that we move that one up. Uh, I know that Team Tourism does have some meetings. I think with the hospitality. <coughs> I tried getting them in earlier, but it was recommended. <coughs> okay. Oh, okay. Sorry, I was late. It's all oh, water issue stuff. Water rats. Good morning, Mayor and Councilors. Good morning. Good morning. Mayor, uh, real quick, there is a refreshment set up in the back if anybody is um, needing some power energy or whatever, brain power yeah. energy. Or now that you're up here, yeah. We'll see you in a little bit. And any, any of the staff or public that's here can also help yourself. We got to meet Elizabeth, too. <coughs> oh, so everybody's met Elizabeth. We've met Elizabeth. Okay, awesome. Welcome aboard. She's officially Thank you. in. Thank okay. you. She's just not getting paid yet. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, but I'm here. <laughs> Mary, Thank just real quick, um, we're going over the purpose statement and then validating it, you know, making sure that the governing body's okay with it, and then we're going over the org chart, making sure the governing body's okay with it, and then moving on to tactical okay. plan. All right, thank you. Sorry for my tardiness this morning. And um, I just want to put a little precursor out there that we kind of inherited this, and um, we're, I was pinch hitting here for um, getting this together for today. And I really wish I would have had uh, Dick Cook's tutorial because as he was giving the tutorial on the tactical plans, she and I were looking at each other with completely panicked <laughs> eyes because you will notice that this tactical plan from last year has like 482 
action items in it, not five. Not five. And so um, I think now that um, Elizabeth is on board here, if we could ask for a little grace from you guys to, um, I think you guys will have a lot of input today. We, I had gone through and updated um, last year's plan, so I can give you the progress from what you guys heard last year. And then um, I think that with her on board, we will have lots of adjustments to this to put together the, you know, the five goals moving forward. Yes, so, that's fine. Just a little up front there. Um, our purpose statement, um, Team Tourism will focus heavily on crafting the brand of Ridoso to deliver a quality product that continues to grow and develop Ridoso as a destination. We will work across all departments to ensure the brand quality and visitor experience are exceptional and that we are delivering a product that keeps our tourists returning to our community year after year. We will work to maximize Lodger's tax funds to make informed marketing, <coughs> advertising, event, and tourism-related marketing decisions. It's a good purpose. <clears throat> Any comments or changes that you guys like can, need to be made on that? No. I think it's good. Okay. Um, the first uh, action item that ties back to comp plan events goal 1.1, determine the, the direct impact of Lodgers Tax funded events to our Lodgers Tax collections through mobile data analysis. And the responsible party on that is team tourism and event organizers. And that just goes back to where we want to use the analytical tool to analyze the impact that the various events that we have through the community um, have on Lodger's tax and what it actually brings back to the community. And to ensure that the, the events that we're having attract visitors to the community. And obviously in the last year and a half, two years, that's been a little dicey. Um, but we did... Um, we were able to use that on several events, including the All-American Cowboy Fest and Aspen Fest. Um, due to COVID, there were fewer events than what we had planned. And so we will continue to assess and analyze those events as we move forward. The second one um, goes back to the comp plan goal, marketing and advertising goal 1.4. We will utilize these reports to make more informed marketing and advertising decisions, again, using the analytical tool. And our goal is to identify strategic market segments where we can continue to, where we can continue the growth of tourism through enhanced marketing and advertising efforts. And we'll focus on the following areas to drive year-over-year -year growth. So again, using the tool to um, look at uh, to develop a geographic marketing strategy, identifying key areas for our marketing growth, um, using it for psychographic market segmentation, identifying strong segments for continued marketing efforts, um, potential growth opportunities, utilizing the data to drive continued growth and market diversification. And um, that is just a, a lot of ways of saying just using all of that uh, data treasure trove to figure out, you know, if we're um, seeing visitors from places that we're not currently advertising in or maybe we're not advertising um, <clears throat> as much as we should and we can shift our efforts that way. Um, the progress that we've made there is in addition to using the data from social media and Google Analytics and our visit widget, which is our mobile app, um, to keep us informed for our marketing strategy. We did add the data from the analytic tool to um, our arsenal and we, we utilized that in figuring out where we were gonna buy our advertising, where we were gonna focus um, some of our social advertising and make our, our buys. So that was um, how we utilized the analytical tool there. So, so would you define psychographic so Coughlin will quit reading the definition? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going, really? I thought I got a discharge from the hospital. I, go back. I just want to know how it makes you feel. <laughs> well, that is, it's like how they, how they, how a consumer will react to 
an event or how or you know how they feel about something. So it's how they. Um, Besides their regular gender, age, yes. uh, demographic, yes, this it's is like another. How, it's, the, it's the touchy feely yeah. side of everything. Okay. And how do you figure that out? They, it's by, um, it's by, you know, what they. Again, it's the mobile analytic. It's by what they're what searches, they're typing, the yeah, emojis, what they're, searching, okay. what okay. they're using, yeah. um, just their all their actions on their phone. Wow. <laughs> Brother. Yes. Yes. Say yes, it is. <laughs> you are big brother in this instance. You're the I'm man. full of love. <laughs> you are very touchy feely. Yeah, thank you. Um, any more questions? He's still looking. He's no, still no, trying to figure a, out what it means. No, I haven't looked at the app in a long time because previously it wasn't as user friendly as I would have liked the, to have the seen. widget? Yeah, so I just was going through it. It's like, oh, okay, it's like different it's mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I, I like it better now it's it's easy to to go through yes it's come a long way from when we first when we first put it into place let me ask you the um uh, you know under to do and food to drink uh food and drink and and where to stay and stuff like that do those people just automatically get added in or do they have to pay for advertising on the widget no we we add them in okay. they don't pay Okay, so it's a good broad representation yes. of what's available in the community. And it's a, a shuffle, like how they're listed. Uh -huh. It's not, it's a constant shuffle. It's not, you know, one, if you if you show up at the top, you're not always at the top. The next time you pull it up, it's a it's a different yep. order. Yeah. So it's different from the 10 most romantic things to do in Rudos over Valentine's Day? <laughs> mm -hmm. That's a different deal. Yes. <laughs> That's a paid adver advertisement. Paid well, yeah. Is that really? Yeah. Oh, all of those. Let me know. Whatever. Yeah, it's just. Well, it's the whoever buys advertising, basically. Yeah. So okay. that's how ten, romance is The first ten to buy get in there. Yeah, yeah okay. that's the most romantic. Okay, continue. Um, okay, the next one, um, assets and attractions, which is tied to goal 1.1.B, coordinated regional approach to better understand the assets and attractions that drive key segments of our tourism economy and to better understand how we can serve those assets and attractions. And that ties to what you just had in your plan just now. So I don't know how, like in a case like that, how we want to do that moving forward because that was the very last one that Samantha just had in her plan. Mm -hmm. So this was from last year. So I don't know how, Tim, if you, or Rodney, if y'all want to give us direction on do we remove this from our plan and put put it put what you had in our plan, or how do we want to do that where it crosses over? You did say collaborate, but we're mm -hmm. collaborating um, on that. I think uh -huh. that it, it's a valid goal for you all as well, and we leave it in both and continue to leave the responsible party as team tourism because that's what we are. We just work off of each other and mm -hmm. use our strong points to benefit the team as a whole. So I think we can collaborate on these goals. So together. we can just kind of take this what's here right now out and replace it with yours. No, it could remain in your goal, but it'll be it'll be addressed in both of them. But what we'll, like she mentioned, we'll work um, collectively as a team to address your item. Okay. You're gonna have to add the museum to yours. We already put it in hers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so that was just this was a list that was made last year and just talking about you know, working with um, within the county and the region um, to partner and and. Uh, Mayor, Mayor um, Council uh, Carrie, what, what I would recommend is that we revisit that goal, mm -hmm. and then um, you know, any any time that we're starting to look at at uh, you know the lodgers tax, let's revert back to the the definition. And it, it talks about us, you know, marketing tourist-related attractions. Well, here in a tourist-based economy, you know, a lot of private businesses are tourist-related attractions. Right. But we need to we need to make sure that there is some type of, of standard of, of care or quality that we're we're looking at. And same, you know, are we going to promote businesses that are uh, serving a fly in their food? You know, no, we don't want to do that. Right. We want to make sure that. The tourists that are coming into our community are um, having a good experience, and we're going to promote those. We want to make sure that they have business licenses within the village of Redoso. You know, those are the ones we're going to support. We want to make sure that they're 
um, have a direct relationship to the community. So not just listing out like everybody that we're going to uh, promote. I think we need to make sure that it's fair and equitable for all uh, public or uh, businesses that exist, but then making sure that there's some type of standard as we look at it as well. So my, my recommendation is that we revisit that and then come back to the mayor and council with a, with a uh, instead of listing the businesses, list the criteria of how we would approach those various things. Good point. That that would work good yeah, that's because a very good way of putting it. I think yes. so too. That would work all the way because I did have questions on the list that were the following assets and attractions, yeah. you know, and, and right off the bat I say cross out ski Apache and cross out End of the Mountain Gods, mm -hmm. replace it with our own convention center and our league golf course. You know, and that's the and then the correction of naming Eagle Creek Complex. What's that? While well, the official name is Eagle Creek Sports Complex. The same thing with the White Mountain Complex, it's the White Mountain Recreational Complex. Uh, also, the Cedar Creek Trail System should be local and regional trail systems. I mean, if we're, and, and that's one thing I always had a beef, and this goes years back with, with the lodgers tax. Um, we don't collect taxes from hotels, motels in Redoso Downs or Carrizozo or anything there, but yet in our brochures, they would have them listed in the brochures that we're paying, while Lodgers tax, Redoso Lodgers tax is paying for. But that's where the concept was that while we're a regional thing, I said, well, let's pay our portion for our limits. And, and if they want to add in there, then charge a fee saying, yeah, we could add you here, but we'll, you know, charge you for this much to have it printed up. Anyway, that, that's what, what got me when I read this the other, the other day that, um, and, and again, nothing against the Apache or end of the mountain gods, but are they paying us gross receipt tax? No. Are they paying us larger tax? No. So I think for our, our plan and our strategic planning that we just stick with our, our local and uh, regional assets. Mayor, Mayor, um, you know, uh, Mayor Pro Temp, I totally agree um, with that concept. And at the same time, you know, we need to continue building relationships with um, the um, surrounding regional communities and trying to encourage them to, you know, put the proper um, um, authorities in place so that they're also charging and collecting from uh, the hotels and, and short-term rentals out there in the community, and that they start in implementing strategies that are going to benefit the whole region as well. Correct. And, you know that that's when we start to look at oh, no. at the Lincoln County tours and whatnot. You know that's really the strategy. But then in some of our conversations with some of the partners, is do you know this option exists? And you know um, a lot of communities around us, not just around us, but statewide. They don't understand the short-term rental ordinance um, that that they're allowed to pass. Um, you know, everybody calls it Airbnb. It's not Airbnb. It's short-term rentals, and so a lot of it is going to be educational and trying to help them put the increments in place. So, you know, I, I think as as we look at creating regional partners, we need to to you know help um, you know get them to that area of understanding of of what their largest tax can actually do for them. But I, I totally agree that, you know, our efforts really need a main focus on making sure that our lodgers or our tourist attractions are promoted properly. Correct. Well, and to a point, being on the other side of that, when you're selling marketing, um, you know, the, the whole village benefits off of the racetrack, benefits off of people that do come skiing. And so as a result, I get the phone calls, you get the phone calls that say, I'm never coming to Rudos again. Exactly. Because you know, my experience is ski Apache. So we've been trying to handle that. So I'm, you know, I'm all for taking them off of number one and number two. But when we're advertising Ruidoso, we're advertising the amenities that go on in the county. We're advertising for Lincoln County Days. They're staying in Ruidoso. They're not staying in Lincoln. Yeah, I know. You know, they're, you know, and so it's one of those, you know, cut off your nose, spot your face thing that you have to look at the overall picture of that. And I agree. We've tried working just with no resolve with the ski Apache forever and it's, it's not happening, but you know, I, I agree taking that off, but I don't want to see it being a broad brush painted on all the other attractions, you know, 
the last ride of Billy the Kid. Uh, or we're not going to do the um, advertise the, um, the um, what's the cowboy thing? All American cowboy thing. No, the the, the restaurant, the dining, uh, the uh, oh, flying J, flying J, flying J. Fly and J. Yeah. You know, advertise yeah. all these things. Spencer oh. Theater. So, you know, yeah. I don't want to say, you know, all those are bad actors, but when they come to Rudolph, so they enjoy their experience at the Flying J. Right. They, they're not right. saying, I'm going to stay in the county. They're saying, I'm staying at the hotel, the short-term rental. I want us to be aware of that, but I'm like you. I'm tired of carrying the water. I'm tired of putting up with the comments, and then when you try to address them, you're a racist, or you hate us, or whatever. That's not the case. The case is run your business. And we will run ours and run them better. And so that's that's the thing. So, I mean. I think there's a difference between, um, like, let's take the website as, a, as an example. We, you know, we do, we create a lot of content on the website. And it, um, like, a, you know, you said a minute ago, list of, you know, the top ten romantic places in mm -hmm. Reno. So, but take something like that, like, um, a list of things to do in the winter in Rideau. So a list of things to do in the fall, a you know, and, and travelers, it's, I mean, there's research and stats that show when you're planning a trip, people go find things like that on travel That's websites. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, if we have stuff like that, that has, you know, there's, and, a, and on our list, we have, you know, Ridosa Winter Park and, and we have, and Ski Apache's going to be on there. Or if we have a list of spas in Ridoso, and the spa out at the end is going to be on there. There's a difference between stuff like that and what we used to do where yep. when we would do our winter advertising, we promoted the heck out of Ski the Apache. area. Right. Um, and we have made a conscious effort to pull back on that because of weather conditions and other things, which we've talked about. Correct. Um, I, that's where I see this big difference, you know, is, is we we make that conscious decision. Yeah. We don't just do a scorched earth take on it and wipe them off of, of you know, wipe those entities because those are things that people come here to do yep. and we can't ignore that. So right. I think that would be our recommendation on, you know, right. an approach to that. So there's a difference between listing and promoting. Yes, correct. Yeah. Yeah, because then we, you can put an asterisk. Beware of. <laughs> well, because well, we don't want to. We don't want to promote like yeah. some roadkill cafe. You right. know, uh, we right. want to promote good restaurants and good, have right. good um, environmental health mm -hmm. ratings and not having you know stuff like that. Right. So we've got to be careful as exactly. far as that goes. And and we don't. You know, we don't. Right. We don't ever do that. But there's a difference. Well, between... no, but. But what I'm saying is, uh, I think what I heard from several different things here, putting it together, is basically quality. Yes. You know, right. we want to promote quality. Whoever they are, promote quality. Um, because that's what's going to bring people here. Because, yes, you go to a town and you get food poisoning at a restaurant, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, my God, I'm never going back to that place again. I got food poisoning right. eating at the Roadkill Cafe. You know, well, the name should have given you the hint. But, <laughs> right. Um, but, you know, if we say, like, if we do something like, okay, well, we're, we're, we can't feature you on Discover Ridosa, or we can't talk about you on Discover Ridosa if you don't have a business license, then that means we can't talk about White Sands. We can't talk about um, Oh, yes. Fort Stanton, those are you know. different. Yeah. And a spa located right. at IMG. Right. But, I mean, those are attractions. Yeah. You know, we have spas. We right. don't have another skiing resort. We don't have White Sands here. But this could be the hub mm -hmm. to do all those. Right. So, so I agree yeah. that we need to look at those those are different items as a regional yep. or whatever type of component that you come here to experience. And we have plenty of these other businesses that do have business yes. licenses. <laughs> and I think that we can make that distinction. Mm -hmm. But I mean, we just, you know, people, I'm really proud of like all of the content that's on our website because it's so robust right. and people use it to, you know, put itineraries together. And, and so, you know, I think that we need to be, very cognizant of that, that we give them a place to to see what all, I mean, really Lincoln County is about. So. Yeah. Well, yeah. The, the, the business license is those that have a physical presence within. And, and I'm not saying we don't do it, but, you know, some of the areas where that is um, a potential is uh, um, uh, services and classes and whatnot that we offer at the community center, the Wingfield Market, bringing people in for that. Um, making sure that they are 
collecting and reporting their GRT. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because sometimes people just go in and and say, well, I'm a nonprofit. Well, no, you're not. You're just not making a profit. So uh, there's a difference. You're just not collecting, <laughs> yeah. remitting tax. Yeah, yeah, not Sales remitting. Tax. Yes. not remitting the tax. Yeah. Mayor, you know, um, Carrie, it, it's obvious that we don't have the authority outside the village of Rio Doso, but the businesses that are within Rio Doso, we have a responsibility right. to make sure that everybody's being treated fair and equitable. And part of that is making sure, you know, there was a, a person conducting business that we were actually promoting, and it was for a health care issue and we need to make sure that they have a business license right. just like the other person yes and yes. you know counselor you know what, what, know what i'm talking, talking about, about yeah. but you know it looks pretty bad on us if we're over here promoting a business yeah. and then we're not enforcing the business license issues yeah. so yeah like health permits and stuff when they're serving food and yes or this uh bond torture kill visitor center what's that all about it's <laughs> I just had to watch a little CNN the other day about very scary people. So that's Billy the Kid. Elizabeth, if uh, and Carrie, if Team Tourism could work together, rework that goal, and then we'll present it back when we go to council for approval of all the plans. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I, Carrie, I had a question. Is the Hubbard Museum reopened? No. So we're that's friends of the friends of the museum is disbanded. Yeah, it's. So we have it down there. I'm just they saying no that might be a false they have no We're getting their popcorn machine, so. Yeah. Uh, what happened to Billy the Kid? The, the visitor, visitor center. center. It's still there. It's still there. BTK. That's the BTK I was BTK. talking about. Yeah, that's separate from the Oh, BTK. <laughs> Mayor, yeah. Mayor Councilor, and I believe uh, under Tim Roberts' uh, tactical plan, he's going to be talking about the Billy the Kid and some of the proposed changes that we have coming up as well. Okay, the next one, competitive market analysis goal one, um, economic development, utilize analytics to determine performance of our statewide competition and identify new potential audience growth. Um, analyzing the audience strengths of our competitors across the state and into Colorado and using the data to determine uh, new potential market segments. And again, that just ties back to using the um, analytic tool to look at um, Red River, Taos, Angel Fire, Pagosa Springs, Durango, Santa Fe, um, to keep our eyes on our competitors, which we do. Um, you know, we've always done that anyway, looking at everything that they're doing through their, their um, advertising campaigns, what they're doing with their websites. And um, we continue to evaluate our competitors with using their marketing strategies and and so then again just pulling that, um, that data tool in to use that to analyze as well. Um, the entertainment goal number three um, in the comp plan providing entertainment for locals working with Parks and Rec to purchase a mobile stage and backline to host entertainment throughout the year in the village, and that's a goal that um, also is in Rodney's plan. I thought we got that. This yeah, I did too. Year. That's what I said, but it was so just looked at. So we have the funding set aside um, during the last year. There's, There's been, when we looked at it, there are issues with the delivery of okay. that, also with the procurement of it. And so we're continuing to look at that. Um, you know, a related item is we're also uh, uh, sent out an RFP for an entertainment promoter, and that is another, um, that a stage and sound, that, that's something that the promoter can provide, so um, we will be presenting something to you later in the year and, and make a decision whether we keep contracting that out or continue to look at purchasing our own. What's a back line? Uh, the, the sound, the lighting okay. behind it. Oh, okay. So what's, did we rent the stage for Santa Claus on, on that Christmas in the park? No, that stage was, uh, belonged to the convention. Oh, okay. Because I thought that was a pretty good sized stage. The stages that we're talking about would support the, like the music series that we've held uh, over the there. summer. Yeah. And are proposing to host the stage okay. here as well. 
Um, the next goal uh, work with the New Mexico Film Office and increase, and that would be to increase our global brand and presence through the New Mexico film industry. I know that there was, um, the former tourism director had one initial call with the New Mexico film office um, prior to his departure. And the next steps on this, um, we have had initial discussions with um, Tim at the convention center. And now that Elizabeth is on board, I think that, um, that the two of them will kind of take that over and work on developing strategic partnerships in that area. So that, unless Elizabeth wants to add anything on that. No, I think Tim and I will okay. collaborate on that. Okay. Um, the next plan goal, increase pedestrian-friendly zones in Midtown. Just um, take that one out. Okay. Just take it out. We'll put it in Josh's TAC plan or... <laughs> Street, that one doesn't even need to be in here. And I don't know why I didn't stop it last year, but it don't have nothing to do with <laughs> promoting Riodoso. And we do got a good pedestrian walk plan because I think to get the traffic light at Eagle, the village had to pay for those devices. The highway department wouldn't install them in there. So that's what I'm looking at. Of course, when I was living in that neighborhood, I was always hollering for a traffic light at Chase. Mm -hmm. But that might be the solution here that we may end up having to put a traffic light at Country Club <laughs> to create those crosswalks. And then after the uh, after Dick Cook's tutorial today, what I would recommend is the next, um, like, I mean, all of the next probably four could go under one one item because they're all about this um, the social media and it's just breaking down like what our what we set out our individual goals for increasing engagement and followers so um, I will still you know go over those with you but I would that's what the suggestion that I would make is that we would put that into one item and so um, for digital marketing, um, social media growth, and it ties to action 1.1.2D, economic development. And the first one to increase followers and fans on social by 10% with a total of 105,000 followers across Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And again, this is for the tourism side of things, not municipal. And the, the progress that we've made on that, in 2020, we saw an increase of 8% in followers on social media. And right now, at the end of 2021, we have reached 96,962 followers on social media, and we anticipate meeting our follower goal by the, end, by the fiscal end date of uh, June 30th, 2022. So what percentage increase over 2020 was that? Um, it is in, okay, let's see. We saw an 8% increase in followers on social media. Um, in 2020. In, in 2020. And then, so that would be a 10% increase in 2021 when we hit that at the end. Well, you're, you're, uh, so you're looking to increase right. by 10%. Yes. But then at the bottom, it says progress in 2020 we've reached 96,962 followers. So did you meet 10% or did? By the end of, by fiscal, by the end of fiscal, our goal was to meet it by 10. And so we're, we're telling you where we're at now at 96. If we, and when we hit the 105, we will have met the 10%. D that would be the 100, yes. okay, that would be it, okay. It, just the way the data is provided, it's like you've got percentages and you've got numbers and they're not correlating to, to each other. I and I don't do math good in my head. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah no, no. I would never, <laughs> and never I figure it out. But <laughs> yeah. No, it's you got to give me a minute. They are talking together. <laughs> yeah, it's it's your topic yeah. talking apples and oranges yeah. in that section. Um, and then the the next one, still talking about. Um, so that was increasing followers. So the next item is increasing likes, comments, shares, and mentions 
on social by 20%. And so then our goal would be to hit 2 million <coughs> engagements. So that's, that's not followers, that's them doing, taking an action on it. So hitting the like button, commenting, um, sharing, doing whatever. So, and do what? Loves. Yes, loves, hearts. Hearts. <laughs> Um, so in 2020, we saw an increase of 28%, and, and a lot of that um, obviously can be contributed to COVID-19 and, as always, snow, because people love snow. Um, we, and so we don't anticipate that much of an increase, but um, we, we did set a goal of having a 20% increase. We don't have those numbers already? Do what? We don't have those numbers already? Um, no. Why wouldn't we? I thought it was instantaneous on the... On no, we the don't, because we don't have them for the end of the year. It does say on the it, next page that yeah, by the end I of mean, yes, 2021, we we're at 1.18. But we don't have the ending number for the year. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah. I just thought on all the social media stuff, it was, you know, you could track it anytime, anywhere. That's, you know, a we click did. is... Today, but you yeah. said you didn't try to increase their activity. We're, the year ends January, uh, June 30th. Right now, at the end of the year, at the end of 2021, we've seen 1.18 1. 1. 1. Mm -hmm. million total engagements. So the engagement of 2 million by June 30th, we're just having to extrapolate it out, is going to be a stretch because we're just we're a little more than halfway there. So it is, in, I mean, we do have the numbers instantaneous. Yes, do you see that? Yeah, I, I see that. I was just correlating your dates in 2021 mm -hmm. that it would be a, a uh, where was I looking at that? You're going to but we want to continue to have an increase in engagement of 20% 20, 20 in 2021. So 20, I thought so, you would have that number. We do. We want to continue to have an increase in engagement of 20% in 2021. Meaning the fiscal, the the, well, that, the 2021 22. It should have dash 22. Okay. Okay, that's what, uh, okay. That's what's messing So up. that's 2022. Yeah. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. well, we okay. may not want all those comments on the snow right now either. No. <laughs> <laughs> Put some more controversial posts up there and you'll get a lot of comments. I yeah. know. I know. And then, so then mm. you see the progress that we're at 1.18. So. The engagement goal of two million by June 30, it might be a stretch because we're about halfway there. Any other questions on that? Um, increased traffic to discoverridoso.com from social media with a total of 140,000 plus visits um, ties again to the same goal as above. Um, we had seen an increase of 46 percent in visits from social media to the Discover Ridoso website. Again, much of it because of COVID and the progress right now, we've seen 132,782 visits. We anticipate being able to meet that goal by the end of um, June 30th, 2022, because we're very close to that. So. And so, Carrie, um, to get all of these numbers, um, you're putting up nice pictures, that kind of marketing type stuff yes. so that somebody that loves the snow, oh, this mm -hmm. looks good, right. I like. Okay. Yes. Okay. And then this, this last one in particular is our call to action is driving them to the website. So like we'll, we'll put up a, um, you know, if it's coming into the weekend and it's, uh, you know, a, a long holiday weekend. Like Martin Luther King, we you know we would put up a join a you know come visit for the long holiday weekend, and we would say you know the ice rink is going to be open, and we link to the story on, or the content on the website that talks about the ice rink and the hours, and um, you know that has the list of other five fun things to do in Ridoso that weekend. So, are you the one that's doing, okay, let's just say Parks and Rec, are you the one that is putting that out? Or is that the Parks and Rec department? We do it in conjunction. Okay. At Sydney um, and Parks and Rec, they have a good line of communication with us so that 
they make sure we know what they're doing, okay. what events they have going on, and then when we get it, we make sure we have matching content on the website, and then we build our social calendar from that, and you know, okay. so it's a it's a very um, concerted effort between our departments. Okay. Um, then the the last one on that one is social media again linking to the economic development um, continue to implement uh, successful social media advertising campaigns and this this just gives you an uh, update on in 2020 we shifted due to COVID and we went from a more active plan your visit to more of a focus on brand awareness and public health and safety and then as in the early months of 2021, as the vaccines were beginning to roll out, we saw the older um, retirement age people starting to travel first because they were um, getting getting boost or getting vaccinated first. And then, um, so we we started our first call to action campaigns, and we centered on the far away, close to nature message because you know people were coming up here and getting outside. And so we focused on that. And then as we got closer to spring break, we went back to some commercials that focused on what the community was doing to keep visitors safe. And that those were, um, those were successful for us. And then as, as summer approached and lodgers tax numbers continued to climb, um, the marketing messages continued on a, a strong call to action, encouraging them to come enjoy the many COVID safe activities that we did have. And it was during this time that we were able to take advantage of the tourism department's um, co-op marketing program, which added, as you guys know, the 104,000 um, extra dollars to the bottom line of our marketing budget, which was great. And um, that, has, those efforts have continued through our fall and winter marketing calendar. So that's on the tourism side of things, the, the progress on the tactical plans. And any questions on that before we move to the municipal stuff? Well, I'm just having an issue. I know it's just me. I guess my brain doesn't comprehend it. But at one point, we're talking about the end of 2021, we've exceeded our goal. Uh, follow our goal ahead of schedule is 14. So we're talking about December 2021. Because fiscal year 20, that, that we went through the year ends in July of 2022. So that's called 2022. So I just get confused. In 2020, we saw an increase of 42%. And so I, I, it seems like we're jumping from year end to fiscal year sometimes. And that's what I'm trying to f figure out. At the end of the 2021, we have. <clears throat> Earlier, I was talking about the same date, and you said, no, it's fiscal year. So that fiscal year 2021 is already gone. Right. 22 is coming up this July, the end of June. Right. And okay. I guess what my <clears throat> my numbers that mm -hmm. we're pulling are from the end of 2021. December. December. December yeah. Because that's that's what we were pulling mm -hmm. to so, put in. And that's why I was confused because we should have those numbers at the end of the month because that's almost automatic. And then we were right. talking about fiscal year. So that's where I was like, yeah. we're not on fiscal year. We're on calendar calendar this right here right just okay. yes just and I that's would, what i was saying i just wanted a point of reference because i get confused going back and forth so okay yes, sorry i'm good no that's good as long as i know where we're at just put calendar year 2021 or fiscal year 2021 in future yeah, Mayor. And, well and when we redo this yeah. It, well, we'll, yeah. we'll make it yeah because clear. everything is ending <clears throat> starting dates are fiscal and then when we're talking about the body we're talking about calendar and that's well, I was, I'm thinking of things like COVID that you're talking about, and then I'm thinking about how did the, the, um, the guy, the um, Lincoln County Tours tie into this, mm -hmm. Ridosa Tours, mm -hmm. you know, and where's the impact and how did that, because we felt like that was a pretty big success. Mm -hmm. So how is this engaging in that, and I was just getting lost. Well, and we were, I was instructed not to do anything on this, but update the progress part. Okay. So all we updated was the progress. Okay. And so 
that was that's why I said I wish I had had my sure no and I, I get it I was just yeah. I, I was getting confused back and forth and I thought it was just me because a lot of times it's just me that uh so anyway. Mayor, Marin, that is the process you know you just update the progress that's made and then if there's a change that's where we make the change yep. yeah. so um, Mayor I did have a question a lot of the social media campaigns that we're, we're conducting, you know, oftentimes it's in other markets, not here. Is there any way that we can, you know, um, tag the council or the governing body on, on a lot of those um, social media campaigns that are not happening within our, our market area so that um, they can see the, the uh, you we know. Can't, we can't tag them, but we can certainly, um, we can make copy, you know, I mean, we can screenshot and send them to them um we can't tag them because they're served up to people who who we you know right. geofence or you're we, targeted yeah and so That's they're right. they're not living in midland they're not um, no offense but they might not be 30 to 35 and, <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm that is true up, i'm just bringing that up because oftentimes you know i don't know if we address it through a monthly report or whatnot a lot of the marketing activity that's occurring, I don't think you all see it because you're not in those markets right. or in that demographic right. or, or whatnot. But, I mean, like we just so. recently did that for Rodney for the um, event promoter RFP. He asked us to um, to do an ad on social media for that. And so we put it together and then he's not obviously going to see it, but we screenshotted it and sent it to him and then sent him the the performance data on yeah. it. Yeah, and I, I know that you report to Lodgers Tax and you provide a lot of that information on Lodgers Tax. I just think that we need to be providing that information maybe on a quarterly basis to the governing body okay. so that, that we, you all see it. You're, you're right, because I know we've reached into the Arizona market quite a bit, but then just from personal experiences of talking to people that are here, and they're saying this is the first time I've ever been to Rio Adoso, uh, I've never even heard of it before. Mm -hmm. And then when you ask them, where do you live? And they say DFW, Dallas, Rowlett, Heath. And it's like, what? You know, they don't know about us. You know, how'd you get here? Well, you know, these people brought us. We usually go to Red River. We usually go yeah. to. And so, you know, is it, have we saturated those markets? Do we need to go back into them? And those are questions that we have that if you would tell us where we're at, maybe we would. Where we're, we're, we're marketing, we'd understand better. And then we could travel to those areas to see. Yeah, just see yeah, if we, are we really days. getting it? Yeah. <laughs> we need to take the council meeting on the road so we can start seeing that. Instead of tax deduction. Yeah. Yeah. Tim, uh, Mayor, council members, maybe now that we have a tourism director, we can do a more comprehensive uh, end of the month report for your all's uh, manager's report and include that in addition to the statistics because usually that's just all it is is analytics, but we can uh, give what we've done that mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. And, and, and Mayor uh, Kerry, we, we understand that, you know, the tourism director hasn't been there, so and that's how come, you know, we just ask present what's there and then the council give us direction on, on what we're moving forward with. So you guys are doing an excellent job presenting, by the way. <laughs> nice kitty, good kitty. Uh, boy, Tim. <laughs> I'm not trying to beat her up. She, I mean, they're just good at what they I'm do. Used to it. And I've missed the last hour and a half of the meeting, so I'm trying to get my licks in now. Yeah. Wait, wait. <laughs> so now the meeting slows down. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Now, now we shift to the municipal side of things. And again, I think that um, this, these can go into one item as well. Um, so the municipal website. Mm -hmm ties back to goal 2.1 A and B, um, assuring that residents are well educated and informed and continue to drive traffic to the RidosoNM.gov website and maintain its position as the source for Village of Ridoso News. And the progress on that, we have continued to use the municipal website as a COVID resource center and the traffic of that site continues to that section of the site continues to grow um, in the, as the community has come to know that that is a trusted source for information. We also recently redesigned the home page to make it more user friendly and the current design of that is based on what pages are visited and searched for the most by users. So again, we took the analytics and we looked and, and the icons down at the bottom are what were the most searched for and the most trafficked pages on the website. And um, 
Then we also added the how do I feature, which is up in the top nav, you'll see a how do I, and you click on it, and it takes you to a page that's full of questions by that are categorized. How do I get a building permit? How do I mm -hmm. um, pay my water bill? How do I, and again, those, we um, formulated those questions based on looking at the analytics and what people were searching for. So um, that, uh, I think that's been, hopefully that's been helpful for people. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that because this past summer and stuff, I was getting not a lot of calls, but man, you're, and even myself, your website is hard to maneuver and get through. Like you mentioned a garage sale permit, you know, or, or solicitation permit and things, and then I tried looking for it, and boy, I, I just gave up, called Samantha, print me out some permits, and I'll deliver these over here, or, or the applications, that's what I was getting at. Right. So I'm, I'm really glad to hear that, um, that you have all those different options. I used them all. So, I just good. moved here, I used every little link, and I was like, oh, this is great, and so I, it is working. Good. Yeah. Good. So the analytics include a lot of Elizabeth Ritter. <laughs> and I think that, you know, there's, I mean, there's so much information on that website. Oh, yes, it's kind of, there it is. is. Overwhelming. And, you know, I think that, like, those of us that are on it all the time, we're like, oh, yeah, it's right here. And you go here and you go here. And then you get an outsider, you know, who's like, I can't find anything. And right. And it kind of, you know, is like, whoa, maybe we better take a look at this. So, anyway, hopefully it is better. Um, the next, this is, the next uh, couple are the social media for the municipal Facebook. And Leonard, I'll try to get my calendar years versus... <laughs> Mayor Leonard. <laughs> um, okay, so tying to goal 2.1 A and B, that residents are well-educated. We wanted to increase followers and fans on social by 10% with a total of 12,000 across Facebook and Twitter. So in... 2020, 2021. <laughs> I got it now in my brain. I was just. <laughs> we saw an increase of 42% on followers and social media, and that was in huge part to so, due to social media. I mean, to COVID-19. Um, we we do not anticipate that kind of growth in this fiscal year, um, and so we we adjusted that to look for a 10% growth at the end of calendar year 2021 we had exceeded our follower growth ahead of schedule we have 14,658 fans on Facebook and Twitter so we did do better than what we had anticipated do, um, do we change Facebook to meta now didn't they change their brand they do it all in like that? I mean, they, well that's the, the company that owns Facebook yes. it's still, okay. Facebook. It's still, it's still Facebook. Facebook Okay. It, it still trades as FB like when you got married you still get to Oh, okay. you know, act like you do, but you're responsible to somebody else. Now. There you go. Um, the next one to, and this is the, the likes, comments, shares, mentions on social um, with a goal of 300,000 engagements. And in fiscal year 2021, we saw an increase of 70% on social media. And again, I would attribute all of that to COVID. We don't anticipate that large of an increase. At the end of calendar year 2021, we had already exceeded our engagement goal ahead of schedule. We have 331,663 engagements. Um, the next one, public relations, uh, the goal one of economic development. Just want to touch here on media tracking and analysis. In 2021, the calendar year 2021, we added a new tracking and analysis component to Cision, which is a media tracking um, software that we've used for quite a long time. But we added a new component to it um, that allows us to um, break down and analyze um, whether we can monetize the mention, we can yeah, determine whether it was positive or negative, whether it was neutral, um, and that's called no, sentiment. Okay, and Perfect. it gives us a broad visibility on how our brand is being perceived on a larger scale. And so yeah. that has, good. has good. given us um, really invaluable information so that when we come to Lodger's Tax and we can say, 
here's the coverage that we've received, you know, in any given period of time. And in the past, we would just, you know, be able to say, okay, here's the coverage we received in Lubbock and Midland, and and then we could we could kind of correlate the the money value tied to that. And now this program, it spits out a ton of graphs and says this is exactly the dollar value tied to that media coverage. And so it gives us, you know, down to the penny and tells us whether it was really positive. Um, we don't really get a whole lot of negative um, or if it was just neutral. And so that is, that's very helpful in, mm -hmm. in, you know, what we're doing and whether it was earned or unearned. You know, if we went out and we did a PR campaign and worked to get it or if it was just picked up because it was a feel-good story. So that's been really good for us this year. Any questions on that? Yes, sir. Okay, out of the 331-plus engagements, yes, where is the data that tells us how many people are repeating going back and forth as opposed to 331 new people? You know what I'm saying? It's not different people. It's what's the frequency am I going to look at Real adult stuff. Did you have that number? Well, those engagements, you you don't like. You know, if you go to the same post, you, mm -hmm. sure, you can only like it once. If oh, so you, this is a like. It has to yeah, be like. If that's how many times you that somebody goes and so, because if you go and you like it, you can't go back and hit the like button again. It unlikes it. Right. That's right. So, but what I'm saying is, is if does it show traffic that's in driven from something? It goes to our website, and then we, you know, the website was designed to keep them interactive between different departments and all that. Yeah. So we can track how long have we been engaged with that person. Mm -hmm. Yes, we know. We can see where they came from, where they're going from that. And then, did they tie into a local business's website or? Well, if, if there's we a can link. tell if they go, if they leave Facebook and go to our website, mm -hmm. or if they go someplace else affiliated with us. If they leave and go to. Um, Sacred Grounds. Mm -hmm. We Sacred Grounds Has sees them. them come in. We don't see that. Okay. Unless we had a link for Sacred Grounds in the post. If they came, if they leave and go to Discover Ridoso, and it's a it's a it's an article that's on our website right. about Sacred Grounds or you know about coffee places in Ridoso, right. and then they click on Sacred Grounds and then go to say yes, we yes, can track all that. But if they leave if they just yeah. were reading something about traffic and then all of a sudden decide oh let me go right. see sacred grounds you know mm -hmm. no. so, like yeah. for the skating rink you see a lot of people that liked it and then it, they're friends so it shows up and you just read it and you can open it but you don't like it so does that track yeah we, okay. if, as long as they click on our post we and open it up and you read about it yeah we get them and then you don't have to like it mm -mm, you don't have to like it if you click on it and read about it, we, we get them Okay, that's me. I don't like anything, but I read about it. <laughs> and if you hate it, we know that too. Yeah. And that's when you can see uh, maybe people post. Yeah. And is that when sometimes, you know, I'll look at it and let's just say it's a negative, you know, well, let me, and then I'll see somebody come on and say, blah, blah, blah. Is that you? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. Mm -hmm. Because I'm like, negative. come on, Carrie, come on, Carrie. When it's negative. It's really hard not to get on there and say. Well, but <laughs> at least, no, at least we're putting them in the we're right direction. Yeah. We we're may responding. not change their mind, mm -hmm. but at least to, to other readers, mm -hmm. they can use their common sense to say, oh, yeah, that sounds yes. good. That's what I'm looking for. And, that's, and we don't, there's a lot of stuff that we don't respond to because it's. Non-respondable. Right. <laughs> right, but if there's stuff that we can, in a simple response, correct something that's very erroneous, exactly, or point them in the right direction. Exactly, we do, and and we we um, monitor it a lot to also to keep people from, you know, like if we need to hide a comment or block or anything like that, because that gets that gets out of hand as well. Yep. Why would you block it? Like if they're just if they're, talking bad language? Yes, and if they're if they're um, perpetual bad actors, because we have we have several of those, and we don't we don't block people very often, and that's the only reason. And we say it very clearly in our rules that, um, and we know, and and we know 
I mean, we know who they are, and it's only if they do it over and over and if they threaten. Like we've had to, we've had to block some people because they've threatened other users, oh. or they've threatened people. <laughs> Or if they post something about Forex trading through Mr. Miyagi's plan, you know, then those get blocked. So, okay. But if they just use bad language and stuff, we just delete the comment. Yeah. Okay, anything else on that stuff? Um, and then the last thing is just the PIO duties, uh, goal 2.1 A and B, again, tying back to residents are well-educated and informed. Timely dis distribution of VOR-related information to residents and local and regional media. And um, back when I first started with the village, I was the only PIO. And then we added Kelly about five years ago working with me. And then um, now y'all also have a third PIO coming on board, Mira, sitting back there. Mm -hmm. And um, that is, um, so, you know, just more more help um, for you guys whenever there's anything going on and so just getting information about the municipality out but then also in the event of emergencies or anything working with Chief Thetford, um, Chief Chavez and um, being on scene whenever there's anything major. Right. And that's the end of our 500 tactical plan action items <laughs> that we promise we will tear down. Oh, well, Carrie, I have a just brought on by your talk about the VOR website and uh -huh. the position as a VOR news, and also your last segment there with the timely distribution of VOR related information to uh -huh. residents. I don't know if it's been looked at. You might have might have thought of it, but uh, the thought arose that possibly on your VOR website, and mm -hmm. this is also tie in with Tim with the radio station to uh, stream to have a link for the rep for the. Um, website but stream also the radio station because that would also be an outlet for uh, tourism mm -hmm. related uh, information and also for news if it ever needed to be uh, people there in Dallas might say there's a fire in Oedos mm -hmm. or something tune into the news and also to develop a, a widget for for the uh, news I mean for the radio station where people could download that you could have the link to download that widget and people that don't carry a radio around could mm -hmm. tune in on their phone. And right now we have all of the, the programs are available after they're done. Um, I don't know what the capabilities are for um, what it would take to stream them live, but we try to get them up within 24 hours. Um, Greg sends them to us and we post them so they're available but not, you know, no, live. instantaneously. So we could, I could work with um, Tim. Well, see. I know that uh, Tim Tim Rees, when he left there, went with KRUI, mm -hmm. that they stream. They also have a right. uh, an app, and they live stream. Mayor, Mayor um, you know, I, I live stream using a Simply Radio, and you know, I can anywhere I'm at, I could pull up uh, KRUI. You no, know, we do that all the time. But I like the idea. That if you're on Facebook, you could hit the link and yeah. it would take you to the. To the you go to uh, KRUI Road also, and, and there's about three or four of them. You have to hit the right one, and you can listen for free. Otherwise, you have to subscribe to a streaming service. Yeah, I, I wonder if there's a, an actual app that we could get that we could post on our website. Like Do you have an IT person questions? that could check that out for us? <laughs> <laughs> we can just use a direct link. I believe there is a link on our website. There's a page for the radio station, and you can click on the link, and you can. Pull up the radio. I listen. That's how yeah. I listen. Yeah, See, that's how I, I, listen I think too. it's important that we get that out to people that they don't have to listen to it on a radio. You know, because anytime I'm, when I was back east in this, I, I listened to it all the time. I listened to you all the time. Mm -hmm. I did. And I think so riveting. I, I so think there's your listener. Yeah, I, I thought I'd lost my audience. And there she was. She just went out of town. To make sure we're not going to say anything about her. Yeah. I just think that it's really important that they know mm -hmm. that they could, I mean, they can sit there but and I listen like to it on the Joe's phone. Joe's idea, if they're perusing Facebook yeah. and you had a link on there that would take you to that, that would be a slick little and move. There mm -hmm. is Because I have the little button, it, but but it's better quality on your phone. Totally, way better, yeah. Too. But 
and we can and we can add it to the the app. But but that's what I'm saying. See, I've got it where it comes up when I just hit my and I go directly to it. Yep. But if somebody's just perusing like people do Facebook, they sit there wherever and it's constantly like this. And if something came up about you know whatever that they could click that and switch over to the music. So I believe Carrie does pretty regular um, things on. Uh, Monday morning with the mayor and updates, and you can just put the link in the yeah, the body do. of the or Facebook the title of the email. We I do. mean the title of the Facebook. We post. do posts about every radio show on mm -hmm. Facebook. But do we have a link that they can just tap it off Facebook and it'll take us to the radio show the right. station? Live listening. To live listening. That's what I was asking. Is we can put it on there. Yeah. See if we could do that because. Yeah. Uh, but you're great. right. A lot of people, they just listen to A&M, AM and they're like, well, you know, I forget. But they always got their phone in their hand. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll get that added today. They think they have and to you listen. you can multitask then because you can go back and forth. Mm -hmm. So what percentage are going to increase of people listening to Monday morning? Well, I can tell you that the majority <laughs> of them, I think, are, are switching to online because they'll comment about something in a text that we talked about five minutes before. Mm-hmm. So I know there's a delay. A hundred percent increase. We'll get to five listeners. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, award winning. Award winning. I'm gonna be getting an Emmy yeah, or whatever did, did for this. Did you print that award up yet? Yeah, I'm working okay. on it right now in my shop. It is, it, but it is so good. I mean, you know, you talk about people that, you know, you don't, we don't <clears throat> ever communicate with them. I mean, if you just go on to that radio station and it tells you everything that the village is doing. Every week. And we have people, I run into people that say they listen to us on the radio. I wondered what you look like. <laughs> they say that all the time. Mary, I wondered what you look like. Now that you know, um, the counselor brought up that issue about public outreach, and I may have stepped out because I was getting snacks for everybody, including myself, but um, um, the newsletter, I don't see it mentioned in here as, as any other, uh, one of the strategies and, and whatnot. Did we mention it? No, because, again, I was told to just update progress. Okay. So we, I was told so we, Well, that's part of the progress. Right. So that, that's part of the progress, so we need to, you know, have that in here. But, you know, I, I think it's working great, and uh, we need to identify it. And if there's other opportunities, you know, but uh, just the public public that's outreach, good. I think we've done an excellent job with the newsletter that's and true. the radio. They love the newsletter. Uh, they do. Uh, I, Except for that picture on the front page. Do you, I'm working on that. Do you see room for improvement in that area? or What, on the picture? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, the, the there's lots of room for radio. Hey, you know what? You can demonstrate the new mask. Yeah, I've done that before. <laughs> the, the newsletter, or how we can, you know, continue to uh, improve on public outreach. Okay. I, I just think we're doing such a good job with that. I really do. I have... I carry around the newsletter, and if I hear something negative, I do this. It's, it's this, right? See that? Did you read that? Well, Carrie, that was a question. Do you, do you see any room for improvement on those areas on how we can improve in public, public outreach? No, I mean, your, your staff has been great at getting, getting information to me for newsletter stuff. So that has been very, very, very good um, back and forth. And, and I agree with that, that, that the information that team tourism and the directors are putting out is excellent. It's just that the listeners or the people that are wanting to be informed will pay attention to what's going there. Because I commend team tourism. I mean, even though it started last year, you said last night that uh, lodger's tax was increased by 18%. Mm -hmm. That comes all from the agency and, and the advertising that we elected to, you know, get pushed through. And and I've seen some of those commercials, and they're really, really nice. And it is looking inviting for a lot of people. Of course, a lot of it, too, is word of mouth. Hey, let's go up to Redoso. Oh, where's that at? Oh, we'll show you. And that's how they show up. Because that's the same thing with my nephews and nieces in Tyler, Texas. They bring their friends here, and then they start coming. So so I commend you, Carrie. You did an excellent job, as well as your presentation. Sorry I didn't get you earlier, but Rodney keeps complaining that he's always the last one. 
And the money's all gone. And the money's all gone before anything happens. It doesn't matter. He's never afraid to ask for money, even when it's all gone. But, but thank you for combining all those under the social media stuff to go into that. So. Yep. So one of the things that we've asked from the tourism director is to reach out to all the lodgers that are the ones that collect this tax. And so what information that she gathers, she'll be able to tune in to these different things here. And, um, you know, that's where we let them know about, I would like to be able to maybe talk, have some sort of POP, or that's what we used to call it, uh, uh, yeah. something that you put in the hotel rooms, the lodgers rooms, that talks about the things that you just talked about with the radio station, what to do in emergencies, where to tune, all those kind of things. Don't feed the animals. Ma Marion, just, um, you know, with this group here, you know, we are going to be working with Elizabeth. We have some, some drafted goals and objectives, 30-day goals and objectives, and goals and objectives. Um, you know, to be accomplished or measured by July 1. So um, we will be sharing um, those <coughs> overall goals with you as well and bringing those back just so that everybody's aware of, of, you know, what we agree on and what we're, how we're proceeding forward with that uh, tourism director position. And part of that is, you know, the, the uh, outreach to lodgers and businesses and whatnot that she'll be visiting and then, you know, different... Um, efforts of engaging some of the state agencies as well. Well, I like to be able to maximize our con conventions that come in, and you talked a little bit about that. When, when we find out they're booked, then maybe we can get uh, a list of people that are coming and reach out to them with a little care packet or some information through the email, yep. and then be able to set up like they did fam trips, you know, the, the individual that's engaged in the continuing ad or the whatever, but th this might be an opportunity for your spouse to come. And a lot of people, they're like, well, how am I going to sit in the hotel room all day? So I'll just stay home. Or the adventurous ones, if they know somebody else in the group, they'll say come, and then they have their own little spa day. They have their whatever. So that's one of the things that you talked about. But we should be able to get that information early so they plan it into their trip. So you have to coordinate with the convention center on getting all that. We have a wealth of information, I think, that's there. We just need to make sure that we funnel it into this uh, this machine that you've built so. probably including the chamber in that because they yeah. I don't know if they still do they used to do welcome packets for, for all kinds of events yeah, those bags. yeah the bags and for example we've got 400 plus rooms getting ready to be rented out or more for the Republican convention February the last weekend. 4 24 25 26 something like that so it would be nice to reach out to those people now so that they know there's other things to do besides get in there and mm -hmm. get screaming and lose their you know, the blood pressure and all that stuff, that they could go do something else and then that they could see our community and use this as a chance to advertise the amenities. And that's something that you talked about that I really do right. like. And, and a lot of that's going to come from the lodgers, the information that you gather, what you can see, and how do you tie it into the plan. Yeah, and the planners love it. So if we prepare something and we send it to them, they can send it on to their uh, yeah. attendees. Looks like they're doing a great job. And the, and the great thing about the convention part is most of these associations, whether it be a medical association, ranchers, any of those associations, they're in the, our shoulder season. So it's spring and fall. So the, our summer times and, and winter, they're not, they're not doing their events then. Nope. So that's why I keep looking at those medical associations and those smaller groups to come in because that's when their meetings are annually. So it'd be just a, a plus for us. Yeah. Like the hay producers, cotton producers are yep. scheduled to come in. We just scheduled Texas Tech Health Science Centers, but they're small, these groups, and they stay just the Elegante. They, don't, they haven't received enough, you know, because they bring their interns and all of this stuff up here with their families. And yep. so, but it's and if you not do that, you're right, though. If you do it early, it's bring your spouse, your spouse. These are all the things. And your sometimes kids. The, the organizers themselves. If you send them a package and say, we'll do a spouse's day for you, here's the, the offerings for the spouse's day, they'll, sign, they'll do all the work. All we have to do is give them the opportunity to make the reservations and do all that. And, and really, it's not hard for us because we know what we're selling already. So it's just a no-brainer. Yeah, and then tie it in with way. RMA, so let her do the work down there, yeah. lining up the businesses that these people can then, you can set them up jewelry stores, paintings, whatever. Yeah. Art galleries. Okay. I mean, it's already happening, like the love thing, you know, the mm -hmm. 10 places. They're already doing the work locally, so it's not hard for us to say, okay, 
how can we use this to bring more people in and keep them here for an, another day? So. Yep, I got you. All right, thank you. Great job, Carrie. Yeah, thank, hey, thank you, you very Carrie. much. Great, great job, Elizabeth. Oh. We're going to work I, you I in. Support, <laughs> I'm here to support the team. <laughs> they did a fabulous job because last year, if you look at how they pivoted, I've been looking at everything, and you had to pivot in your marketing how you approached the audience. And I, kudos to you all. I think they did a phenomenal job in, in their messaging and getting people here because people wanted out, and they definitely made it known that we were here and to come. So yeah, uh, a big applause to uh, Carrie and her team. Thank you. And your team. Yeah. Now you're you know, part of the team. Now. Now. Hey. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What's next? I believe uh, getting back to the agenda, Mayor, the uh, next person up would be Anthony. Or oh, Rodney. No, that well, lunch, lunch kid day. here. Let me ask that. What is lunch kid? Yeah, we'll take after our lunch break, Rodney. You'll be up. <laughs> so you get lunch at least. You have, okay. you have, uh, to get Parks and Rec. Okay. Yeah, if we could hit Rodney next, Mayor. Okay, giddy up. Yep. He's, been, he's only been sitting there for two and a half hours. I was wondering what he was doing. He was falling asleep a little earlier. <laughs> it's called the siesta in the morning. Still, good morning, Mayor and Councilors. So, the purpose statement for the Parks and Recreation Department is the Parks and Recreation Department elevates the quality of our community by providing programs, facilities, events, and opportunities for locals and visitors who live and play in nature's playground. Did you write that? I'm not sure. <laughs> I like that. You, you did a great job. That <laughs> Would you like to add anything to that? No, that sounds it's great. It's poetic. Great. Well, and, and I, you know, reading the villages earlier, I, I'd like to, uh, in, I believe in the villages, it said innovative, and I'd like to think that we fit into that, under that as well. Mm, I think you uh, do. We try to be creative and innovative for a, a small department. Um, so you then. add that to, <laughs> to your statement then? When I first read this, I mean, you're on it is. But if you say anything specific, you know, uh, descriptive, which right. you don't, <clears throat> but you could certainly add by providing innovative programs, facilities, events, and so forth, and it kind of puts a different ring to it. I think you need to blow your horn a little more. Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> he's going to be coming hard and heavy for money here Yeah, shortly. there goes his budget. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> Councilor, I'll put I'll add, I'll add innovative. I actually like that as well. Um, the next item is the uh, organization chart, and there's a couple different pages. Uh, the first pages covers the majority or all of the full-time employees under the Parks and Recreation Department. Um, I believe currently we only have one vacancy out of all of the positions, um, and that is a park maintenance worker. Um, we actually, that position is uh, open and we have a couple of applicants that we're planning on interviewing this week. Um, I did not add additional positions. Um, we have, uh, over the last well, year, uh, since we're covering the mm -hmm. last year, we've been able to, able to cover the uh, numerous programs we offer uh, with our existing staff as well as with cooperation from other departments. And so a lot of our events that happen on the weekends, we're utilizing assistance from numerous departments in the village to help us manage those, um, whether it's the drone show or parking at the lake, or um, we use a lot of other uh, full-time staff to help us with those positions. Um, another area where we're looking at expanding that um, uh, kind of philosophy is working with the convention center. Um, the, the event that the mayor mentioned coming up, the Republican convention, that is going to take a lot of um, time up above and beyond of the existing convention center staff. So our staff is going to actually cooperate with them and help 
uh, turnover of rooms and that type of stuff. So not only do we utilize other staff to help us with our events, but we're also going to be working with the convention center to help them with their events as well. Um, again, I didn't add positions. Um, if that is something that would be considered during the budget process, I think we're at a point of growth that that is something that we could, I mean, we could use additional staff. Um, we, and, you know, while we're reviewing the progress we made in the last year, um, although the, it was a COVID year, we still had a ton of activity going on. Um, and so uh, if we things go back to normal and we look at continuing to expand, not only upon what we offered, but uh, continuing to develop the music series and events at the convention center, more <clears throat> events in the park, I think that's something that's going to have to be what type of positions would you be looking for um, so, I mean general or specific um, I think it would be beneficial to have another park maintenance worker so our park maintenance workers not only uh, maintain uh, all of our facilities uh, with the regular routine maintenance of uh, the mowing weed eating cleaning restrooms uh, but we also chip in with building maintenance here in the Village Hall. I'm sure you've seen our staff here quite a bit. Um, but they also are our special event personnel. So they work a 40-hour week uh, performing all their, their maintenance and operating duties. And then they also perform as special events, filling in whether it's tournaments, again, aiding with events of, of cleaning restrooms, keeping up with litter, traffic control. Um, and so, I mean, the, we've really uh, changed over the years where we were really uh, uh, heavily busy during the summer. Now we're busy year-round um, with the number of events going Mayor, on. Mayor, on the, on the staffing issues, what I've asked the directors to do is make note of what their requests are, and then we'll look at staffing as, as a whole and then make recommendations on, on how we would handle that during budget. Okay. Because yeah, I worry sometimes about the, you know, the work that your your department does. And, well, and it's all across the board, but, you know, to get, I worry that they're going to get um, burnout. burnout and that, you know, that they don't get to be with their families very much because they're always working. I, I worry about that. You know, we one thing that helps is we're fortunate that we don't have a lot of vacancies. So the, you know, the, when you don't have vacancies, you have more people to cover those shifts. Plus, it's been very helpful with other departments, uh, uh, willing to fill in as well. Um, but, but when they fill in, they they're also working right. more well, hours but as well. This is village wide. I mean, you guys went down there and worked and. Tim went down there on uh, Christmas Eve and, and Rodney, Ron and, yeah, I know. and all those guys. It's just, uh, you know, nothing's cushy around here. But one of the things that I've been asking lately, and, I, and I've talked with Tim about it, is how much overtime are we spending to fill in because we don't have either the positions filled or people are on vacation or people are sick, and that can be a number to help justify additional additional positions instead of paying out all this overtime for that because you're saying your guys are working 40 hours and then going and doing all the rest of that stuff too so when we look at it is how much overtime is being paid and will that help um, to justify adding another position yeah so yeah. mayor, mayor and, and counselor you know again we're gonna um, collect that data mm -hmm. and right now we've changed the parameters on how we're uh, tracking some of the you know leave time and COVID and whatnot so we'll, we'll uh, be taking a look at that and providing recommendations and when we look at, at that we also look at you know we understand that we got a limited workforce here in Rio Doso so um, uh, oftentimes a lot of our employees are looking for second jobs or employment or to you know capitalize and make a little bit of opportunity to make additional money so um, we, we take a look at all those type of things and try to make the best recommendation that we can to you all because i know you know when you get through with your master plans a lot of this i think is going to have unique positions and one that i'm thinking about is when the the wingfield master plan finally gets done you know there's been the 
talk of a community theater, a stage, whatever. And I know you got somebody back there that has experience in theater and stuff like that. That you know that you're really focusing on the employees that you have and maybe other talents experiences that they have when you're looking at, at those things because it's much fun, better uh, product that we get, work product when people really have a, a devotion for what they do or a drive for that. But, you know, I didn't know if it was just regular personnel because you do work a lot with the, the Midtown area and then your guys uh, double duty a lot. But I was just thinking about all the other things that we're doing in expansions that if you keep that in the back of your mind that you have, might have people already that could... Uh, Even the magistrate court. Mm -hmm. You know, as we open that our, with our lease agreement, we're going to be providing the maintenance and uh, janitorial services for that, and that's built right. into our contract. Mm -hmm. right. To the, the fee. Yeah. So we, we need to take a look at all those things. Mm -hmm. those needs. So we'll be making recommendations and collecting that data. So, Rodney, a question on your org chart. So you said um, there's one vacancy for a maintenance worker. <coughs> Yes. Is that in addition to everything you've got listed here, or is one of those positions mm -hmm. now vacant? Actually, one of those positions is now vacant. Um, they re just recently left within the last uh, few weeks. Okay, okay. And, and then the other thing I noticed that I wanted to ask you about is under event and recreation, and then under community center, you have Javi mm -hmm. listed twice. Does he split his time between the two? Yes, he okay. does split his time. And, I mean, that, that's even a position that has been, uh, as Anthony increases his activity and we increase our activity, it's challenging to split his time. But, I mean, we've been able to manage up to this point. But, again, as we continue to grow and add programming, um, that's another one area that we would might consider, uh, you know, like getting Anthony a, a, a full-time position and not splitting it. But uh, I'm sure Anthony will be able to um, elaborate more on that as he goes through his plan. Well, I always know that Parks and Rec is always in need of help in all facets. And, and back when uh, we were making, and by the way, Rodney, your mission statement is excellent. I'd leave it alone, keep it there. Um, but back then, you know, our mission statement was we serve from creation to cremation. <laughs> Because, you know, we had infant uh, swim classes all the way to burying cremations at the cemetery. Um, but, but again, I, I see that, and that's always been a, a, a item for the Parks Department. Because in most cities, while it is in all cities, all municipalities, uh, the first budgets to be cut are Parks and Rec. Yep. libraries, uh, you know, the cultural arts stuff and things like that. But now we're finally uh, making headway. Mayor, thank you, so that we can provide a lot of these recreation opportunities. Because I'm just looking over the acreages that we added for maintenance. Even the, the vacant oh, yeah. properties we have now, we still got to uh, maintain them until they're developed. Because I get the calls, I'm sure you get them. It says, well, I'm not going to mow my yard until you clean up your yard, you know, that type of stuff. So that's where I harp on Rodney, can you get there? And he says, I need help. So so I appreciate that. I think, too, the uh, park maintenance at White Mountain has taken on a whole new reflection. It isn't often three years ago that I would see a front-end loader trying to scrape of what's left of the horse off the uh, ballpark and also out of the soccer fields. Yeah. And it's an ongoing process. I mean, we, we don't need any more manure on that field, but uh, it's there. And it is, I guess, on the upside, it's easier to walk about the elk than it is the horse, mm -hmm. but they are grass-fed, and I'll tell you, there's plenty of it. Right. And I was told by, um, what's the, the financial guy, Clint? That there's discussions, has been about the fence, but then they've dropped them because they're waiting for us to finish our master plan. Yeah. And so once we get into that, there's talk of fencing. That is an item that will be addressed in the master plan is not only the, the horses, but the wildlife as well. And then we will be communicating with them so they can put it on their board? <coughs> yes. The board. Um, so uh, speaking of that, uh, we did have a meeting, uh, and now it's been going on two months. Um, we had both our planner and their 
planner uh, in the same meeting, uh, coordinating that way our master plan would coincide <coughs> and have the same information as their five-year facilities master plan. Yeah, because his statement was to me, we don't know what to do about it. And it's like, well, that's what these, they should give you options. Yes. And then I thought we had come to an agreement that we were going to do something, but he said no. So, okay. Well, and that is so important because there's no sense in us having these beautiful fields when not only with the leftovers, uh, like Gary said, but, you know, the hooves, you know, that's very dangerous for the kids. They could... Uh, you know, hurt their ankles, their knees. So, you know, the sooner the better on that because it's not going to get any better. Mm. We're seeing more and more not only of the elk, very little deer. I mean, the deer looks minute compared to everything else now, but the horses, um, it's just, it's, it's, it's getting ridiculous. So yeah. we're going to have to do something. Well, uh, while we're on the subject there, when I was listening to the radio station that Tim did an excellent job filling in for Monday with the mayor, is that <clears throat> Mr. Cook came on and he talked about the horses and the elk and the yep. rise in the population and also the damage that they're causing and the effect that will obviously um, come about uh, due to population increase in the next few years. He's, he stated that there's definitely going to have to be something done, say, 10 years from now, maybe possibly sooner. But I think that we ought to try to look ahead and mitigate early, as soon as we can. So uh, Mr. Kirk came talking with him earlier today. He said that he was at a certain place where he was in charge of the horse removal or horse mitigation, whatever the program was, and we didn't get into the details of it. But I think that uh, possibly... We, need to look into that and have them work with the Parks and Rec, have them work with whatever agencies or departments that could. Um, well, and this is nothing new. They're not going to let you remove them. Whoa, we've, Wild Horses of America, we've been dealing with this for years now, and it's getting worse. We broach subjects, conversations, and the best thing that they will do, the Wild Horses of America group, you know, the people that sue you, they uh, said that they would be advocates of the program that's going on in Montana and different parts of Arizona and uh, Nevada, that they dart them with um, uh, birth control and that they put them on a rotating cycle. And they said they would be an advocate for that and that they even have resources to pay for those. And so, but then we had to go through another department, which is no longer in charge, but still in charge, apparently, the state, um, uh, not the game and fish, but the... Um, Livestock, livestock, livestock board, board mm -hmm. that they wouldn't even touch it. They said it's all tied up in litigation. And so you just go touch one of them, you remove one of them, and then you'll know what's happening. And they've already told and threatened and all that other stuff. So we've asked who's going to clean up. Mm -hmm. So we've gotten comment and somewhat of a commitment from the Fish and Game that they would provide elk fencing. If we put it up, the school put it up, or whatever, um, eight foot fencing, six foot fencing, whatever it was. More than six feet. Is yeah, eight feet. Six. So they've talked about that. And we asked, could it be the colored, you know, that it's wrapped in the uh, rubber, the plastic, and possibly yes, that and the other. And so we tried that way back when, when we were working with the Lynx, when it was a, you used to hear it from yeah. them every day. We don't even hear from them anymore. No, that, no and I was thinking they gave up. They chase them out with oh. golf carts, and I was thinking about this last night. It's funny you brought it up because how much longer can we continue chasing them off the links, or they chase them off the links? They go right out the end gate, out onto the road here, exactly. and then we have a we have an accident. And they well, sit there. Yeah, but you have a car coming, not paying no. attention, and then all of a sudden all the elk are running out. Or the other gate on White Mountain Drive. Coming yeah. through. Well, the links are there. At least it's going to be up. So. So, yeah, but that's not going to change. We're not getting rid of the golf course. That's what I mean. Yeah. So it's not going to be their responsibility. It'll be somebody's. It's It'll be, somebody's. be a, the golf. You know, we've got other people. They haven't said they don't want the lease, and there's other people that want it, but it's not going away. Tim's going to be right there at the convention center. <laughs> uh, we'll get him a golf course. Yeah, we'll add that to his, to his duties. I do worry, too, with us, you know, ta the talk about developing Moon Mountain uh, that that's because a lot of those animals they go that that's where their house is that's where they go their house is in my front yard in the neighbors they, I, yeah they ain't leaving 
And, I and just worry about us developing Moon Mountain so much that we have even more. During the day, they come off of Moon Mountain. At night, when nobody's on Moon Mountain, they go back up. I watch them on the street yeah. all the time. The turkey come down, the horses come down, the elk come down, the deer just up here. Um, but there's it, plenty of national forest. They've moved in. Yeah. So, so if, if we, we get, feed them better, let's worry about it. If we get into discussions about elk fencing, Beth said she would be willing to help. She used to do that with the Forest Service. But there's there's inroads to that. We've been talking about this for years, yeah. and we reach out to all these different bodies. We think we have direction, and then it's. You can't touch them. And, and then the people that support Woe, because they've been sued and had to pay the feed bill for a year and a half, the vet bill for a year and a half, they, they won't touch it. And they'll tell you, hands off, we're not doing anything unless they're hit by a car. And then we call our police department or we call the sheriff's department. And so we've had that happen several times where we've had to call our solid waste to come out there and help. <clears throat> but nobody's doing anything. That's the bottom line. Right. And anybody that tries to do anything, you're <clears throat> taking all the brunt and all the responsibility. So, we got to do something. Go ahead. The second page of the org chart includes the temporary staff that we hired to support the not only the swimming pool, but the, the water park at Grindstone Lake. And um, from the past two years, it, it has been... Uh, adequate to support that that doesn't include of course the cooperation we have with the other departments these are just the temporary employees that we hire um, as lifeguards cashiers uh, lake managers pool manager and have you been able to fill because that's 32 positions between cashiers attendants and lifeguards have you been able to fill those yes we've had really good luck um, with with filling the positions okay the, the incentives helped a lot with that right the incentives uh, help, but I believe it's the type of work. Um, I Kids really enjoy those type those of jobs. Work in there. Um, and we've seen a lot of returners. Um, even when we needed a quick turnaround on hiring, uh, rehiring for eye shrink staff, right. we had a lot of them returning. I remember and so that. I think it's just been uh, the village is a good place to work. Um, uh, I think families are recognizing that, and we've just had a lot of returning employees. Mayor, um, lunch is here, so I don't, I don't know if you want to take a five-minute break for everybody to grab their lunch, and we can come back here and work through lunch. Yeah. Um, is that all right with everybody? Yes, sir. Is that all right with you, Rodney? Yes, sir. Uh, are you sure? Because uh, you don't get to You'll eat. be more than five minutes. You'll be mumbling. I'll tell you that. Well, I would just suggest that maybe we grab it and come back to, so yep. we can work. Oh. Yeah. Okay. We're working lunch, so don't clock out. <laughs> still on the clock. We're having bison burgers, so I just want to... <laughs> we, we ordered lunch for everybody, so if you guys are ready to eat, uh, the food is here. Can you eat and talk, Rodney? <laughs> yeah. Hey, Mayor, are you invited to speak at the convention to welcome everybody? Nobody said anything yet. Oh. Um, let me find out about it. folks. Oh, uh, oh, I, I, I was working on it last night and it, it, it and Boyd has said that they had basically agreed to it and dropped their lawsuits and everything and it was settled. 
Well, now they're coming up and saying that these water rights were actually taken from another water valley and put over, and it's illegal. Well, that's what we were doing. We were getting all the documentation to say, no, it not, wasn't. What they're talking about is some other rights that Hubbard did that Governor Richardson let him oh, take. Oh, that's right. Copper Mountain. That's what it is. So I said, that's got nothing. was saying, and remember I came back and I told you that, uh, like, Lincoln's side of the hill, mm -hmm. is that she was saying that we took those. No. That, okay, because I, that was... No, we didn't take no, no, those. Nothing. And so anyway, uh, I've been on, we, and we're going to have a conversation, hopefully, with uh, uh, Gary, what's his name, the lawyer? Mitchell. Mitchell. Yeah, because Trish was, the email was Richard Ford and Trish. Well, and I've been talking to Richard this morning, and we got the data, but, you know, it's just, they always go to ground zero on all this stuff. And it was publicized uh, before the end of the last year, yeah. and, and the deadline is going to be up to first, and so they just call that as what she can But this is what happens when you put it to the state, and the state sets on it three or four months before they give you the notice to... Right. So it puts us in a peculiar position of us being the strong guy that we're here just to get whipped up. No matter what we do, they're always going to have an enemy. So that's what I was telling them. Stomach thinks you. Carrie was laughing. She couldn't stop laughing. How did that process? It's. it's Interesting. I, I do like it. It's different than a hotel pre-con when you have 300 people and you go around and all do your, and it's more organized, <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's organized into 13 different departments and different well, operations. I can't believe you mentioned all these. I really can't. Like last night when I was watching that. The speech was stated in yeah. the I literally texted my dad and I was like, this is insane how many, how, what the responsibility level is. Mm -hmm. and th this is the whole state of the village. You just hit on pizza a little bit. <laughs> and it was just like, and then when you see everybody's part, what it takes, it's a lot of people mm -hmm. and a lot of planning and a lot of. And this is how we organize it. And I'm glad I'm Susan brought her electric. Big. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
But I'll take this an extra one if you have an extra one. I do. Okay. Rodney, you don't have to choke it down just yet. So. Actually, if I go while y'all are eating, there might be fewer questions. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I think that was directed my way. I'm just making sure we're getting our money's worth. But you're free to proceed anytime. Are you sure? Mm -hmm. Five different goals that we had, again, are all uh, pulled directly from the comprehensive plan. Um, all of my goals um, from the previous year are actually will be extended and changed a little bit um, for the upcoming year. Um, the strategic plan item number one um, was a parks and recreation goal number one from the comprehensive plan. It was under the community services uh, goal number one. Quality parks and recreation opportunities are available for Redoso residents and visitors. Um, and Redoso offers community service services for all of its residents and employees. And so there were several different items that were listed um, under that action item number one. Um, there was the performance of the Grindstone Lake Master Plan, uh, the White Mountain Master Plan, uh, the Wingfield Park Master Plan, and then um, for the upcoming uh, fiscal year, I would uh, rec I will be recommending funding for uh, to complete a Trails Master Plan as well as a Master Plan of the recreation aspects of the Redoso River. Um, so uh, during the past year, uh, the Grindstone Master Plan, um, we went through the uh, numerous stages. Of course, it was delayed some with the public meetings uh, previously uh, due to COVID. Uh, that, ma that master plan did go through uh, review processes um, through different uh, departments and the Parks and Recreation Commission. And uh, the council, I believe, did adopt that plan in December. So the future plans of utilizing that uh, master plan for Grindstone Lake would be utilize the recommendations um, to uh, request either funding or seek grant opportunities um, utilizing that master plan, and as well as utilizing the WIBIT revenue. Um, so my plan is um, in the next meeting of the Parks and Recreation Commission, again, approach them with some of the recommend recommended projects out of that plan and get their support for uh, their recommendation to which projects to pursue. Um, the White Mountain Master Plan, again, that, that uh, process, um, uh, that master plan was undertaken in the last year. It's still ongoing. We're nearing uh, the final phases of the White Mountain Master Plan. Again, it did. Um, we undertook uh, public um, uh, pub opportunities for the public to provide input as well as a steering committee of uh, different interested parties including various youth sports, the Redoso schools as well as uh, Village of Redoso employees. Um, Again, I mentioned earlier that uh, we did have a meeting uh, two months ago with the Redoso School Board with uh, Groundwork Studios, who is our planner, as well as their uh, planner uh, to review the final versions. Um, notes from that meeting were um, taken by Groundwork Studios, and which will be incorporated into the, um, the final conceptual map as well as the master plan. 
Um, we are expecting a draft version uh, of that plan any day now. Um, that way we can submit to our, uh, again, to Village of Redoso Department Directors uh, for review or to the various committees such as the Parks and Rec Commission as well as a Watershed Committee. And uh, upon the completion of that or after that is submitted to the governing body for review and adoption, we will utilize the information that comes out of that to approach you again with uh, recommendations on moving forward uh, with development of that uh, master plan. The completion of that should be within um, the next two months. We should, we should have that uh, final report uh, presented to the governing body. The third uh, master plan that was uh, undertaken during this last year was the Wingfield, Mark, uh, Wingfield Park Master Plan. Again, that was funded, uh, went through the same um, process of uh, tasking a, a steering committee with participating in that. The steering committee did include uh, area uh, homeowners as well as businesses. Um, information was taken and we went door to door, put uh, door, um, door hangers <coughs> on each door on uh, two occasions, updating people with not only about the upcoming master plan, but also updating them about the progress made and um, including information on the village website where, where they could uh, review uh, the progress. Um, we did receive the draft version of the complete master plan inclu including the conceptual map. Um, last week we did re uh, review that uh, master plan, the draft of that master plan with uh, department directors. Um, I noted um, I think seven individual items that were uh, of importance uh, that included the closing of the center street and the recommendation of parking garages, the watershed aspects, um, on street parking. Um, we again we addressed those in a development review meeting and took notes. Uh, we took individual. Um, what are the the. The, sh the sheets called the checklist. the checklist from each department director to note their concerns for each one of those items. Those will also be submitted to the planner um, to incorporate into that master plan. Another item that I didn't mention was the consideration of the impact on traffic, not only um, of the direct impact to the closure of Center Street to Wingfield and Grindstone. Uh, but there will also be some recommendations on further expanding that in the case that we look at closing that street to include uh, all of the neighborhoods that will also be impacted, not only the, the immediately adjacent roads, but the ones that are a little further up from Springs as well. So um, I've, I'm working on compiling the notes uh, from that director's meeting. I will submit them to the... Uh, planner and hopefully within the next week and then um, again when they incorporate those notes from the directors meetings um, we will uh, the groundwork studios will present that to the governing body for review and possible adoption once that plan has been uh, adopted by the governing body again uh, as a parks director, I will uh, approach the governing body with recommendations based upon the master plan on looking at uh, plans for development of that area. Um, I believe that's one of the areas that we've also uh, submitted for uh, funding possibilities with the state as well to help fund that. The master plan will also include some um, information on uh, funding opportunities um, that are out there, whether it's grants, local funding, uh, bonds, that sort of information. Um, again, next year, uh, my uh, for action or strategic plan item number one, um, I will like would like to request funding and possible task order for a trails master plan and a Redoso uh, River master plan. Um, and depending on the the type of action taken. 
um, the resources needed um, immediately for those two plans. It would it's roughly about a hundred thousand dollars to complete the the Redoso River Master Plan and the and the Trails Master Plan. But then again, depending on what the governing body decides to do with the information from the Wingfield Park Master Plan, the White Mountain Master Plan, um, that number that's listed, the resources needed, five hundred thousand. I mean, that could be up to the five million or even. 10, 15, 20 million, because uh, the full development of, I believe, Wingfield Park alone is the full complete development, including parking garages, is $20 million at this point, um, the numbers that they have submitted with that draft. So in the uh, Rose River Master Plan, are you working in conjunction with Eric Boyda on the fish habitat tree and all that? Yes, um, I don't have the task item uh, specifically listed for the that master plan, um, but it does include uh, the recreation aspects, the watershed aspects, um, as you know, as well as working with either possibly working with landowners or acquiring <coughs> property that would provide additional public access. So that was my question: what what area are we talking about? So it would encompass the entire. Redoso River from one end really? of the village That's limits to the other. Down, yes. Wow. And so it, it would be a plan of the, that entire river and look at opportunities that we have uh, in that area. So another uh, couple items, and this is something that I wanted to note earlier during the tourism plan is um, a, a lot of like our strategic plan items of the five items the way we started at the beginning of the year and the way we finished at the end of the year, it changed quite a bit. Not only with COVID, but we had different direction throughout the year. And a couple items that I would like to address during this is was some conceptual plans that we completed. So we did uh, we did have or we funded in, in from our department a conceptual plan of the Alto Lake area for looking at additional. Um, recreation possibilities. As you all are aware, we did receive the official designation from the Department of Game and Fish um, to designate the duck pond as a, as a, a kids pond. Um, that will go into effect April 1st of this year. Um, also during, uh, actually it started during the previous fiscal year, um, we did request funding for some of those improvements for that conceptual plan. We have added um, stairs um, from the lake's edge down to the water's edge. Uh, and we did add the dock at the bottom of those stairs. Um, we have received uh, the permitting to add the pedestrian bridge, which uh, provides pedestrian access from the property we bought, the old post office. Um, we'll provide them access across the, um, the diversion channel. Um, we're currently waiting on the delivery of that bridge. The uh, delivery time, I believe, was 15 to 16 weeks, which puts us around um, mid-March for the delivery of that bridge. Um, we will be working with the eco-servants in the next several weeks uh, to construct a, a pedestrian trail around that pond. Um, we are currently, or we have ordered a signage that not only include the rules and regulations from the Department of Game and Fish, but it'll also reflect our uh, local ordinances regarding, regarding fishing. And then we're also going to include um, some informational uh, uh, language or interpretive signs regarding watershed and um, like uh, aquatic uh, animals and that type of information, just educational for the kids. Um, we've also, uh, during the last year, uh, funded a uh, not only a conceptual uh, plan for Moon Mountain, uh, but we just recently, um, the governing body approved funding for the feasibility of those items that were identified in that conceptual plan. Some of those items include um, uh, a lift to the area, uh, downhill trails, an additional uh, possibility of a mountain coaster, uh, mountain slides, um, uh, tubing areas, 
uh, additional pedestrian, pedestrian and hiking trails, uh, possible retail space at the on the at the end of the lift at the top of the mountain, and so uh, the feasibility study is going to include um, you know uh, cost estimates and again the feasibility of actually completing those types of projects. Um, we just had a, uh, or actually we had a pre-meeting to talk about a kickoff meeting, which will be scheduled in the next couple weeks uh, to kick off that feasibility study. Again, once that plan is completed, we'll utilize the information again to approach the governing body uh, to uh, look for um, recommendations on how to proceed with that development. We'll also have that information available for either public-private public partnerships or um, utilize it for grant applications. Rodney, those, those con conceptual ideas for Moon Mountain, yes. are those allowed within the lease of Moon Mountain? The, so that, that was part of the, the, the direct answer to that is no, they are not permitted. But before we um, took on that process, I did contact the state land office and they're open, um, my communication with them was they're open to that type of activity. When we get to that point, it would just take a renegot uh, renegotiation of, their, of that lease. Hard to more money for the lease. Probably. Well, it, it, and it's a different, different uh, uh, administration of that office where before it was like, no, it needs to stay just the way it is. So, um, so I was just wondering. Yes, they, they again, they were open to it. Um, matter of fact, we talked about, um, originally it was brought up, and I believe it was by the mayor, like a spider mountain, which is in Texas, a kind of downhill. Um, and so we, I did mention that to the state land office, and again, they're, they're very open. Again, it would create additional revenue for their department as well. Uh, it would just take a renegotiation of the lease. Okay, great, thank you. Mayor, Mayor um, may I interject just for a minute because I, I want to kind of set the frame for a lot of what Rodney's presenting. I've asked Eric and, and Karen to come in and sit in. Come on up front, Karen. Um, you know, Rod, Rodney's coming to us and he, you know, he's asking for steps, and I think that's been kind of the practice to, to come in and, and look at. Let's fund a feasibility study. Let's do, um, you know, certain steps along the way. But, um, you know, the reason I've asked Eric and Karen to come in is I know Eric, um, I sent him information as the governor's summit was happening a couple of weeks ago. And, and um, you know, right now, you know, what, what uh, we're hearing from the state is there's one-time opportunities out there. You know, we, we've really beefed up the capital projects department, and we need to consider, consider how we're going to beef that department up. But when we look at a lot of, of uh, you know, what Rodney's proposing, those are projects that are going to take one-time fundings coming in and, and grant opportunities and, and whatnot that we have to take advantage of. I, I think we need to, to really uh, take a hard look at how we're going to speed those projects up to get them shovel-ready, a lot of the projects. Um, you know, from, from my perspective, what I see uh, coming down and, and, and as you see the, the legislative session developing, is these departments are the ones that are the, the internal departments from the state are the ones that are getting grant programs or funds going to those different agencies to be funded. And it's just like Rodney was talking about uh, coming up with some conceptual plans or whatnot for the uh, Rio Rudoso and you know how are we going to do this watershed. Well, there's a, a department that's just being funded that Mike Hammond or whatever, I think his name's Mike, um, that they put in place to oversee. And during the the state of the village or state of the state or the, the governor's summit, um, Mike talked about the Rio Doso project that they did up here before with the, with the watershed, and they're going to be putting a lot more money into that program. You know, other, other communities are not at the same level of planning as we are, and we need to continue to move those projects forward because, um, you know, that's where the opportunities are going to be. When we look at, at, at um, and I, I kind of saw your reaction, Councilor, when you said $20 million of development for, for uh, Wingfield. Well, if you start to break that down, for instance, the parking garage, you know, the, the parking garage is, is, a, a, is a community facility that may be funded by USDA. And what, what, what my recommendation is, is that we need to move these projects forward 
or identify how many projects that we can move forward as quickly as possible to shovel ready within this department and then go out and make pitches to um, the economic development department has a process called um, fund it and it, it's a, a process where they bring uh, 20 of the agencies from up from the state to federal agencies all to the same table and they allow communities or <coughs> or private developments to come in and you make a pitch to them and say this is our development plan and I was <coughs> successful at that I was one of the first uh, managers to take a community through that process back uh, when Donnie Quintana was at, with economic development and I was with Santa Rosa we put together what we called moving Santa Rosa forward and at that time it was like a, a 16 million dollar project Ron remembers of, of several different projects that we had and at that time it was like 16 million was was a lot well today people are talking about 50 to 100 million dollars worth of projects and you know even with the legislative request that we put in they keep telling us you should be putting in more what I see happening is they're going to come out with, with the pork, you know, the, the capital outlay that's going to go directly to communities, but then there's going to be a lot of other money that's distributed to the state agencies, and we need to be prepared to go and approach those state <coughs> agencies, go into this process with several of these uh, projects and be able to make a pitch to these agencies and say, this is our proposal, and we may have a USDA coming in and saying, you know what, I have X amount of dollars. I can, I can help fund or, or at least put together a, a revenue bond on, on those uh, parking garages. I can, uh, another uh, agency may come in and say, you know what, I got watershed money. I'm going to put um, money towards this watershed project. Um, you know, and, and so the approach, you know, for my recommendation is we need to be thinking bigger. The community center, you know, we talked about the community center and, and taking it to the voters for a, for a bond issue, well, it's a, that's also a community facility. We're under 10,000 of population. Uh, you know, USDA with the rural development may come in and say, you know what, I got an extra 10 million. Let's do a, a revenue bond to get that community facility built. You know, so what, what I'm really saying is I think we need to think big. The, these projects, when, when Ron is proposing them and he's coming in and saying, you know, I just want to fund this little piece or whatever, I think it's too small. I think we need to align ourselves with what we see and, and, and start thinking bigger of how we're going to get these things shovel ready so that we can maximize the grant opportunity and then um, we can make sure that we're focused on looking at uh, the departments that are here to be support departments, administrative departments like uh, capital projects Thank you. so that we can properly administer those programs. Well, what are we going to do to get these near shovel ready? Like the river program, he's talking about watershed projects and all that different stuff. That so um, <coughs> the next, once we adopt the master plans, then it would be like, the, the closest one we're on is, is Winfield Park. We have the draft that includes all of the cost <coughs> estimates. Um, essentially, you could fund the engineering for all of that as soon as the, that's adopted. And what does that look like? What does engineering typically run? The, the design the design of it should be anywhere from 10 to 12 percent you know then you get into construction administration bidding and stuff then you're getting up to the 20 but to get ready for design you're probably looking at 10 getting ready for bid you're looking at probably about 10 to 12 percent on these type of projects it's a little bit different you know it depends on the type of project some of it's landscaping so you're probably six to eight so it just it just depends on the type of project so Hundred grand a, a plan. So Approximately, if, if you're look, yeah. Well, what about time frames? Th those things need, you know. And that's what I'm saying is some of these things need to be expedited, you know, and, and we need to get ready. Um, with, with the amount of money that's coming down, you know, there's different limit, um, different time frames when they have to be spent down, and a, a lot of the communities aren't going to be ready to to spend that money down. <laughs> And make the requirements so they're going to be looking for projects our, our efforts and you know we talked about this last year on the infrastructure because we saw that infrastructure coming down we started pushing to get projects ready and we're ready we're shovel ready on several infrastructure projects but now as we start to look at all these other funds coming in we need to take that same strategy and start applying that to a lot of these facilities 
And so, uh, are you still looking at a goal of fifty million, or do we want to make it a hundred million? When you when you look at, at everything that Rodney's proposing, you know I think we need a uh, right now we're on track for for a fifth, uh, forty two million dollar proposals we're putting in. Our next strategy needs to start looking at at the total amount. And when I just put a rough figure to it, it's closer to like a hundred a hundred million right. projects. So I, I just want to. Well, and, and, but here's the other the other thing is there's so much money that's coming and being given to all these states and all these communities that the back of the house, all these design firms and these engineering firms are going to start getting backed up. And, you know, depending upon how long you have to spend it, they may be setting everybody up for failure. And that, that's my point is that the majority of the communities don't have the capacity that we do. We're already ahead on a lot of different situations. And while we're still in contact with uh, yeah. Groundwork Studio and all these <clears> other, and they're already engaged as much what, like what we've done with White Sands Construction, <laughs> we just re-engage them and move forward. And just keep going. Because we haven't even started on Moon Mountain, so that's going to take a while for that conceptual plan to get that going. Well, he's already got it all conceived. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, the poster and that kind of stuff, is that... Would that be intruding on Eagle Creek? It's, and we, we were talking about that same time or before he was. And so with timing and everything put over there, but it's another amenity. And if you spend much time over there when it's busy, it's, it's a long line. <coughs> Looking at what other amenities do we want? Mary, j just to kind of, uh, you know, we had a, a, a meeting um, yesterday morning with the racetrack and, uh -huh. you know, the Downs and Lincoln County and, the hospital, the university, and, you know, Ira brings up a good point. You know, when, when you start to look at developments, then how do you make sure that the other services are, are going to be fulfilled? You know, your, your police, your fire, your ambulance, all these other type of things. The, the, the beauty behind uh, municipal government is the way that our taxing authority is set up is that the more business activity that you have going on, the more gross receipts tax comes back. So if we take, if we take that, that, um, profit that, you know, revenue that we have coming in and we invested in projects that are going to bring a return on the investment and create additional activity, then you start to increase that general fund dollar so that the general services that we're talking about can be funded. And, you know, it, it's it's an automatic <laughs> funding stream and strategy. So where our investment needs to be is where we're going to get a return on our investment. So, you know, I, I just, they use, you can build a road once. Yep. You build an amenity like this that pays GRT from now on. Right. Yep. <clears throat> and so. diversification is the other thing. Then we're not relying like we were in the past, relying on one or two yeah. major attractions to the town. Now we're diversifying out so that if we have a lean winter, we've got other things that people can do. Yeah, because, I mean, I mean to me, I worry about the water. I mean, that's a lot of water to get in Snow there. I mean, look at it. I mean, it, it's, uh, you're not going to have a lot of snow um, on these Well, shores. but a lot of that we may not get credit for, but it will melt and go back right back into the watershed somewhat. And during the, the planning, addressing water, we'll work with Eric. I mean, and that's not, it's not yet decided that that's an actual item, but there's also other opportunities <coughs> Um, as the summer tubing, expanding upon that. There's another option of not really being competitive, but with what the mountain coaster, which they offer mountain slides, which is a little bit different. It would complement what's being offered there as well, but it's a totally different, um, totally different they item. They have a little hill there that you try to walk up and then you slide right down it. So, Mary, I didn't mean to distract from the conversation. I just wanted to bring well, the question is: directors. So, do we need a special meeting to talk about moving this in the budget to go ahead and get these things done? No, um, Mayor, what I would propose is that we continue on this track for now, but keep in keep in mind, you know, basically, what I'm recommending is that we start to look at the bigger picture in the next couple of months as the legislative process works through. We're going to understand uh, more of the financial position that the state's in, what agencies are going to have money, and we start to develop our plan to, to make sure that we're hitting those. We hear there's tons of money. <clears throat> yeah. Nobody's told us how much. Nobody knows how much. They just, everybody's going on the premise that there's tons of money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Um, Bert. Bert yeah, and he, how much? I don't have a clue. That's just what I'm told. That's what he says. Yeah. Well, but if they're coming back and saying, no, you need to ask for more. Think big. <clears throat> then, then that's kind of an indication that, that it, somebody knows there's tons of money out there. Well, and they said it keeps coming in every day. Different. Which, which I agree with Susan on, on the water issue because my priority would be is how to pump the treatment water back up into town and use that for making snow and use that for, I, I've always kidded that say we'll just dump it out at the beginning of the river so we have water running <laughs> through the river during the... Eric, I don't want to get into a debate on that issue at this point. We can talk about those and look at those recommendations, you know, and, and, and all, all I can say is that, you know, and I think you guys have heard me say this, anything is achievable. Right. Uh, it right. just depends on what the will is, you know, so. I, I do, I do yeah. have concerns about mm -hmm. Blue Mountain uh, uh, traffic. Uh, is it good for, the, for our residents? Um, is it good for our animals? And, and I, I, I'm not against it and, and the water. Um, I worry about that. So that, that's fine. We can yeah. figure that out at a later time. Yeah, we'll, we'll have that. We'll work into that discussion. But like, I think what Rodney's saying is ju just like as you look at some of the additional um, tubing areas that uh, Mr. Dorgan's talked about, he's talked about actually building it on, on uh, materials where you wouldn't need snow, but you offer the same type of experience, right, Rodney? Yes. We're looking at other type of low impact developments that are going to offer recreational opportunity without having to um, tax our natural resources. So. But if you don't think outside the box, I mean, they may not all be possible, but you have to throw everything out and then and then start vetting through it and see what we can do. And I, and I understand that. Yeah, and, and Council, I'm just like the reuse, you know, we, we built out a whole reuse system in Las Vegas, New Mexico. And, and you know, I, I know that it's a and challenge. with this tons of money, there's our opportunity yeah. to say, hey, let's, you know. We need to this. explore everything. Because we have to put in an RO system, or eventually we'll no. be in there you know, putting in an RO the system. Downs was, we were talking the other day about they may need more water if they get their convention center. Yeah. So if we go to reuse, that could be we the first section of it. They're not even using, they still have half their <coughs> capacity to use it. Because uh, when we talked to Joey Jarvis and they said they have plenty of water to, to do Well, it. but they've annexed like all that property up behind Avalon centers, mm -hmm. which obligates them to provide water. So they may not have as much as they think in the future. So Mayor, I'm, I'm just really, let's, let's think big. And let's, you know, let's think of possibilities and let's not put up limitations on what's possible. Let's try to develop as much as we can. That's my recommendation. Well, I mean, when you're talking about spending half a million dollars, to, there's a chance of possibility. And that's what we got to weigh is what's the, you know, and I think in the next week or two, well, probably two, we'll have a better idea. Because we'll be in Santa Fe and back on it. Hmm? Yeah, oh. So it's better to go big than to have to say, oh, well, we've got this other project. Look, could we have right. this kind of money? Right. So just go big so that we yeah, funnel through. So have them done so that you, yeah. you can't shoot your gun if you don't have the bullet. And those are <clears throat> what we got. Okay. So you ask for $100 million, they only give you 80 you know? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the last um, conceptual plan that we completed uh, during 2021 was um, during the process of the expansion of Eagle Creek with Redoso Snowplay, uh, we looked at putting all of those um, improvements in a conceptual plan so it's easier for people to visualize it. And so uh, up until just the last two weeks, we've been working on different uh, edits to that conceptual uh, map. Um, it, that's how we did kind of envision the, the project of the parking of the, uh, I mean, paving of the parking areas. Um, this, uh, when we receive the final version uh, within the next um, couple weeks, it will include all of the amenities that are being built out, including the addition of the, the zip line, all of the um, different, I believe there's up to 12 uh, potential winter runs, the summer tubing, the uh, the beginning ski area, 
um, the mountain coaster, um, and and again, those are those are all items that we've agreed to with uh, with Redoso Snowplay and their agreement. Um, we're just uh, putting those on a conceptual map. Good. Um, do you all have any questions regarding all of the individual uh, or any of the individual conceptual plans or the master plans that are being worked on? Mm -hmm. Rodney, you just need to update all your ending dates. Yes, I did realize that yeah. later. Otherwise, you blew it. <laughs> You're <laughs> way behind. So the, the next uh, strategic plan item number two uh, was regarding recreation and event improvements. It was um, uh, from the comprehensive plan. It was the parks and recreation uh, goal number one, uh, dealing with quality parks and recreation opportunities are available for Edoso residents and visitors. And um, so we've made a lot of progress um, over the last year. Again, one of the items originally that began in that was Eagle Creek Sports Complex. Again, I mentioned that we worked out an agreement with Redoso Snipe, uh, Snowplay for the expansion. So additional recreation is, uh, you know, through that agreement, we, were, we added uh, summer tubing this last uh, year as well as the zip lining. Um, and so it's really turned the Eagle Creek Sports Complex into uh, truly a year-round um, destination. Um, <clears throat> through that process, um, one of the items that Redoso Snowplay is, is adding is the mountain coaster. Um, they went through all of the permitting process did, and did receive uh, their permits for the actual construction of not only the building but the mountain coaster in November. Um, if you've been out there recently, you can see where he's already started the excavation for the construction of the building as well as uh, for the framework of the coaster. Um, the scheduled completion of the mountain coaster is uh, in Memorial Weekend of, of this year. Um, so, and then regarding the uh, event improvements, um, and this is an this is an area where it kind of fluctuated and, and changed throughout the year. Um, we did work at improving not only our um, existing and and past programs that we've hosted but we also uh, worked with continuing to add new events. Um, so we expanded on uh, the Wingfield Park uh, walk through Christmas to play, uh, display. We, um, we moved the Halloween uh, haunted walk through to Wingfield Park. Um, as you can recall, not this Christmas, but the previous Christmas, we brought in a laser show. This year, we had the opportunity uh, to bring in the drone sh show, so we changed to that. Um, along with that, we operated um, our uh, youth sports in the fall that we have traditionally run uh, with flag football and uh, volleyball, but new this year, we did also take on um, Redoso Little League Soccer, which was a huge undertaking. It's, it's the largest youth sports that's, that's hosted in our community, and our department took over that uh, program, and it, it rent, uh, went really well. Um, along with that, um, we took over uh, the youth basketball program, um, which is for um, kids from... Uh, First grade through eighth grade. Uh, we're actually uh, starting our fifth through eighth grade season as we speak. We're, uh, I think we have the final registration tomorrow for that program. Um, again, that's our first year operating that program. Um, we've had consistent numbers um, as years pass. We've had about the same amount of participation. Um, along with that, we started an additional program, um, which is... Um, Smart Start program. It's for actually uh, four-year-olds through six-year-olds. Um, so just providing additional opportunities for the the youth in our community. The volleyball was wonderful. We, we had actually, and that's a, a two-year program that was well received by the community, and we have a lot of participation, not only by youth uh, that are in our school district, but even from uh, Mescalero and Capitan and and. Carrizozo, I mean, we, we attract a lot of participation from the surrounding communities as well. 
So the only one you're left off is baseball, so they're still autonomous on their organization. And... Yes, that is correct. Okay. They're, they still have their independent board, right. um, and we do work with them to help uh, support their program and complement it, but it is just something at this point that they've... Okay. Um, are not willing to, to let go. Uh, the good thing about us, uh, you know, operating and managing all the youth sports is we have consistency in the rules and regulations. We control right. the background checks and all of the training of, of the volunteers and coaches and officials, and it just provides a better quality program for the, the participants and I, I would say a safer program. So, right. Rodney, so with the coaches, do you do background checks on the coaches? Yes, we do perform okay. um, a lower level background check internally. If, if there are any red flags that are brought up, then we do a more in-depth uh, background check. We also uh, coordinate with the chief of police. If we have something that's questionable, we review it with him. Okay. Um, fortunately, we don't have those very often, but yeah. when we do, we rely on those resources. Okay. Good. So you said you do a re in research in-house? There's, there's several different um, levels of uh, free background checks mm -hmm. that you can perform. I don't know them offhand. Sydney probably does. Uh, but there's three different ones that you can perform. And then, again, depending on the type of information you get back, you can pay Okay. Uh, for a more in-depth one, which we do when those issues come up. I just think it's really important since yeah. it's the village of Ridoso. I mean, that that could be... You'd uh, be surprised at some lot, of the people yeah. walking around the streets, the histories they have. Oh, absolutely. Well, I know, yeah. and, and I think it's important <clears throat> that... Well, I just didn't know what you meant by in-house. I didn't know if he was... They were just saying, do you know anything about this guy? <laughs> <laughs> do you know anything? You know, so it's a little more in-depth than that. Yes. Well, yes, sometimes along, you get a lot of information just doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Along, Erroneous. Yeah. Along with that, um, I believe uh, that all of our uh, youth sports programs... What's a ute? A ute. Youth. All of our youth <laughs> sports ute. programs are actually they're certified through North American youth sports. And to get certified through North American youth sports, you have to submit a full... A copy of your policies and procedures, all of your trainings, and they review that. Um, it's a national recognized um, youth at sports administration um, organization. They review all of your policies and procedures. They ensure that your your background checks are 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 authorized by their procedures. They ensure that you have templates for not only for coaches uh, training opportunities for volunteers. Make sure everyone signs a waiver. Um, and so all of our programs are currently certified through that. And that's another thing that, um, nice. that I really um, i am proud about our, our programs that we host is they all are certified. And that is that same procedure is applied to uh, every one of our individual sports. Yeah. Well, and when you mentioned um, consistency, it's not just across all the programs, but it's also year to year. So in a lot of these youth sports, when the board changes every year or two years, yeah. or all of a sudden a bunch of them, their kids get too old for that league anymore, they're out, and you got new people coming in, things change, not always for the better. Um, so this, this provides that consistency, like I said, from year to year, so that uh, we know that you know, from, from this year to five years from now, we'll be consistent. What about the uniforms? Do the... Like the team, do they go out and try to solicit people from the community to put their name, <clears throat> to sponsor them as a team? Or how do we do that now? So it's, it's part of our, our rules and regulations of the Parks Department is we do not permit that any longer. Okay. So all of our, our uh, registration fees cover our entire operating budget for that program. Okay. And so as you reference, in the past... When these programs were run by individual organizations, they would go out and hit up every business right. in town for sponsorships. And then you would have, so he would have really good uniforms and he would have t-shirts and they wouldn't have shorts and no, you that, had shorts. And, no, absolutely. So it was inconsistent. So yes. we do not allow that. Oh, okay. We provide, we provide the uniform <clears throat> and we don't allow soliciting or fundraising because 
again, our belief is our revenue should pay for the, the cost of operating that league. In the football league, some of the teams had their practice uniforms and had their game uniforms because they had connections that were yeah. able to drop a bunch of money right. for it. <clears throat> so okay. we no longer, that no longer is happening with our the programs that the village operates. That's good. That's excellent. Let's see. As, as along with the um, the youth sports, um, we again continue to add items uh, throughout the year. Um, you know, we participate. Our department kind of led the Ridoso Adventure Tours as, as well as along with the team tourism, um, and as well as a lot of help from other people. Um, we did bring in. We brought back the Ridoso Marathon. Um, we worked to bring in uh, a, a truck show that happened in the fall. We uh, worked with people to bring in the first annual Indigenous Day, which was a huge hit. Again, I mentioned the drone show. Um, we looked at different opportunities. That, uh, we moved, uh, with your all's blessing, we moved Christmas in the park from Schoolhouse Park to Wingfield Park. Um, we added additional lights. Um, we add, We brought in a train and a tractor, two different ones, a train ride and a tractor ride on two occasions. Um, we can we brought back the Christmas home light tour. Um, we're working with uh, disc, uh, dynamic discs to bring in a series of disc golf tournaments this upcoming year. As well as um, we've also working with the convention center to bring in events. Um, there were two, there's actually um, the Zoss Fest that we partnered with a group in the community, the Zoss Fest, which was that Native American yeah. uh, arts and crafts that was held at the convention Zost. center, Zoss, Z-A-S, which means oh. snow in, in Native American. Uh, but we're working with the convention center to help try to bring in events too. Um, and we'll be, you know, we went out for an RFP, uh, the village did for a, uh, for a event promoter. We'll be looking at building on the musical series, um, the Wingfield Market and that musical series, as well as, uh, again, um, improving the Ridoso Adventure Tours and promoting that more. And um, So did you get an event planner? Or <coughs> There, I believe we did have one uh, one company submit and um, we're I believe in current negotiations with them and then that'll be brought to the governing body um, at the next meeting I believe okay quick question on the convention center filling them in so you're bringing in all trying to fill that and you're getting groups that come in Do you see the potential where they will eventually have their own weekend and then they'll be renting yes that is, that is the hope, and then even just kind of to, to reference the one particular event. So what we did with the Zoss event is um, they didn't have, they weren't capable of, of covering the rental fee. So what Parks Department is, is we actually did a, a line item uh, transfer. We covered the fees, and then we utilized the revenue. We, we um, how do you say, we charged for entering and we brought in enough revenue to cover that cost. So in turn, we brought enough revenue to cover that. So we paid for the full <coughs> use of the convention center. So you set a precedent there. Yes, and we, we also did have an, we are having an agreement whenever we do that, that, that we have, uh, oh, there's a lot of different language in that agreement, but it includes that we. Who, uh, who did they go to the tournament? <coughs> We, it's an MOU that we have existing, which has previously went through the attorney. We, we use that with MO, uh, that MOU. Mayor, instead, of a, instead of a private individual coming in to, to um, you know, put on a, or put together the event, the Parks Department basically put on the yes. event and paid the fee uh, for utilizing the... And then you get to charge so entry and yeah. whatever. So it, it's the Parks Department and... and the convention center working together to fill some of those gaps in the in the scheduling. In addition to that, you know, so that that's that's where you know really we're <laughs> but looking it's at the Zoss Fest, and so yeah, but we're looking at the like the convention center as an enterprise fund, and any any time that it's used, even if it's used internally, they should be making money off of that. Right. You know, so if, if uh, Parks and Rec is putting together programs, Parks and Rec is going to uh, create it as an enterprise. Make sure that it's uh, financially viable 
and then the commissioners <coughs> receiving their money that they would even if it was a private individual coming in. So there's no individual that's in charge of the name Zoss? No. And, and so we, we did manage the gate on that. We collected all of the revenue. We deposited it. We did cover the full cost, the 100% cost of the facility, and we were able to bring in additional an additional event that previously would, wasn't in existence. Well, I can see how you can reinvest and, that in future events. And what we hope is that's not the norm. Hopefully that's temporary. Hopefully we get to the level where, again, either this individual or others <coughs> will, will do this on their own. This was just a... Um, a way to help fill some some fill a gap. Um, some other opportunities um, through us working like with in Indigenous Day, which we'll be uh, presenting to lodgers taxes. We have the opportunity to bring in a, a powwow. Um, I've learned a little bit about powwows. I really haven't ever been involved with one, but um, it we we have the uh, possibility of bringing in this powwow, which will bring in. Over over 200 native dancers from throughout the Southwest, bringing in um, a lot of different uh, competitions with drummers, and it could be a really really huge event. I mean, an event that that really hasn't happened in the area, and our our communication with the uh, possibility of working with an individual is, they used to host something like this in in El Paso, uh, again which is a build upon that indigenous day. We really don't yeah. haven't celebrated our, our local Native American culture. And the expectation is if we were to bring that in, it would be a hugely successful event. Like the one they put on in Albuquerque. Yes. Time. Did didn't Mescalero participate? I, in, I was there. In indigenous day? Yes. yes we okay. Had, okay. Again, that was another, we had tribes from all over, right. not only New <clears throat> Mexico, but, but area <clears throat> states as well, so. I, I went, I just didn't, uh, I, I wasn't there the whole time. So. And I was talking to the vendors, and they were saying, this is great. They're, they were selling, and yeah. they go, we want to come back, you know, so. That was, was that a, was a event. great event. We had a, a tremendous amount of positive feedback, and yeah. it does relate. We did utilize some of the information logistically to help uh, our Wingfield Park master plan. Um, if we're looking at building upon events like that, if if you were there, you can recall the amount of yes. activity and participation. Right. Uh, we filled up our parking lots. Uh, people were parking on Spring Road. Yes. And so I think, I mean, I, I don't know, maybe at first instinct you think a parking garage is not needed, but whenever you look at events like that, there, it, it really would have been beneficial to alleviating that overflow parking in well, neighborhoods. Well, we, we and parked areas. at the Mashie place with yeah. every other car. Right. <laughs> I and mean, it was the, the open part yeah. of the Mashburn lot. Yeah. So, again, uh, we did share that type of information with the planner, and uh, that's where that information and recommendation on the addition of the parking garages. Uh, with our, uh, you know, that anticipated growth of use of Wingfield Park. That's where that's coming from. Okay. Excellent. Um, again, we'll be looking at, uh, in the, this uh, fiscal year, in the, in the budget as well, is requesting funding for an additional uh, drone show as well. Um, we would like to complement the, the 4th of July weekend. You know, fireworks are never permitted, so that we were looking really at possibly bringing in a drone show and building it out as an event. Some of the feedback we had um, from the Christmas light drone show was, I mean, it, it is relative over relatively quick. Uh, and so to build upon that, we would look at maybe putting on an event uh, prior to it getting dark, and then the, the drone show would complement it. So we're looking at doing that for the 4th of July, not on the same date that the Inn of the Mountain Gods does their show, but on a, on a different date. That would be um, really good. Those are the just different type of activities we're looking at bringing in. And then, of course, you know, bring, <clears throat> mentioning the ice rink. Um, that was an opportunity that, that was presented as a possibility uh, to the Parks Department we uh, not only brought that to the uh, Lodgers Tax Board and the governing body for review. That was um, has been a huge hit. It definitely was over the holidays. Um, it's been a huge hit with our locals. Um, and, and part of that, which uh, I'll be 
bringing before uh, Lodgers Tax and the governing bodies. We have the the ability to purchase um, a rink um, that the company has expressed uh, that they do this typically with communities. Once they see how um, the that's well received by the community, they do quite often sell them. Um, you know, I did share that we would like one a little larger that would take more of a footprint of that pavilion. And so I do have some numbers back for, for the outright purchase of uh, a larger uh, ice skating rink. And just for rough numbers, I think we, we paid, uh, just for the rink itself, not including <coughs> generator, we paid $40,000 to rent it. Um, you can purchase one for $100,000, which is about, uh, it's, I think it's 30 by 80, where this one is currently 30 by 50. So that's another <laughs> opportun uh, good possibility, good acti um, opportunity that the village could take advantage of. It will be presented at a later date. That was great. I can foresee you're going to be coming for us for money to build a storage barn or something. He's already working on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that wouldn't be up all the time, would it? You know, I, I think you could really um, you could really see how the season is going and what the demand is. Yeah. Um, it, it from what I initially understood through our initial conversations where we were looking at, there's communities that that do it outside of just winter. That it can be in 70, 80 degree weather. What I what we have learned it, though is when the pavilion doesn't cover the rink exactly right, the area that has sun does get a little yeah. uh, slushy. But so, that would I mean, really be great for, for, uh, just for spring breaks. I think that would be a huge hit. Well, have you ever thought about a road ring? That, that one that they've got in Alamos, you know, that's booked all the time, they say. So I didn't know if... Is it outside? No, it's inside. inside. But I'm saying as opposed to an ice skating rink, a roller rink that you could use year-round. Because you remember when they had the rolling rink down in Midtown? Oh, I do. I, I rollered there. That's oh, so what I'm saying. Everybody always says it. I'm just saying it sounds like a natural to me. Well, and they kind of died off in popularity, and they're they're having a resurgence mm -hmm. because of everybody's getting to be our age that used to roller skate, you know. And now it's like, oh, we want to take our Get kids to our grandkids. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Never Break did skate backwards, but <laughs> not everybody. You didn't skate? <laughs> that was the place to go hang out. <laughs> oh, yeah. Does the council or governing body have any additional questions regarding the recreation and event improvements? I'll move on to strategic plan item number three for the Parks Department, which deals with additional facilities and improvements. It's Again, it's an item <clears throat> that comes out of the comp plan, again, from Parks and Recreation goal number one. Um, and so uh, the progress from that action item is uh, we did um, uh, Grindstone Lake master plan developments. Um, we have added uh, pavilions. We built out the beach. We added uh, shade structure, um, pit toilets. We've included some uh, uh, parking improvements. Um, we've also... Uh, have awarded a contract to build the uh, the boat uh, concrete or hard, harden the boat ramp. Um, uh, the Moon Mountain Master Plan again. Uh, we currently have a, a federal grant uh, for the design of trails in that area, uh, which we are currently working through. That's also addressed in a, a different uh, action item number five. Um, we're working on towards. Uh, the conceptual plan of, um, of recreational items in Moon Mountain. Um, traditionally, what we have done in the past is work with our Parks and Recreation uh, Commission. Um, typically, at the beginning of New Year, in their first meeting, we perform site visits and review of the infrastructure in the parks, and we look for recommendations from them as well. Um, so we've yet to have our first meeting, so that'll be in the, in the February meeting where we visit with them and see uh, where they would also like um, some to see improvements. That, that must be one of the best um, 
commissions to be on. I, you know, I was on it for 14 or 15 years, and everything that we would say, you know, hey, how about this? We never had the money. And so that must just be so much fun to be able to, the sky's the limit, let's see what we can it's get. It's definitely changed, because I was on it for a short period before <laughs> the council, and we didn't really do anything. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot going on, but now there's so much happening. Oh it's got to be fun. The last several years with the support of the of not only Lodger's Tax, but the <clears throat> governing body, we've seen a lot of improvements, and those improvements have had huge impacts on the community. And they have. I, I agree with you. If we thought those years were fun, I think that we have a lot of potential in the upcoming years. Yes. Um, and then again, you know, uh, recommendations will be submitted to the governing body of how we're going to look at uh, the development of those master plans, which would add to our additional facilities and, and improvements. If do you all have any questions regarding action item or uh, strategic plan item number three. On the splash pad, it was denied just for funding reasons, or did it have to do with the use of water or the filter system? Or is it just done? You know, so, so early on in the plan, that was an item, and uh, and we I did approach uh, Lodger's Tax and the governing body, and I don't recall the decision of why we didn't move forward with it. Um, but to address the questions on, on water, um, the splash pads, they could be designed multiple ways. It could be either designed where it's a, a flow-through system where you just dump water in and dump it down That's the drain. That's what Roswell's got, I think. Or you can get one that has a recirculation system. So we did look at the option for a recirculation system. At, the, at our existing facility, it would require its own independent system. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it is an added cost, but I think mm -hmm. the added cost, uh, the total cost, if I'm not mistaken, was around $300,000 for the splash pad in that area, which did include its own recirculation system. Um, I think the hesitation, if I'm not mistaken, was just regarding the whole idea of, of White Mountain Master Plan, the the condition of the existing pool. Uh, I think with the information that you all received, I mean, the pool does have a lot of life lift in it, depending on the amount of, of maintenance we put into it, and it still is a possibility. Um, I believe the, the conceptual uh, map um, of Wingfield Park also includes the, the placement of a splash, splash pad that. in that area as well. Um, but again, you can... Uh, I, I would recommend, you know, if that was something, we look at the recirculation system. Um, there are systems that, you know, we're, our department is familiar with operating. We have certified uh, operators um, for that. Um, this depends what direction the village would like to go. So the splash pad you talked about in Roswell on 2nd Street, mm -hmm. uh, the Murphy family splash pad, it cost 250000 to build it. A recirculation system would have cost another two hundred fifty thousand. Whoa! Ooh. But that's a huge that's a big one, one with a lot of water. Oh, it's got through. stuff everywhere. Yeah. It's, so I don't know. I just I know in the Dallas area they were, had a big health scare on those from yeah. in Houston too. Is it hoof and mouth or toe and fungus or polio. Anyway, it was all going around, you know, and so I just wanted to make sure. Then I, we mentioned it on the radio one time, and a health professional called and said, "Whatever you do, you have to get." Recycling that does this, that, and the other, and chlorinates and it's, the water, it's expensive, and sanitizing everything. Yeah. So we'll let the Downs do that. That's on their their list. Oh, it is. Yeah, get your Tolio and the Downs. Good <laughs> <laughs> <We'll know> so. <some. laughs> their splash pad is somebody standing there with a the hose. <laughs> but you're right, Rod. Um, it was the we didn't have a clear decision if should we build a new rec center with all these and. And then the cost for doing that separate pump room at the other pool is like, oh, let's wait on this and hold off. But yes, but that's all the comments I keep getting ever since I called a few moms uh, about a rec center or, or, you know, where should we move on this or, you know, revamping our pool. Um, that's all I'm hearing more of a, an indoor outdoor swimming pool. 
with you know a splash pad in it lap lane um, get that in there so maybe add that to that hundred million dollar uh, uh, giveaway or give out There are no uh, <coughs> questions on that uh, item. I'll move on to strategic plan item number four, which is uh, dealing with trails. So again, out of the um, comprehensive plan, it was under transportation for goal number two. Redoso's recreation trails network is unparalleled across the state. And so that does encompass a, a lot of different uh, areas. And so... Um, one of the items was Cree Meadows uh, Trail. That construction is near completion. Uh, the actual construction itself has been completed, but there's a few remaining uh, small items, uh, contractual obligations in the closed out that's pending. Um, and then uh, Moon Mountain, uh, we're right at the tail end of, of waiting on certifications from the Department of Transportation in order to... Uh, to go to bid on that project. Um, we're hoping that that could complete it, be completed in this calendar year, um, as well as the Lynx uh, rehab. Uh, that's the same place. Uh, we're waiting on the final certifications on that project as well from the Department of Transportation, as well as some utility certifications from PNM. Um, but we would also anticipate that we could uh, bid that project out uh, this fiscal year. Um, the resources for those particular projects are a local match. Um, they've been identified at the beginning when we applied through those grants. I believe those funds are also the, our local matches set aside um, for those. Um, as far as uh, future plans for that strategic plan item on trails, um, we've really built out the majority of trails that have been previously identified. And so um, completing a trails master plan, which I mentioned earlier, is actually really necessary in order for us to take a next step for future planning. Um, it was quite some time ago that we completed uh, 10 plus years we had our latest version of a trails master plan. Really? That's where we um, identified the 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 trails in Grindstone, as well as all of the work that was completed in Cedar Creek and Perk Canyon. There was, there's still some trails that were identified in that original uh, trails master plan, but they were on in the Lincoln National Forest out around the Benito area. Mm -hmm. And so, again, if we're going to be uh, prepared to apply for grants or look at additional trail projects, we need to complete an updated trails master plan. Yeah, time is fine. Do you all have any questions regarding trails or uh, that strategic plan item? But we should be able to, on Moon Mountain, we should be able to complete the trails by this year? Uh, not all of the trails that were identified in that original master plan. There was a total of about... Um, 16 to 18 miles identified in that master plan that we completed a couple years ago. We have federal funds, uh, existing federal funds, that, but only enough to design and construct about five miles. Okay. okay. So we'll have five of those 15, 16 miles completed this calendar year. Great. When, when you have the federal funds involved, it really increases the cost of, of doing construction. It. Mm -hmm. yes. So they're talking about... So, Narrowing the trail and making it instead of five miles, ten miles. So, so it, it it is quite a cost when you have because they're a lot really really strict and the amount of uh, detail and and just the process is really complicated. Okay. And will we have to go out like we did on the um, the other trails on Grindstone? Uh, <coughs> it'll have to. We'll have to go out to bid following the. Uh, DOT process and so it's actually different from grindstone because uh -huh. when we built grindstone it was all local funds we went out through a local I mean we went well, through we the built it process. to specifications for trails yes we did utilize at, um, for both of them we have utilized <coughs> um, like um, gosh I forget the name but it's it's yeah, I can't remember what it is either but it's so a, on these trails on Moon Mountain, will they be uh, adaptable for bicycles so that you could in, 
employee that uh, 24 hours in the Wild West, or we could have other things like that? Yes, they are. They're multi-purpose built trails. They are a little bit more leaning to bikes. And what I mean by that is traditionally like a, a, a walking or a hiking trail won't have the 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 topography and the, the turns and, and twists that a bike trail would. So it is going to have some uh, those features, uh, but it can accommodate uh, just your walkers, your uh, uh, equestrians. Uh, but yes, it is geared towards mountain okay. biking. Will it be like a natural surface or is it, it going to be paved? It will be natural surface okay. trails. I just heard federal funds. I'm going, oh, great, six inches of asphalt. Here we go. And so they do have different funding opportunities for those uh, federal funds, and I think this one is through the Recreational Trails Program, and that's the different. It's not the Transportation okay. Alternative Program, which the links was. Yeah, the tap, yeah. Goodness. If there are no further questions, I'll move on to item number five. So strategic uh, plan item number five uh, for our department is develop a wayfinding plan for recreation resources. Um, again, that's again in parks and recreation goal number one, uh, quality parks and recreation opportunities available for residents and visitors. Um, so in the, in the comprehensive plan, it was policy 1.1 expand and enhance parks and recreation opportunities and the actual action item was 1.1 J develop a wayfinding plan that provides direction to Redoso's recreation resources and coordinated with wayfinding to all Redoso's destinations and so um, I did a, approach our the planner we have on board groundwork studios they submitted uh, a proposal for to complete a wayfinding plan um, the governing body um, did uh, fund the uh, the proposal for the completion of the wayfinding plan. We did have a, a kickoff meeting on January 10th. Um, we listed um, some initial areas that uh, recreation resources and regionally uh, regional attractions that we wanted to identify. Uh, so Groundwork Studios did have an initial site visit to take a uh, current inventory on the existing signs. Um, that plan um, will be taking place in the next um, five to six months. Uh, when Once that plan is completed, we'll be coming back with uh, um, a plan to present to the governing body for the actual uh, construction and placement of the signage um, and just uh, for um, for your information we uh, the the Midtown Association Association also has funding and uh, the plan for a wayfinding plan for just the Midtown, Midtown. area and we are uh, including uh, them in the discussion of, with our planner it actually happens that uh, the planner for uh, Main Streets is actually Groundwork Studios, and so they are already <coughs> working on that their plan. So our plan will um, uh, be, be consistent, coordinated, with consistent signage, kind of similar, maybe not ex identical, but it will be um, relatable in that you know you're in the village of Ridoso, and and uh, <coughs> but it'll it'll direct our visitors. Uh, to uh, like in the Midtown area, to parking, to restrooms, to Wingfield Park, to Grindstone, and then outside of uh, Midtown, it'll direct people to Cedar Creek, uh, Lincoln, the ski area, the area lakes, um, those kind of attractions as well. Rodney, what about, and I think we've talked about it, but I don't remember, um, digital signage at Center and um, Sutter, possibly lease space on, on the side of one of those buildings that's already there to put it up so that we've got a, an electronic medium that the message can be changed constantly, especially given all the events that you're planning at Wingfield Park, so that people driving through town may not know. They, they may see a sign, Wingfield Park, oh, I don't want to go to a park. But if they see something about, oh, we're having the ABC Festival going on this weekend, um, that message can constantly be changed. We've tried that. Before, we had issues with the highway department, um, and then the property uh, owner wanted to put one on the side of his building, mm -hmm. and there was legalities on that, that you couldn't advertise for additional things, so we would have to be leasing spaces. 
I don't know. There's going to be some hair on that so I was one. Thinking so right there on on center. Yeah. You, you know, on that side. So, so we're off of the we're off of the main drag. Um, we don't have to worry about that. But if we lease it for whatever price per month, well, they're it's saying like, it's anything that's bright and shiny or flashing that deters attention, and that's what they were saying over there on Sutterith. I mean, Meacham. But you'd have to lease space from uh, Arnold Duke or from um, the Stadheimer, whoever owns that property. That's the one that I was thinking more of. Yeah, you know, when you're coming in? Yeah. Right there? Yeah. So there there are several <coughs> projects that you all are aware of that I haven't even addressed. And, and I think that would help towards directing people to Wingfield Park. Um, we will have the the speaker system available that can um, that we can put on announcements um, of community events along with ours. Um, I think there we can take better advantage of some resources we have existing resources we have use of the radio um, where we've been working with the Ridoso Midtown Association they have a couple of kiosks downtown they have one right in front of our restrooms um, I know recently Tim uh, Roberts has uh, brought out the kiosk that they have at the convention center it was put away temporarily because co because Nobody of the COVID. But I think utilizing all of those resources, as well as um, we haven't, we're, we're right at the beginning stages of getting team tourism going again. It's very important to have the director on board, and these are kind of uh, of items that we will be addressing through as we work together with team tourism in the future. And I'll make note of, of that. Um, I also think the. Um, the realignment of Center Street is also going to work as, as um, a gateway to Wingfield Park. Yes. The, the park itself and the master plan will have a gateway. So in the future, when that's developed, as you look up Wingfield Park, you're going to see a, a gateway entrance into that park. Yeah, I, I love so that. I think a combination of all of those things will help um, with the, the item that you're bringing up. If there are no other questions, I'm... I, I think, I think that's, that's plenty, awesome. man. That's great. And I think we need to amend the... the what did we say? 40 million? No, I'm, just <laughs> no, I'm with you. I, no, I want to go really big. Good. Big boy over there was cutting me down to 50 million. He already <laughs> had me talk to him to 100 million. I'm saying let's go 125 or... Exactly. I mean, all these things that you're working on is... You know, I'm we're behind you 100%. We love all these things, so... Uh, I think that the amenities that you're talking about developing are awesome. <coughs> well, I appreciate your last time. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Rod. You. Good job. Appreciate it. <coughs> Mayor, Mayor, there is a uh, Mayor's caucus at two. Do you want me to have? Oh, is that today? In? Yes. Do you want me to have somebody set in, or do you want to take it? Uh, I can set in at two. And then we've got a, a, a meeting tomorrow that they're scheduling too. So. I'm glad you did. I totally, it should have went off by now. We got, we got a little bit of time. Uh, yeah, it'll, it'll warn me. Hello there. Hello, Mayor Crawford, members of the council. Anthony. Um, okay, so our purpose statement for the community center is we at the Ridoso Community Center continue to integrate community services and programs while striving to meet our citizens physical psychological social and spiritual needs and helping to improve the quality of life for our residents and longtime visitors Joe, you all okay with well that? I just want a little more enthusiasm out of you because we're right. bragging on you all the time so <laughs> let's have some enunciation in there I mean you do unbelievable work over there you really yeah, do Anthony so many good. people are, are tickled and you've become a focal point and so we just need to see that come out. I ate, so I'm kind of... Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's sleepy lunch. <laughs> it's siesta time for me, so I'm like... So, yeah. So, okay. So, the next uh, deal on there is our uh, organizational chart. Of course, you got Rodney Grego above Parks and Recreation. He's the director there. You got me, Anthony Montes, Community Center Manager. Then you have <coughs> Amber Ward, who is our new Community Center RSVP Coordinator. And then we have Edu Viges Navarez. She's our uh, technician. And then we have uh, Javier Picasso as our recreation leader, too. He was the part-timer that we discussed earlier. Yes. Doing half and half. Um, so he's there helping us now. 
Do we have any questions on that one? No, sir. Okay, so we'll go on to uh, our our comp plan goal, goal number one, which is hazard mitigation. Reed also is well prepared for emergencies. Um, what we have in there is the Red Cross training. A few years back, we were identified as a Red Cross shelter, so we were kind of in the works with uh, Joe Kasabowski trying to get that place identified as that and training employees on how to how to get things going there. Um, we were actually attending trainings as they were as they were given so we started learning a lot you know about feeding areas dormitory area information areas and stuff and what the center's staff needed to know about um, having a Red Cross shelter so that we know what we needed to do to help them out of course uh, the Red Cross <coughs> training had halted because of COVID-19 yeah. and so all trainings were were stopped so we're hoping in uh, 2022 that we can resume training as needed and we staff will take other training if it's offered so that way we could be well educated on how to run a shelter because that's important. I know that we had the shelter open for the flood that happened back in in the summer sometime. July 6th. Oh, yeah, middle summer. Um, and uh, you know, they no, actually nobody actually showed up to use the center but that was kind of interesting to see they showed up and they can guide us well into what we need to do, but I just think that staff needs to be trained on, on those items because yeah. you need to be able to help wherever you can yeah. and be right on time with it. It would make you feel better. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so that was our goal number one. That's just ongoing because it's going to be constant training with that. Um, so if anybody had any questions on that one. Okay, so then we will go on to uh, our goal number two, which is Redoso offers community services for all its residents and employees. Um, what we like to do with that one is uh, the building improvements. That was our tactical plan item. Um, we, that The Redoso Community Center was in bad condition there for years, and uh, we had a lot of work done to it thanks to grants and uh, local funds that we were able to acquire to fix a lot of things. November 2019, we were able to uh, replace the kitchen tile and dining room tile because the tile that was in there was just like probably 30 years old and it was peeling up, causing trip hazards. And we got that replaced to make this, made our dining room and kitchen look very good, very pleasing to our people that utilize it. Um, February 2020, we were actually able to take the swamp cooling system out of there and replace it with an HVAC system, which gave us new furnaces, new water heaters and all. So that was big to us. We no longer have the, the noisy swamp coolers above your head and hardly work during the summer when it's really hot. They hardly would work anyway. So now the HVAC system is prov providing that cooling system that we needed in that center, especially for all the people that are exercising and dancing and doing all the stuff that they do. Um, October 2020, oh, I, let me back up, uh, July 2020, we had our rooftop replaced. That rooftop was, it was bad. I mean, it was peeling up so bad, I don't even know how it just didn't fall through. Whenever they pulled apart the rooftop around, uh, over the dining hall, it was rusted out to where they had to replace the entire metal underneath the, the membrane. So it was good that we saw that because I don't know how anybody walking on that thing didn't fall through. It was, it was really bad. And um, we were able to acquire that grant as long as well as the HVAC uh, grant. We acquired that through the New Mexico Aging and Long-Term Services Capital Outlay Department. I was able to file grants for these items, and thankfully they came through quick enough. So now the rooftop, none of that leaks anymore. We've had bad rains and not a single leak in the building. So I would go in there praying I didn't see no water. <laughs> I actually did see some water on the, on the floor one day after it was raining, and I was like, no, but it was coming in through the bottom where we had to, I had Parks and Rec help me dig out the, the, um, the area outside the building because the water was coming in through under the wall. So I was, I was like, oh, no. And actually, um, we had uh, roof carers, the ones that, that performed the work doing the rooftop, and mm -hmm. Parks and Rec, when they were hanging lights this past, uh, for the Christmas items that were going on, they saw areas that were kind of peeling up that they noticed, and they let me know on them. And I, I contacted Roof Care, and they never even contacted me back. They showed up, fixed the work, didn't even say nothing. They showed up, did it all, and they were gone. Oh, that's never great. even said nothing. They just took care of it. That's how good they are. 
good. Um, so it's good we utilize them. Uh, of course, we were we uh, October two thousand twenty. Um, we renovated the stucco, wood trim, painted the center. Center looks awesome. Um, we actually were able to get White Sands Construction on that one to do that. They subcontracted out. There was a few cracks that started to appear on the building, and they showed up, and they recently fixed those. So they are on task with uh, keeping their word of fixing anything that goes wrong. So that was awesome. Um, White Sands Construction has been awesome with this. Um, gutters were installed around the whole building to keep the drainage off the sidewalks because it would just splash right under the sidewalks where people would walk. So that's alleviated that problem. Um, 2021, this past year, we were able to do the tile in the large bathrooms. The, the tile was just like the dining room and all that. It was bad, molded, discolored. It looked, it looked bad. The bathrooms kind of had a smell to them. Um, we replaced all that. Uh, that was funded by the Village of Rito Self Funding. Um, so we thank you all for that. Uh, so the tile in there looks awesome now. Um, so you really used the pandemic to reconstruct your building. Everything. That was great. We were lucky Silver enough, line. Yep. Yeah, we were lucky enough to get all of that funding in the same time. So that yep. building was just under construction that entire time. Right. So it was a mess. If we would have been open, we would have had to shut down. <laughs> so it, it worked hand in hand. Right. So it was good for us. Good job. Um, Okay, so the 2022 tactical plan that I have, um, I have recently applied for the inner ceiling tiles to be replaced with the lighting to be upgraded to LED lighting. And also we found that they could not replace the ceiling tiles without uh, putting the insulation mounted to the top of the deck. So uh, I was able to seek funding through New Mexico Regional Long-Term Services again for that, to get that replaced. and. Um, and then for them to do LED lighting, uh, I know that there was a question about the LED lighting because of Horton Complex, mm -hmm. uh, White Sands Construction is who we're going to contract to do that. And we've made the purchase order for them to actually fix that. They're going to look at the Horton Complex to find out what that was so that we don't have that same problem. Okay. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah, there's different lighting within the, the Horton and some of it, some of it's like this, which is great. Right. But some of it was those tubes. Right. So, yes. Yeah, so, uh, so they're going to check that and check into that to make sure that we're, we're good on that one because I, I'm glad you said that because I was like, uh-oh, I don't want to have problems when we do all this. So. Well, these light fixtures are $52 at Home Depot. All right. So I've been replacing some of them. <laughs> yeah, okay. So um, so that's coming up. Uh, we're, we're just going to be doing that here within a short period of time with, once uh, we can get them on board to actually do that construction for us. Um, when we found out that the insulation that was placed is not up to code now I was able to seek out for emergency funding through the New Mexico Agent Long-Term Services Department and I got emergency funding to uh, supplement that to actually get that repaired the way it needs to be so so that was good that they allowed us to get that um, another tactical plan that we have is I did a grant application um, through the Agent Long-Term Services again for the architect fees to add on to the building the building is L-shaped, so I wanted to expand it to actually make the building square to add, add a more di more uh, kitchen, more commercial kitchen with more storage space, and to add additional meeting rooms. A lot of our stuff now that we have going on, it's hard to fit more more items into the center, so we need more meeting space, and I would love to prepare more meals out of there, but we just need more kitchen equipment. equipment where, where, where would you have the other meeting rooms? Um, right there, uh, Mayor Crawford. Um, Where the council. books are? We were actually planning on doing it between the kitchen and the bridge room, which would have been on the... Oh, actually build the, on. The west yeah. end of the building, yes, to make the building square, right where the uh, yeah. canopy is out in the back. Yeah. I spoke with Rodney many times about maybe possibly moving that, that old canopy that's back there, the gazebo, into the park. So that way I would have room to, to, add, yeah. to do the addition there. So I'm, uh, I, actually, I actually applied for the architect fees, but whenever they sent it through, they actually sent it in as redoso downs. <laughs> so I, yeah, so we figured that out, caught it, so they had to re send it through some type of way that, that they had to do it. So, we, so everything's fixed, so we should be okay on that one. We badly caught it, though. We'd also downs would have got them a few thousand dollars to. <laughs> and they've got a big. Kitchen. And they would have said thank you. 
Yeah, so mm. <laughs> that was cool that we caught that. So um, that I'm, I'm look, looking forward to that coming through as well. Um, we just need more room at the center and stuff. And um, oh, another thing that I want to apply for this coming spring when I can actually do another application with the New Mexico Asian Long-Term Services Department is to actually renovate the, the restrooms that are located downstairs more towards the north side of the building, I think you'd say. or By the cart? Yeah. Room? Yes, on that side. The the bathrooms, they don't even have doors on them because of the way they were made before. So we're looking at trying to renovate those and, and making them a lot more AD, with ADA compliant and whatnot. So. So I'm looking forward to applying for a grant for that. So maybe we'll, that'll be in the future with us too. Um, so that's the tactical plan there for goal number two. Does anybody have any other questions? Okay, so our goal number three, uh, Rio also offers community service for all its residents and employees. Our strategic plan is new and continued programming. Continue to introduce new programming for active senior citizens in the area. Um, this, you know, this area, the community center is used by a lot of retiree people that come here to, to us that are retired and they just want stuff to do so the center offers, you know, programs like lunches, breakfast, uh, games, art classes, tax aid, tax aid is coming up now, hearing services, computer assistance, veterans assistance, and, um, we just, uh, try to invite everybody from the community to utilize the center for programming because that's what it's for. So our goals are to actually continue uh, putting it out there that people can actually have their programs at the center. We have a lot of volunteers that run these programs and we're thankful for them because there's just a volunteer that runs an exercise class here. There's one that runs one here and the lady that runs the art class, she, they're all just volunteers. So we've got them people in the, in the community that actually put into the center. So we'll continue to reach out and uh, look for more programming in this center because there are little gaps that we can fit classes in. Um, the center, whenever the COVID pandemic hit, we, were, we had to shut down. And at that point in time, we lost all of our programming. A lot of our volunteers, I didn't even know if they would come back or not. A lot of them didn't. But whenever we opened up, I think there was a lot of people out in the community that just were bored at home. <laughs> so when we opened up, they rushed through them doors. They were just, I mean, we got hit pretty good. And thankfully enough that the programming, that, uh, whenever we introduced programming, I was able to put it together in better timing, one right after the other. So it fit better instead of just random trying to fit in gaps. So whenever we opened it back up, I was able to do that so that that was awesome, and, and we've had more program there than we did before. So so we're thankful for that. Um, Anthony, just real quick, I just wanted to say that, you know, uh, putting Amber uh, into that RSVP, um, she had come to a backpack program, and she wanted to know uh, how it all worked. And, you know, she really sold the backpack program the, all those women on that and you know everybody signed up and um, so yeah, I, I thought that Amber did a nice job just learning what uh, what everybody does and so I, I don't know if she does that with all of her programs but I did want to let the council know that um, she did a great job when she came and and got a rapport with the the other ladies and it didn't take any time to sign all of them signed up, so. Councilor Litterman, that is awesome. Um, <clears throat> yes, Amber's been great for our programming there at the center. She's just so live, and I know that other departments have been trying to take her from me. Mm -hmm. like, Stay <laughs> week. But yes, and I was going to actually talk about her programming here and one of my other goals. Oh, so I'm sorry. Yeah. I, no, no, it's great because I'm glad everybody's getting along with her so well. Um, so I'll continue on with this one. Um, so program is reopened. Uh, our 2022 tactical plan is just, just like I was saying, uh, keep keep uh, trying to reintroduce more programming there. Uh, send out send out the pro the ideas on the program we have now. Right now we're, we uh, we communicate through the through the radio station, of course, talking about the center. We have rack cards that go through the rack um, displays through all of Lincoln County. Um, I send out emails to hundreds of. Uh, people that I have on my email list to just 
let them know about all this stuff that we got going on there at the center. Um, let me see. Uh, so, yeah, just the outreach that we're doing there. And then we also received a grant for uh, new exercise equipment there at the center through the New Mexico Aging and Long-Term Services. Um, we received it, and we're actually working on it now. We've had a wall built in the center to actually um, block some of that, more of that equipment that we're getting in. So we're going to be able to get new uh, fitness equipment, treadmills, ellipticals, weight machines, all of the, all of the good stuff. We had the stuff that uh, Councilor Coughlin had donated from Boys and Girls Club, I believe it was, back a few years back, and it served its purpose. But you know, we if we can upgrade, we keep upgrading because Absolutely. you know stuff stuff ages after a while. So we received that grant, and I've been working on that lately to to get that equipment in, and hopefully that entices more people to come into the center to utilize it. We have a lot of people that actually do go there all the time for this equipment. I know. Um, Councilor Salas and uh, or Mayor Pro Tem Salas <laughs> and uh, Shippen were actually utilizing that. We're regulars. There. I can tell you've been working yeah, out. Pumps yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you all would be excited too that there'll be new equipment there as well. So we're looking forward to that. That's one of our tactical plans for this year to get that get that up and going and get it set in there. So that's what I had for goal number three. Does anybody else have any questions? So, Anthony, you mentioned um, a lot of your programs are being run by volunteers. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to make sure that some of, the, some of the programs that I do see advertised, there's either a small fee or there's a donation. Those are all types of compensation. So if anybody's doing that and receiving any type of compensation, they do have to get a business license through the village and uh, remit GRT as well. So I just want to make sure because we've had people reaching out from the community saying, hey, what about this? What about that? That's not fair if I have to get one that, and they don't. Um, and it's just fair because anybody that's receiving compensation is now considered to be self-employed. Councillor Coughlin, um, Mayor, the way it works is that uh, these volunteers, they will get donations from the public for their classes. What they do is they, they uh, in turn, they donate it all to the center. So they're not keeping none of the money they're donating. And the money should go straight to the center, not to them. Well, it's because like some of these classes are off times and they, they hold it all together in one bundle versus handing me five bucks here, five bucks when, there. Once they receive the cash, the, they are a business. Whether they, whatever they do with their, their receipts, it needs to um, not touch their hands. It needs to go straight from the donor to the, to the center. It's just like um, retirement programs. If you're going to roll over out of one... IRA to another, you can't touch that money. It's got to be, you know, behind your back, the hands, hands off. Absolutely. Just I, to make sure we got everything covered. And I can look into that. Uh, the unfortunate part of that is like some of our classes are after hours, and so I'm not there to actually collect it myself. So they bring it to me. Do you have a Dropbox? And they're receipted. I can actually look into getting. They're receipted. I receipt everybody's everybody's donations. Every class. The clogging class, when they give me the donations, I receipt them out as donations to the center, and so every every bit of every bit of income that comes to the center is, is receipted out yeah. for that class. If you have yeah. a Dropbox, I, we we put one in in my office door. It's like a mail slot, right. but on the inside is a, a locking box about that big. It just drops right down, down into it. And uh, Councilor Coffin, that is actually a good idea, and I can definitely look into doing that. Yeah. But I recall a drop box there because I, I've done that, taking a dance class, me and Chip in there, and then instead of giving it to Andrea, we just went and put it in that little box on that desk up there. Yes, um, there, and there, so. is, there is one. that We have a little donation box that people could donate money into. The only thing that I really didn't, um, what I don't like about that one is that you can't, you can't track where the money yeah. is coming from, right. from yeah. what like program to, or anything. I like to receipt everybody out to know that the money's accounted for. Mm -hmm. So if that was the case, I mean, we could do something like that on my office door so it's not out in the open. Right. To where people can actually put it in an envelope. This came put from. it in an envelope. But they, they run their class, they get their donations in, put it in an envelope, right? Clogging class, put the date on, and then drop it in your, in your slot. And that is a good idea. Yeah. I can absolutely look, in, look into doing that. It could still be tracked with the um, with the envelope, and I could track it myself with yeah. what's been donated. Right. So. Okay. Um, does anybody else have any? 
You got anything else to rain on his parade about? No, it's not sure. rain on his parade. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's I like it. So, Mayor, Mayor, uh, I'm going to defer that. Uh, I'm going to defer that. Uh, I'm We don't currently have one, um, but we could create them. I, I kind of don't like a volunteer collecting money for us because you never know. There's no kind of documentation that shows she had 20, 20, um, 20 participants and we got Is two dollars. Is it possible to create an internal control yes, we can. to do yeah, that? Yeah, we could. Yeah. yeah, so I'd like to explore that issue more because to me it sounds like those volunteers are collecting money on behalf of the village and if we can create a, a, an internal control process to do that, I, I see value in that. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not necessarily that they're doing business, it's that they're um, soliciting on behalf of the village of Rio Doso. So let, let us explore that, um, look at that issue, and then come back with a reasonable approach. Perfect. Well, I've got to step out for my thing. And uh, Manager Dodge, um, what they what I have sign-in sheets for every class that goes on, so I, I have tabs on how many people were in these classes, so I can track the amounts to match the. Yeah, well so it sounds team. like you have you know some internal controls process set up, but let's make sure that we get our finance director to to validate that process and then bring it back to council, so that you know the the important thing and the whole the part of this is they get um, hit by their constituents. And if they don't have a reasonable explanation on how things are, ha are handled, that's when the questions come up and they can't answer, and then it becomes a uncomfortable situation. So let's let's develop that internal process so that we can give a reasonable explanation to the governing body and then continue forward. Yeah. Well, and things may run perfect right now. You may have the best best people over there, but we have to look at three <coughs> years from now. All of a sudden, you get some right. unscrupulous person coming in there, and it's like, well, yeah, half me, because it's donation. So you have your list, so it's 20 people in the class, but it's not a set fee. So it could be any amount. It could be nothing. It could be $200. Uh, it just depends on how much people want to donate. And so. Mayor Pro Tem Counselor, and it, it's a valid point. You know, you've yes. got people over there. There's a, an appearance that people are conducting business. Mm -hmm. Are they doing it appropriately? Correct. You know, and if, if the answer is no, those people are there volunteering, and they're collecting a fee on behalf of the village of Rio Doso for the community center, and there's internal controls in, process, in place so that we can ensure all the money is being deposited. End of story. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because, okay. yeah, when we go use the exercise equipment, you know, shipping, right, we throw that $5 in that little wooden box on the desk and stuff and just knowing that, okay, yeah, we're donating, giving a donation. But that's going to the department. We do sign in for our activity that what, when we're there, what day and what time. But as far as looking at everything else coming in, that would be very, very instrumental to, to keep an account from that. It, it reminds me of an old boss I used to have. Um, I don't know if any of y'all know him, Bobby Bailey. Mm -hmm. This was while well, Susan remembers him. He would go over to the tennis courts and raid the uh, coin machine for the <laughs> lights and stuff there just so he could go get a Coke and stuff like that. <laughs> and I would hit him up. Hey, man, buy me a Coke or, you know, give me some beer after work. And that never happened. But yeah. well, the, the military also had a famous saying, in God we trust, and all others talk, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> And uh, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Manager Dodge, um, the memorandums of understanding that we do have in place that all of these uh, volunteers sign to actually schedule their classes in with them. In the in the document itself, it states that they they would collect the donations and give them to the center, you know, by this time of each month, and they would give a a written deal showing, you know, of what why how they were acquired, how many people and all of the information on that, if we needed to utilize that, we can go back and forth on that one to see. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. And Anthony, that's great. So we'll continue to work on that just and bring a report back to the council. Yeah. Sounds Thank great. Good job. Thank you. Um, okay, so anybody, nobody else has any, on, any further on that one? No. Okay, so uh, goal number four was... Uh, Village and area residents have transit options. Uh, strategic plan item was transportation, improved transportation services for the area. 
um, March 2021, um, we had finalized the transportation initiative and collaborated with Z Therapy Center, Z Trans Outfit. Um, the systems, uh, in my opinion, still does need to identify pickup areas that are needed and those that are not. We recently rode with them to, to identify some spots that were utilized because we talked about putting um, benches that Rodney uh, from Parks and Rec has there, putting benches at these stop, these stop uh, places because uh, I see a lot of people around town that are just standing there and they can yeah. be standing there for 30 minutes. And um, we were trying to identify spots. So in my opinion, they still need to um, identify spots for, the, for pickups that are utilizing some that are not. Um, we were... We were meeting. We were meeting constantly with them. You know, pretty much like once a month there for a while. But when COVID hit, all the meetings stopped as well. So my my plan in 2022 is to start these meetings again with Z Trans if they're allowed to, because I know they had their own set of rules that they weren't allowed to meet like that anymore. Until you know, until they got the go ahead on that. Um, so restarting those board meetings meetings would be beneficial to identify these things and further have these discussions on the the benches, and I just think that like with the Z-Trans time, stop time should be on these benches too because a lot of people don't know what times what times the stops right. are unless they have a brochure or something. Right. And I know that the, the website wasn't very clear on some of this stuff. So that's my plan to actually meet with these guys again and actually talk about these things. So that way the village of Ridoso can actually get their input, give their input on this as well. So, um, now, on the benches, Anthony, what I recall, because we used to have, uh, I think it was a realtor, it might have been Gary Lynch, mm -hmm. this was years ago, yeah. that had his concrete benches on on the right-of-way, because there were some at the park and at the swim, you know, across from the swimming pool. Then the highway department came back and saying, you can't have those, because he donated them to the park, you know, and we didn't really have any use for them, but... Um, so I would check into that as far as location because I agree with you over there by the hospital um, on our on our median that little island there would be an ideal spot even though the hospital's way over there um, but at least you could get to um, the doctor's offices uh, Citibank that complex and stuff all right there but again there's so much feet off the road as highway department. Yes, um, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, the uh, uh, Joe Harden that runs the Zia Therapy, the Z Trans. Right. We had rode around with him and Manager Dodge. He was part of that where we were trying to identify these spots because some you got to go through DOT and some were right of ways that for some of the businesses that owned them. So we were trying to identify those spots, and he did write down these different areas, and he was going to try to get in touch with everybody to find out what can and can be done. I, I think uh, Samantha Mendez here was with us as well. So he was going to be on top of that to try to figure out where benches can be placed and who needs to approve them and how he needs to go about doing that. So we're just waiting to hear back from him on stuff like that. Good. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, hopefully we get to start those board meetings again with them. And uh, and that's, that's the tactical plan I have for 2022. It's just ongoing because that system, it's always going to need uh, different ideas and stuff because the village is growing so much and that there was a the affordable housing they wanted to put a stop right there at one point so it's just growing you're going to need stops added here some taken away from here so that's just going to be an ongoing process so and how's his staffing doing for his drivers um he has the way i'm aware of it here at the center though they utilize the center for office space and uh they look like they're fully staffed now. I have not heard that they needed any more. Okay. There were a lot of them in and out of there, so. It seems like quite, quite a bit. They're having to shut down a route for a day or two or three or, or something, probably a COVID uh, Yeah, that's situation. what my sister referred to. Yeah, yeah, it seems like the route between the inn and Alamogordo gets shut down a lot. Yep. Um, so, so people that are, are relying on that transportation corridor. And then occasionally up here, there's some issues. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Councilor Coughlin, um, yes, they, there was a few issues that they had with COVID. One would catch some here, and then they would shut down, and then another one would catch it. So that, unfortunately, there is that problem, and it, that's going to be continuous. So they do, and I, and they, they uh, so you just never know. So, you know, 
it no, does and they stop the routes. they don't have a whole bunch of backup drivers to fill in, so they kind of don't have much of a choice. I was hoping that maybe in negotiating with them on changing their, their policy because they require all their drivers to have CDLs, but in the buses we have here, you don't need a CDL license to that's, operate them. Because, oh, really? because of the passenger consistency. Well, but they're, they're carrying for hire. We're not. There's a difference. I, I don't think that makes a difference on this. On the caring for hire or paying, it's just the the capacity size of the van. Mayor, um, maybe on Mayor the Pitt, councilors, we can look into you know what their requirements are, and they make a recommendation to them. Right. Yeah. So we'll take a look at that. Because that's I you know just like like Tim was saying, they were always short staff, and and having while well, even our regular uh, buses, school buses. They're, you oh, know, God. way behind and going in. I mean, uh, Mark told me that I'll hire you on the spot. And I said, I don't got my CDL. I said, I don't matter right now. You'll get it later. And that's what I was thinking, you know, get people working and operating and I see get Mark it later. I see Mark days driving a bus. Yeah, yeah. They, they both, him and Mike. I used to have a CDL. <laughs> well, go ahead I, I drove a school bus. <laughs> yeah. And then you had that legal issue and they took it away. <laughs> Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Councilors, um, I know that Joe Harden has been looking into that, and from what I understood, the last thing that I had heard from him, but I could make sure, is that they didn't have to have CDL light drive. Oh, okay. Because that was that was wrong. Because whenever the the center used to do transportation, as you know, right, we didn't require CDLs because they're the same type of buses, single axle, right, right, the right. weight, uh, the right. and whatnot. The, so I, from what I understand, I can get back to you on that, but I don't think they require CDLs anymore. I just remember them that, you know, harping on that. We require CDL. And mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, but yeah. thank you. Good luck. You can't get CDL drivers anyway, so. Okay, so goal number five, um, environmental stewardship is in place. Anthony, I think uh, Mayor Pro Temp, I think Ron had a comment. I'll wait, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, I'll wait to Anthony's final one. I just wanted to comment in, <coughs> on Anthony's okay. success with the grant, so. Okay. Um, environmental stewardship is embraced by the Redoso community. Um, one of the strategic plan items was Central Volunteer Hub. Um, create a Central Volunteer Hub with information about volunteerism. Hire and train a new RSVP coordinator. Uh, the progress that we've done there is, you know, we've, we got shut down just like the, the retired and senior volunteer program, that's that's the name of the whole deal. Um, the, a lot of the volunteer stations had to shut down because of COVID. And as of as of now, um, there are uh, 14 of the 18 volunteer stations are back open. So they're up and running and everything's going great. Um, we actually were able to add another couple of volunteer stations. We added the backpack program that Ms. Litterman was talking about. And um, in the Episcopal Church, they send out meals to, to the public. Yes. Um, so we're able to add those. The way that program is run is um, we, we follow performance measures, which they measure. Uh, we got to follow a certain, certain guideline, and our main performance measure is called Healthy Futures, which, which relies on a lot of food distribution. And so we have the Meals on Wheels program. We have the food bank, the Christian services, the, uh, the backpack program, the Episcopal Church, and that's where we get a lot of our performance measures. We're able to meet those goals to be able to get the grant for this. Got it. And it's through those five stations. We have another, a few other stations that are just kind of in a catch-all that, that are under our program. And um, the good thing about Amber Word has come on as a new RSVP coordinator, and uh, she's been able to get a lot of these extra ones like the backpack program involved and get them under the program so that we, got, we show a lot more meals going out, a lot more people getting, people getting served in the community. Um, our grant uh, right now it's written to do 150 volunteers at um, 17 stations. We have 250 volunteers at 18 stations. So that's how well we are doing further than further than we need to. So Amber has really taken that program and it's taken off, and she's real good with people. So she can entice them all to join up with us, join up with us, and she's gathered a lot of volunteers there. So that program is up and running again. There are a couple stations that are still shut down. Um, Mescalero Care Center, we have volunteers that come from our community to go out there and help. We're helping uh, 
people that stay out there doing their nails, singing to them, reading to them, just doing different random things, doing their hair, just volunteering to just help these people make, feel better about themselves since they're out there at that, that care facility. They're one of the ones that are not allowed of people to come in. And another one is the, muse, the, the museum in the Downs, the Hubbard Museum. They are still closed, and I don't know what the status is on that one, but they're, they're one of the ones that are still closed down. So we've had a few of them that have not opened back up, but the ones that we do have opened up, the, the, the volunteerism there is just massive. We also do have another list of volunteer stations that are in the county and some that we've actually approached to get under our program. Um, and they, they kind of do their own thing, but we just let them know that we have a list. So whenever somebody calls the center to say, you know, I want to volunteer somewhere, we'll give them our list as well as the other ones. So that way we're not trying to not just keep our volunteers to ourselves. If there's another place, you know, that, that needs volunteers, we actually will let them know, like, well, there's these other stations too if they who might be interested because they also need help as well. So, uh, so we give them that information. So we like to try to be the volunteer hub so that way they know where to go to actually send them over our way if they want to volunteer because we have a lot of lists and who to contact. We put that together back whenever we were doing all these goals. So, so we do that for the people too. So the more the stations like for food, backpack, so you go out and what's good for you is good for us, basically, because then you can get that grant if you bring enough stations on that would be for that food and drink or whatever. Right. The, the, our, the Retired and Senior Volunteer Program, um, what they offer is uh, we can offer them mileage reimbursement now. We right. weren't able to do that before. Right. So we let them know that, you know, you're volunteering. Let's get you mileage reimbursement. Let's, you know, uh, prices of gas is, is high. You know, um, the wear and tear on your car is high, so that you can get you mileage reimbursement. And we also give them um, supplemental insurance. Right. While they're on the job, whatever insurance, they're, they're the, whatever their insurance. For instance, we had a woman that actually hurt herself. It was at, here at the public library. She fell and broke her neck. She, uh, oh she was able to, and this is before Diane was... I don't know if you were there, but... It's not recent. You know, it's been a few years back, but... It's like, oh my God. Her insurance only covered so much. Well, then the, the retired and senior volunteer insurance that we had, they supplemented thousands for her. Her and her husband wouldn't have been able to do it if we didn't offer that wow. insurance. So we tell them, be insured by us. You know, we have the insurance. We go after it every year. We get the grant to pay for it. So we insure all of these volunteers that are out there. That's one of the, the good things about the program. And um, also we do recognition, um, yeah. recognition events. We just had a luncheon, appreciation luncheon in December, right after the mixer that the village we also did. So the volunteers were, they were happy. You know, they're, they're being noticed out there. So uh, we do the appreciation. We give them gifts, recognition gifts. We buy, we bought them work shirts recently. Oh, yeah. So we've been handing those out. So they get, they get gifts throughout the year. Uniforms we're able to give them now. So. We'll be doing more of that, and this is the first time we've received that that federal funding to do these extra items. So this is the first year we're trying to figure out how to utilize it and what's going to be left. So next year is going to be exciting because we're going to be able to offer them a lot more with the money that we have. We just didn't know where to put it or what, because it was just like, okay, how do you do this? It was just a quick thing, and it's been going good. We have a lot of people out there that are getting the mileage reimbursement, and they love it. Some of them are getting the hundred and $80 checks to back for the mileage because it's so rural. They're traveling from Capitan way over here. or They're using their vehicles to do the backpack, to delivering food. And right. there's a lot of those items there that the RSVP program is able to give back to. So we try to get all the volunteers on board saying, hey, join the program because that's what we get the funding for. We can, we can have 400 volunteers. We don't, we're not trying to seek them out to just add them. We want numbers. We want numbers. We don't want that. We have the numbers. Right. We just want them on board to be able to get the extra stuff that they can get from the right. program. And hopefully within a few years, we'll be able to offer them more. I, and I do know that some, uh, most of those uh, ladies <clears throat> from the backpack program, when they get their checks, they give it back to the backpack program. Yeah, they, they donate it. They donate it, it back. They don't, pay it yeah. Forward and, so, yeah. you know, that's, that's, that's pretty, pretty sharp good. too, yeah. And there are some out there that actually we tell them about it. We don't need it. They don't need it. There's people that are well off that don't need the money. Yeah. They just want something to do, and uh, they deny it. We, we thought a lot more would come out wanting it, like, yeah, yeah. 
Um, but yeah, there are those people out there yeah. that are just too giving. They want to give back to the community. Yeah. Well, maybe they haven't thought about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought that that was a that's great a good idea. Yeah. That's yeah. A, a so, real good. So Anthony, if you have somebody who's already donated, uh, you know, volunteering for one of these organizations or one of these centers that you've got, um, how can they get signed up through you and still continue to do that, that same donating the, the, of their time and, and efforts? Uh, what they can do... Uh, Contact Amber? Yeah, they, that's how we work it. I, everybody that that actually calls to the center, I refer them all to Amber. So okay. that way she has her list of what she needs to do. Because I'm assuming like the Humane Society is one mm -hmm. that you've got. Yes. So if people are already volunteering for the Humane Society, they can come over, get signed up through you guys, adds another number, even though you're not looking for numbers, but provides them that, that those benefits as well for the work they're already doing. Mayor Protein, uh, Councilor Coughlin, yes, that that is how... We send it out to the volunteer station managers. Uh -huh. we, we give them all the information and we tell them to let the volunteers know. There's some volunteers that don't want to sign up. They're like, no, I don't want to, nobody needs to know what I'm doing. Right. I don't right. want to sign up, but it's out there. Right. All the volunteer stations know about it and it's been emailed to all of them. Even the volunteers themselves have re received this, all of this, and even my own listings of, of uh, seniors that go to the center that are not on the program, the information's out there. So hopefully it would entice them to go volunteer. Right. Because the the nonprofits around this area they need they need the help, especially like Mills on Wheels program they need drivers out there. You know, there's a lot of programs out there that need the help. You know, they they have a lot, but they could use more. So we try to get all volunteers on board, and try to use that as like, a, yeah, come on board, you get this and this and this, and you could be helping out the community too. Because sure. so if the information's out there, but yes, they can just contact uh, the Rudolph Community Center and get them in line with Amber, the RSVP coordinator, and she will set them up and get them going. Great program. It is a really good program. And and I'm glad that the Village of Redosa participates in it. Um, I know the library, right, Denise? We have volunteers for the bookstore. But we used to have people over at the police department. Chief, we, we don't have any senior volunteers that would help out there. I mean, that was years ago. Um, so I would suggest Manager Dodge that, you know, approach the directors and seeing if they're needing senior volunteers and maybe creating some more workstations within the village. Um, and, that, and that's what that's what's needed. I mean, even if it's four hours, because we used to have one when we had a morning reception area, uh -huh. there was a senior there every Friday morning. Um, to answer the phone and direct people in, and she loved it. I mean, she she was having a blast seeing everybody, and it gets them out, and they get, you know, so it's where they're there. So, so that's what I would encourage. Um, um, Mayor Pro Tem, counselors, there is another program out there. I just wanted to say this: uh, we have an employee from Goodwill. She works with us part time, 20, 25, 30 hours a week. And that's what she does. She's our receptionist. Without her, I don't know how we handle it. Oh, my gosh. Right. She's, she's greeting the public. She does that. And Cheryl with Human Resources, she she knows about all of that. So if the village is really interested in that, Goodwill will send employees to work part-time to okay. handle it. Reception desk, send you. Huh? We have a nice reception desk. <laughs> <laughs> um, I said that because the company we were furniture from sent us like a reception desk and we're trying to send it back and they won't take it back. They don't want to take it back. <laughs> you never know, we, we, uh, it's pretty nice. <laughs> check it out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we get all the hand me down, so heck yeah. Hey, yeah. It'd be brand new. There we go. <clears throat> look into that. <laughs> you do a great job. We really appreciate it. It's well, thank uh, you all. Uh, I, I like the name Community Center too. Uh, Sometimes, you know, the, when you put a senior community center, I, I don't know, it puts a, 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 another connotation on it, even though it's a lot of seniors that are going to it. it this way, it just, I don't know, it just, it's a more, I don't know, the word, uh, I don't know, uh, it's inviting. It's more, to me, it's just more inviting. So. You're just sensitive now. I, <laughs> no, I, I'm like, oh, my God. It's from Tim, a counselor. Uh, let him in. Um, yeah, it is. It's been, since we've changed the name, the place was utilized a lot more. 
I think it was more, more welcoming than most yeah. people. I'm not going to that senior center. Yeah. yeah. I'm, not I, a senior. I'm not a senior. Nobody wants to say that. But well, Ron and I ordered off the senior menu every chance we get. Nobody ever calls us out on it. <laughs> <laughs> we, we do the I, young at heart. So. I use the, yeah, the young at heart. <laughs> I, I would hesitate to say it's, it's magical. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it is magical. Okay, well, if anybody Thank else has any so questions much. on Well, I, I'm looking more. at goal number six, but well, we stop at five, but that's one important goal that I appreciate that you've expanded oh, yeah. that a hundredfold with the nutrition and stuff there for the, the yes. seniors and the community and the breakfasts and lunches. So I, I do thank you for that, Anthony. Yeah, that's our goal number six. Um, it also offers community service for all residents and employees, um, lunches and breakfast provided weekly. See, we, we were able to, we do a couple of breakfasts a week, um, one lunch a week, and uh, a lot of, you know, we charge a dollar, two dollars, but the way we supplement that is with the donations we get from all these other, we get those donations, and that helps us to buy stuff, tables, um, chairs, equipment, whatever it takes, food, because food, I mean, we pay out, we pay out a lot of money on food, food's expensive yeah. now. Of course. And without all of these other people putting into the system, we wouldn't be able to do it. So we're lucky like that. And we have Albertsons and Thriftway that help donate food to us too. So we want to put out there, that those two help us out a lot. So we're able to pick up food from them and, and make more of our meals. So, um, so that's awesome. Our uh, tactical plan for that is just to continue to acquire donations from, from everywhere and donations from the public and keep the mills going and make, make the mills better and possibly later if we had more help we could offer more meals but we're just with our yeah, one helper sure. we've been we've been out a helper because she she had surgery and um, so she's been out so it's just been a couple of us there so we're just running fast and especially when one of us is gone and the other day everybody was gone with COVID and I was there by myself cooking, cleaning, <laughs> cleaning toilets, mopping, paperwork. All of it all. And that's why I missed a couple of the, the meetings because I was over there. I was yeah. stuck doing that. And, and then I had COVID before that. So, yeah, we're, we're, our, our uh, employees are perfect when we're all there. Somebody's gone. We're running. So we're lucky to have the, the other helper from Parks and Rec help us out. And like, like Rodney had said, it's just, it's just enough. But... Sometimes people are gone, and now I just see it because our custodian usually she takes a day off here, a day off there, and that's easy. You could go in there for her real quick, or she'll catch up the next day. But when somebody's off for weeks at a time, that's when you know, like, okay, maybe we right. do need somebody because what if something happens? And that we're in that time right now. So. Right. But that's our goal is to continue to just offer things through radio advertisements, rack cards, emails, and tell them about our programs, our meals, to get more people involved there. We could. We handle it well, but we, we could use more people. But then that comes more employees. I'm like, we're slow. We're slowly picking up, and now it's now it's winter time, so we're kind of slower. But summertime comes around, I bet we're just gonna it it picks up speed every year. So good. it's gonna be exciting to see how it well, happens. Good job, so Anthony. Cool. And Anthony, there's still no food programs that will provide you funding or food resources like USDA or anything like that. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Councilor Coughlin. Um, I actually, there was one, a couple that I tried to look at. I tried to go after the Meals on, the Meals on Wheels program the, through AAA, the area agency on aging and funds that. They wouldn't fund me because I'm too close to the other center. Right. Uh. My, my future goal for that center is hopefully expand that kitchen, expand the dining room, and hopefully get them to produce those meals out of our center instead of the other one. Uh. That would, we have the activity, they have the meals. That's my... That's my future goal. I don't say it much, but if I can right. get that center bigger, right. we could put that at central location, and, and it would be massive. So that I tried to seek out that one. Um, the USDA, I don't remember what it was. I seeked out that one before, but I don't remember what, what it was about it that it, it wasn't going to work with us. Yeah, because I know like the commodities, like that ham that, that I brought over that right. time. You know, ham and cheese, every, every summer we get tons of that. Um, and, and so I didn't know, and especially I know having relatives in the past that were, were older, um, they would get the free block of cheese or they'd get this or that. It was all USDA commodity foods. So I didn't know if there was a way, because you're serving an, uh, the senior population for the most part, if there was a way for, for you guys to be able to get that as well. Um, Mayor Pro Tem, Councilor Coughlin, I, I, may, I need to get with you later and figure out how you do that 
and because it would help every bit every bit of supplement helps our program because that's yeah. stuff that we can use as you know you all donated to the yeah. boys and girls club all that ham and we've been utilizing it they love it we'll, i mean we'll, heck yeah we'll add another pile of ham to your plate i mean it we'll get it. more this summer so um i'll reach out to uh, uh, to my contacts with the state and see if they can help me to to find something for you that would be awesome yeah. thank you Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, sir. Um, Anthony, when's the last time you actually bid on on a on a site? You know, because the process with agency and aging is actually a, a bidding on on the contractual services. Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Councilors, uh, Manager Dodge. Um, I didn't actually bid through the program, but because of my connections that I had working at the Redoso Downs Senior Center before coming to the community center. I had known the people above all of that, so I reached out to them is how I found out and that they're the ones that I can't even remember names. This was 16, 17 years ago. Um, or not not quite, this is when I took over, so maybe like eight, nine years ago. But um, they're the ones that told me that they wouldn't fund two centers in the same area. And right to, to be honest, right now we couldn't even do it if we wanted to because we don't have the kitchen equipment to even produce that. I'm trying to get this center bigger and then go for those options because we need more equipment. With the numbers that you're seeing, I, I think, uh, you know, we can make a case for that and we can approach the agency on aging and, you know, lobby to get a center if you feel that the numbers and the need are there. So. Absolutely. We can definitely look at that. I don't have a problem approaching that. I know Ron's worked with the program before. And yes, and, you know, they have the three components. You do the homebound, the congregate, and then the transportation services, and you do an RFP and you bid out on all of those components, so. Yeah, and I know that uh, the county is the one that handles all of the senior centers. They're all under the county umbrella. So they're the ones that's being funneled through them. So I, I don't know. We'd have to really look into that right. again. But that's that was my goal, to make that center bigger and invite that program into there and really expand that center. Yeah. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of the council, uh, Tim and I, we, we know uh, some of the administrative uh, uh, there with the with the uh, aging long-term services and they really talk highly of, of Anthony. He really has built those uh, relationships with that organization, with that uh, agency. And, and when it, when he talks about, Oh, I need a few more dollars for this. So he gets it. You know, he's That's always great. Getting, like, you know, they need to he, call back and I need a little bit. So he's always getting the money. So I really applaud him for that. So he really yes, is yes. very, very loyal to the center and takes it to pride and, and he, he's always just upbeat about it. So I do recognize and I thank you, Anthony. Thank yeah, we you. appreciate it very much. You do Anthony, do a good the, job. The Episcopal Church thanks you once again. Uh, we eventually will get the kitchen done, I think, but it's a slow walk. <laughs> but, but as a result of your generosity in allowing us to use that facility, what it's translated to is between 150 and 300 meals on the second Monday of each month. So yes. it and we couldn't have done it without you. There wouldn't have been a way to pull that off. Councilor Jackson, we appreciate that, and we, and we love having you there. That's what it's for. That's what we say. Bring it over there. That's what the center's for. Thank you. Community center. Exactly. So. I like senior center. That's what I like. Until Anthony said, yeah, we could years. still get some of that agency on aging funding. You're, you're talking about Nancy right? and all those. Nancy, oh, yeah. Yeah. That's the name. Yeah. It used to be called the Adult Recreation Center. Yes. That was a long time ago. They didn't like that. I don't. I think Rotary wouldn't donate the new van unless they changed the name. If I remember that right. Well, it used to be called the library. Oh yeah, yeah that's exactly yeah. right. That was. It the was library. the library. Yeah, that sure But was. still, the back half in the backyard was senior. the senior center. Okay, that's all I have. For Thanks, you. Anthony. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you Appreciate your patience. Time. Tell I was trying to rush thing. it earlier. Uh, <laughs> um, next, I believe we have the convention center with Mr. Roberts. Did you get coached enough all morning, you think? Oh, well, I'm not going to say anything, but my uh, team leader seemed to have skedaddled on me. Uh -oh. so. Yeah, where is she? <laughs> no, oh, she's she's right there. right there. Rodney took off, so... Oh, he ate. He's gone. <laughs> yeah, he's Tim, napping. Tim would say he so wanted you to sit with him there. Wow. Oh, you're fine. Oh. Yeah. My glasses are falling out too much. I can't take it anymore. Uh, right. Mayor Pro Tem, counselors, thank you so much. 
Um, as you guys know, I'm Tim Roberts, and I'm overseeing the, uh, the convention center, the radio station, and the Wingfield House Heritage Center. i got to keep saying that out loud over and over <laughs> so we get committed to memory is what it's being called now. So um, I'm going to start off today uh, talking about the convention center. <clears throat> um, the purpose statement for the convention center is as follows. Uh, the Rudoso Convention Center is home to many events which enhance the local economy and quality of life in Ruidoso. The primary focus is on booking conventions, conferences, government associate or groups, associations, and large special events. The convention center generates revenue for the village lodgers tax and GRT and provides space for training and community services, including being a designated Red Cross shelter, which I realize now that I'm saying that out loud, I probably need to talk to Anthony about getting some training on that. <laughs> so that's something else. So uh, that is the current... Uh, Purpose statement, I did not make any changes to that this, this year. Sounds good. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so uh, the next page um, is the um, organizational chart for actually the entire, I guess, division or whatever you might want to call it that I'm helping to, to oversee at the moment. So on the left-hand side there is the convention center. Um, right now we have an office manager, uh, Bernadine Herrera, who you know also serves as our admin aide for that department. She's kind of wears a lot of hats and helps out a lot. In fact, today she's pretty much running the place while I'm here because we have some big events this, uh, this week, which is great. Um, then we have uh, two uh, convention techs, Luis Nava and David Salazar. Um, and then we do have one currently vacant position, uh, Jeff, who's now with the IT department, moved over there during the pandemic response. Um, and we are looking to fill that, um, and I'll mention or go talk more about that in a minute. Um, but that is the, uh, the organizational chart for that portion of what I am, have the privilege of leading. So moving on to the um, tactical plan. Um, our first um, item here um, is related to uh, economic development um, in the village, and um, it's specifically to continue, and it's a, it's a reoccurring goal, to continue to grow our customer base to reflect A-type groups such as government associations and multi-day events. And um, what we mean by A-type groups are groups that have significant impact on the economy. So uh, outside groups, conventions, conferences that come and they stay here, they contribute to lodger's tax, they contribute significantly to GRT. And uh, that, that formula that we use um, to kind of figure out what that impact is, it's, it's significant. Um, so you get a family of four or five here for a couple of days, and the impact they have in the local economy is, is pretty significant. So, um, and we, we uh, present those numbers um, monthly to the Lodgers Tax Committee, kind of based on our events, and um, then, of course, how that um, translates into actual money back into the economy and so forth. Um, the responsible parties for that are, of course, myself and my staff at the um, convention center, um, and then also our partners at the RC, uh, um, our uh, Rio Convention Center and the MCM Elegante. Um, they hold the contract um, for marketing for the uh, convention center as well as um, the sales manager. Tracy Crawford is actually employed by them through a contract, so we work in, in concert um, with them. They also hold the um, contract for the um, liquor license, and that's grandfathered in um, from many years ago, and the uh, catering license as well. They, they hold the actual health permit and all that stuff. Um, but of course, we also have like a kind of an overflow um, list of um, caterers that we that people can use there that are approved. They hold business licenses within the village. They obviously have all the permits and things they need. So we're sure that they're um, good. So that's kind of the team um, that we um, use for marketing and growing the convention center. I will add to that um, now our director of tourism um, is going to be a, a major portion of that too. And um, uh, Elizabeth knows I know this, but she comes from a large convention background. So I have, um, you know, I'm sure I'm going to be picking her brain about how we can expand what we're doing there and reach new demographics and markets. So I'm very excited about that. Um, the resources we use for this are uh, largely lodger's tax in the form of that, that contract for the uh, MCM Elegante. Um, and um, we're also, and actually we're already um, moving forward with this, um, we're getting some new software, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and then the start date for this is obviously um, this year, and this is really perpetual. We want to see this grow over time. Um, and as you can probably imagine, the numbers are not over the last two years have not been great just because of the 
the nature of the health crisis and the pandemic response, but we are bouncing back pretty pretty solidly at this point. Our, our dates are pretty full. In fact, I was texting with Bernadine earlier about some dates for an event for uh, Rodney and Recreation, and I kept getting the nope, 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 so things are filling up fast. Well, good. But yeah, we're, we're excited. So, um, uh, and a lot of repeat business and a lot of folks coming back. Um, this week we had the uh, New Mexico Hay Growers Association and the Cotton Growers Association uh, adaptive ski program up uh, from Ski Apache, and then um, next week we have the uh, Southern, Southeastern New Mexico Dental Association, all repeat business that love coming to Ruidoso, and we're happy to have them back now that it's safe to do so. Um, so in terms of how we're going to um, kind of attack this, the progress over the last couple or last year, um, we renewed our contract with the MCM Elegante for marketing and sales support. Um, so we've continued that um, relationship and are growing that as well. Um, we've hired a new convention center manager, myself, and um, a tourism director as well. So um, we will definitely be working in concert, all three of us, the sales manager, myself, and the tourism director to really push the, uh, the um, convention center as a destination. Um, so in terms of our goals or our plans for this next year, um, We've, we've started to, communication is key when you're working with these, you know, multiple groups trying to all do the same thing and do it well. So we've, uh, we've instituted monthly or uh, weekly meeting just to make sure we're all on the same page in terms of um, how we're marketing, the groups coming in, and things of that uh, nature. Um, one of the things I noticed when we came in that is that our booking software was a little outdated. Um, as a historian, I do appreciate good dusty files, but um, you know we needed something a little bit more um, up to date. So I made a request um, to look into some new software, and we're actually having our kickoff meeting with that company uh, next week. Um, and this will allow us a couple of things. One, everybody will be able to see everything, um, so we can even give you guys access or other departments to see what's going on at the convention center so we can align our events and things to make sure we're not stepping on each other's toes or complimenting each other, rather. Um, but then it also has a bunch of built-in tools, uh, things like um, analytics about and capturing information about people who are coming. Um, so we talked about being able to send out information um, to folks coming to the conventions. We can set that up. Um, it will give us leads on additional um, and new groups based on who have come in and things of that nature. But the big point was to get everybody on the same page figuratively and literally so we're all moving in the same um, direction. So I'm excited about getting that started. Um, Mayor, and Mayor Tim, before you move on, mm -hmm. Is, is it uh, does it have the capabilities of becoming a community calendar or is it just for the convention center? Um, so what we can do a couple of things um, and I've talked to Yvonne about this we can actually use it for you know pretty much any uh, room in the village so if she wanted to use it to book this room or the um, executive um, conference center we can use that. Also um, it ports out to just about every major calendar type. So if you guys are a Google Calendar or Outlook Calendar, I can just send you a widget and it'll just update seamlessly. So we can share this with the racetrack, we can share it with Parks and Rec, we can share it with whoever we need to in the county um, and their folks so everybody can see exactly what's going on there and it integrates seam seamlessly with it. So, and it automatically updates, which is nice. That's one of the things right now, you know, I've got to call Bernadine to find out, you know, if something changes, She's basically got to tell me that it changes. So this will help everybody. So you could use it as a community yeah, calendar as absolutely. well? Absolutely. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. So it'll, it'll have multi, multi functions. And there's a lot more to it. Um, it also allows, you know, eventually we can actually work our contracting into it. We can, uh, it's like a project management software. So we can kind of, from the minute somebody walks in as a lead, we can track that all the way to the end of the event. We can do invoicing through it eventually. And I'll, you know, if we get to that point, I can work with Judy and stuff on that. Anyway, it'll be a, kind of a one stop shop for us and keep everything nice and organized so we can also pull data back to actually look at what we're doing. So pretty excited about that. Um, and then, you know, working with the tourism director and the Elegante staff, um, you know, we are going to be looking at a more comprehensive approach to marketing the um, convention center um, and making sure that the convention center is integrated into the existing uh, marketing for the village as far as tourism is concerned. Um, so that's a big part of it. It's a beautiful facility. Um, and it's, it's extremely valuable to the community, and uh, we need to get it out in front of people. So mm -hmm. very rarely do we have anybody, in fact, not, certainly not since I've been here, that come in, comes into an event and says, man, this place is really terrible. <laughs> so it's, it's a great facility. So, 
So Tim, uh, Manager Dodge is like doesn't like acronyms a lot. What yes. Is, what does MCM stand for? Uh, help me Music out. Music City Mall. There you go. I didn't know it meant nope. anything. I thought it was just part of the name. Uh, I was putting you on the spot. No, I don't. That's a good. I don't know. <laughs> Music City so. Mall. Yeah, that's where they started it. Oh, okay. Yeah, and so they called it the MCM Elegante. And okay. I was eight years, years old when I learned that, oh. so there we go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. I had no idea. All right, um, moving on to uh, goal number two, um, again, tied to economic development. Um, uh, this is this is a goal, and it's again it's ongoing and perpetual. But using the convention center to promote all tourist-related information, um, and kind of becoming a mini information center of sort. Um, and uh, again, that's really my um, my staff's um, responsibility as well as in con uh, coordination with team tourism. Um, the resources we need um, some minor investment, obviously. Um, our team working together um, from team tourism, working with our marketing uh, contractor with the agency to get the information we need. Um, we have talked about um, doing some casework for exhibit space, and that kind of goes in line with some of the stuff we're doing at the Wingfield House Heritage Center, um, kind of highlighting some of Rudos's culture and history, or some of our, you know, partners and things. I can think of ways to, to get information out, you know, working with the Forest Service or the BLM or Department of Cultural Affairs from Fort Stanton or Lincoln about getting rotating exhibits into these spaces that we manage to, to promote what's going on in the village and, and elsewhere in terms of amenities. Um, uh, we, I, we are looking at some additional digital um, signage and displays, um, and I can talk more about that. I realize it's not really in here, um, but the uh, the Billy the Kid Byway Visitor Center, um, you know, is is owned by the village and managed through a contract, at least for the personnel and the the operation um, by the Chamber of Commerce. Um, but the uh, the exhibits that are there right now, and and I say this in all you know sincerity, are criminally outdated. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, to a point where they're almost, I mean, they're sending people in, you know, wrong directions and things like that. So we need to update that. And um, uh, Village Manager Dodge asked me to look into what it would take to do that. And I plan on presenting a proposal to Lodgers Tax Committee on the 7th to update that exhibit. Um, what, I'm, what I would call temporarily, uh, we, we need to probably a look at some point at doing the whole thing and really doing a comprehensive redo, but um, doing what we can now kind of in the short term um, to at least get the information updated so that folks know what's going on um, and aren't, aren't being sent to things that don't even operate anymore or exist. So um, we're looking forward to that. And as part of that, um, we're looking at some uh, digital displays for that um, facility. Um, and that would go on beyond the visitor center itself. Um, these displays are um, uh, web-based digital signage that I could work with Rodney or any other department um, or um, private public partnerships that we work with to get basically advertising on for events and things like that. And we could put these basically anywhere. Any smart TV could be used for it. All you have to do is plug it in. It costs about $15 a month per screen. We could even offer this up to uh, private businesses if they wanted to put it inside, you know, the hidden tap um, to, to have information about what's going on in the village and stuff. So I'll present that as part of that comprehensive um, uh, redo of the, the visitor center. Um, so basically for this, our plan is to um, get some better information out there for uh, convention center visitors, possibly develop welcome packets of sorts for folks. Um, so that as they come to conventions, they, they get all the information about um, all the local amenities um, that we offer. Um, and then also um, really try to work with um, our departmental partners in the, in the form of the radio station and others just to help get more and more information out there about what's going on. So um, let's see, economic or goal number three, again tied to economic development, um, uh, add personnel to the convention center. Um, you know, I, I don't like to necessarily put one of these in as a, as a goal, but it's, I think it's important uh, just because we are growing. Uh, the number of events coming back is pretty significant. And right now we're doing really well. We're okay. Um, so we've got two full-time staff members that work really, really flexible hours about um, events. Um, but come late spring, early uh, summer, our, uh, our calendar is getting pretty full. 
So um, we're going to explore the possibility of getting that third person back, and I'm working with Cheryl and Manager Dodge about and, and Judy about finding where we might be able to do that. But the fact that we, we're going to need somebody is a testament to the fact that business is coming back so well, so we're excited about that. Um, so uh, let's see, goal number four for the convention center. Um, basically, this has to do with um, the infrastructure and the facilities, so just maintaining that. Um, as a desirable location for the community and as a region and regional organizations to host meetings. Um, I'm not sure why the fire department's on there. I re just read that. Chief is probably like, why is my department on there? Yeah. Um, so our, the responsible party for that is, is largely our um, team there at the convention center. Um, I, I say minor funding, um, and I realize I'm not sure why that says training. Minor funding, um, we're looking at probably, you know, potentially a request of about a hundred thousand um, dollars to um, do some pretty pretty intensive um, um, cosmetic work at the the convention center that has been in kind of the plans I'm just basing this most of this has been in the plans for a couple years the biggest portion being uh, wall repairs in meeting rooms four five and six um, we already did all of the wall repairs in the main exhibit hall and it made a huge difference in terms of the aesthetics. Um, there's some other things on here. Um, the additional outdoor event space. Uh, we've talked about possibly tying that into the master plan and design for the entire. Uh, I've talked to Rodney about the um, the White Mountain area and seeing if it is a possibility or a need for additional outdoor space out there. Because uh, we do, we have a lot of space behind the convention center and that whole area that yeah. could be used for some, some bigger events and things like that. And some of the conventions that we have do use that space, like the EMT conference. Mm -hmm. They fill that up with, you know, trucks and helicopters and everything else. Um, so that could be a possible um, look, too. Um, and then some of the uh, smaller things we're looking at doing, um, getting a, our portable stage replaced. Uh, the, someone mentioned the stage that was used for the, the Santa at the uh, Wingfield Park, that came from us. It's a, it's a good stage, it's getting really old, and it's really kind of a bear to put together. And they make, now they have some stuff that's really easy to tear down and put up, and one person can do it. That way, if we only have one person, it makes it a lot easier to do. And, and that stage, the ones we have, those pieces are about 20 years old now. Um, so they've, they've come a long way in terms of technology of <laughs> those things. So, um, and then acoustical upgrades in the exhibit hall. Um, and I'm still trying to figure out um, whether or not that was portion of the contract. We did do the upgrades to the actual sound system in the um, convention center, and it sounds great. It's all integrated into the walls, into one big system. Um, but the exhibit hall itself is, is pretty cavernous. Um, and if we do want to potentially do um, any sort of larger scale concerts or things in there, it would probably be wise to get an acoustical engineer to look at the, the actual building fabric itself and make some recommendations maybe. Mayor, Mayor I did follow up on that and, and we did not um, you know work in the acoustical part into the big room um, in addition to that you know being able to control the, the system with a, <coughs> with a mobile device um, you know I think we need to uh, get that priced out as well you know we shouldn't have to go back to the control room and, and be able to adjust the sound we should be able to have a mobile device and be able to adjust the sound from any room Agreed. Agreed. It does sound way better, though. Yes, it does. So, um, all right. Um, and Mayor, we do we do have some some money and a, a fund to address those issues. Oh, so okay. I think we need to address that sooner yeah, than later. I think so too. Yes, Get I would that over. recommend that to address that. And Tim, um, it it dawned on me, and Chief Thetford left, but for the management on the fire department responsibility, you may you may mention of it that. Um, the convention center is a, an emergency Red Cross station, and I think that was one of the reasons there, because I know in Joe Kowalbowski's uh, report, he'll be talking about putting a backup generator there, oh. as well as for the senior center. I just remembered that, that you know, because it is a possible Red Cross emergency um, site when needed, so... Mayor Pro Tem, Councilors, thank you, and I'll, I'll talk to Joe about that and see what I can do to help. So that's exciting. Good. Mayor um, and Mayor Pro Tem, normally those, those <laughs> Homeland Security would fund projects like that. So. Right, and I think that's what Joe brought up on, on, uh, on his portion of it for the convention center. 
and Mayor Pro Tem Councilors, I will definitely work with um, Anthony too, just to, to kind of piggyback on some of the training he's getting for his staff and make sure right. that, that my staff is, is up to date on that stuff as well. And God forbid, we, we need to open it up as a, as a um, center. So. All right, so that is the, uh, those are the, the current goals for the convention center. Um, I, I guess I will add just one more thing. Um, you know, as, as Rodney said, we are working together to try and um, kind of fill in some of the dates um, that, that we don't have events. Interestingly enough, um, most of our, our conventions, out-of-town conventions, are during the week. So actually most of the dates that we have open are during the weekends, it's, which is kind of interesting. So it's those weekdays that tend to get um, filled up with kind of the A-list group, so to speak. Um, so it does provide opportunity uh -huh. for events, um, kind of, um, you know, creative events on the weekends to draw crowds in, especially during the shoulder season and things of that nature. So, Yeah. Good job. All, all right. Well, then I'm going to move on to the radio station. <clears throat> All right, the uh, purpose statement for the radio station is as follows. Uh, KRUI 1490 AM serves as the official radio station for the village of Ruidoso. Uh, the purpose of KRUI 1490 is to provide citizens and visitors to Ruidoso with emergency information, updates from village elected officials and staff, public service announcements, and village program marketing, uh, and information on local amenities provided through paid advertisements. Um, so I do not, I did not add anything to that as well. That was kind of the statement that was hashed out when the radio station was established. So, so uh, a question in that as far as the paid advertisements, um, the thought came to me is that, so let's just say you have a business that's in town and they have an event coming up and they essentially want to do an infomercial, say a half hour, would that be qualify on paid advertising to where they would buy that half hour time slot? Uh, Councilor Eby, I believe it, it would probably be on a case-by-case -case basis depending on what the event was. Um, but in, in the case of all of our uh, private businesses, yes, they, they buy into advertising. Um, now there are, so for instance, we work with the Chamber of Commerce, and they have a weekly show, and they, uh, they do a the Rudos Roundup, and they will mention events from pi private businesses that work with them and, and are members of the chamber. So they, you know, there's kind of that, that added benefit of being a chamber member and that they are kind of an institutional partner with us. Okay, well, I'll just say it. You've screened the, the business and the event, mm -hmm. and they wanted to buy a half hour. Mm -hmm. And that way they could have their guests on that are going to be coming in and so on. Is that something that is uh, instituted or possibly? I, I think it, it certainly, if, as long as it's in um, line with the mission of the, the village, we have something we would seriously consider. Um, Councillor, I guess a good example would be Ian and Mew Ruidoso. Mm -hmm. um, they have a, a hour-long show. It's actually kind of been on hiatus because the person who was actually running it his, uh, fell ill. Um, but they're actually, they contacted us this week and want to get it going again. And they actually pay a sponsorship for that um, radio show. Um, and, of course, they do um, uh, promote what they are doing, but honestly, it's, it's, a, it's a civic promotion, sure. too. They talk about things. They absolutely. bring people from all types of, you know, walks of life in the community. So, absolutely, um, I think as long as it was in line with the mission of the village, we would certainly consider it. So. Mayor, um, okay. Councilor, as you recall, when, when we acquired the radio station and then we went through licensure, we didn't um, go through the process of a public radio station. Right. Even though the radio station is owned by a public entity, mm -hmm. it's still not licensed as a public radio station. So um, if, if people did want to purchase um, a spot from us or a program, they could purchase it and then run it, they, but they still got to follow the licensing uh, requirements. And just like we found out the other day, we can't be announcing different NFL teams and talking about it. And, <laughs> You know, we could talk about a team, but we can't use their name or the copyright information oh. or whatnot. Well, like the folks who are playing this afternoon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. We didn't know it either. <clears throat> but also, one of the things going public, there was a lot more reporting, a lot more paperwork, a lot yes. more things that we had to adhere to. So we decided uh, to, uh, to keep it, you know, like it is right now. And then if anybody on, on a political side, um, if, if there's, um, you know, election season going on, we just need to offer equal time to, you know, the candidates or whatnot. If you have somebody that's independently wanting to go and put together a political show or whatnot, then they got to pay for that time just like they would with that any other program. Yeah. 
Paying for a political show? Oh, having one. Having a political show? Oh, heck no. Hold on. You buy yourself oh. a half hour. Well, and along with that, uh, you know, Mary, you've always, you're talking on your radio show about um, financial, you know, how do, how do you bring in uh, banks, mm -hmm. uh, their, the people in to tell you how to finance a house or yeah. a car, whatever it is, you know, now that we don't have a newspaper banks pretty much don't advertise locally anymore and i had brought that it's funny that joe mentioned that because my note said you know along with bringing in something like that maybe banks would start buying advertisements from well, us and the goal is and we've had had somebody that needs to go out and be able to sell mm -hmm. and we, we started out with de uh, developing a program and, and there are rates that people can buy so the idea behind the the banks getting these different ones on there is I've talked to several of them about them sponsoring it instead of it being one bank, mm -hmm. that it's multiple banks that yeah. can pay for the sponsorships. And so that's the discussions that we're working on, okay. and we're going to try to have start that portion of it next week. Yeah, I think that, that's a great idea. So then you might be able to work in the uh, education part for the affordable housing, workforce housing. They need to know about down payments, all these programs, Tim's yeah. talking. And that would be a, a banking thing. Yeah. Or you could that get, would be a community service part of it. Right. Yeah. You know, I've, I've been in some cities and you have investment people and they have their half hour show and they're talking about all investments in the stock market and how to, how to save for your retirement and all that kind of stuff. Whatever we do, we need to try to be fair and equitable <coughs> yeah. and offer everybody the same opportunity. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I do know that banks, like, the board of directors, they like for their people to be able to speak. Sure. So to have different banks come on, I think that would be really a well, I've been idea. hit up a number of times by an individual with the village to, to advertise. And it's like, I'm a nonprofit, man. I, hold on. Let me see what I can do. So. Sorry. Well, no worries. Um, so moving on to the organizational um, chart and, you know, just to segue back real fast, I think a financial literacy program would go a long way. I think people would, would really appreciate that. Um, for the, uh, the radio station, right now it's myself and uh, sound engineer Greg. Um, and if you guys haven't had a chance to meet Greg, he's a wealth of information. He's, he's willing to do just about anything. We've had some, uh, some challenges the last couple days, uh, going back to last Friday with the signal for the radio station dropping out and he has no hesitation jumping in his truck and heading the road over the bounds to check on the tower at any point, um, and he's always available. He came in last night to make sure that um, the, um, the uh, state of the village was uh, uh, presented live across the radio, so he was down there for that. So, and he did that at, at, on very short notice, so um, he's wonderful, and he knows, he knows the uh, craft very well, um, which is great. So, um, at some point, as the mayor mentioned, it would be... Um, if we if we continue to grow the the kind of the advertising base for the radio station in the in the hopes of making it sustainable and self sustainable, um, it would be good to have a a point person for sales. Um, and there's probably a, a way that we could work that in with another department that might need someone like that. I don't think that this is probably a hundred percent full time job, but it could be commission based or something like that if we could find a contracting person. Um, and with that, um, going into our tactical plans. Tim, are you missing your chart? Have that. No, yeah. Our chart's at the it's, very beginning. It's at the very beginning of the. It combined it, all is three. Is, is, it, is it combined? Combined with the whole thing? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, the, the radio station org chart by itself <clears throat> is just me and Greg, so I didn't think it kind of kind of didn't need its own um, page. That's fine. We saved some paper. There you go. <laughs> Um, so our uh, strategic plans and tactical plans for this upcoming year for the radio station, um, well, the first one is um, uh, tied to economic development and investing in e and um, And we're going to be looking at um, some radio station internships, um, not just with ENMU, but also with the high schools oh, and things of that nature as well. And this, this goes beyond just the radio station, I will say this. Um, I've talked to Rodney about possible um, opportunities um, because they have a hospitality program. They're starting at EMU, uh, rolls right into um, outdoor recreation and all of that. 
Um, he's not here, or I would tell him. Um, we have a, I think I have a, a tentative lunch meeting with CODA um, at ENMU on the 9th just to talk about opportunities. Um, and same thing with the Convention Center and the Wingfield House Museum. I can see opportunities for a lot of um, internships and practicums um, that would help us, help students. Get What's them it called? Out. Um, the Wingfield House Heritage, Heritage Center. Center. I called it a museum. Okay, is that, is that what it is? Yeah, yeah, yep, that's House Heritage <laughs> that Center. Center. Yes, it is. So, um, so I'm, I'm excited about that. I have quite a bit of experience working with practicums and internships and in previous jobs, and I think there's a lot of opportunity for some meaningful connections and relationships with our educational institutions and developing some work, workforce um, training. So I'm excited about that. Um, so, uh, Jeff and I um, have talked. Um, oh, oh, let me, let me cut that out. Sorry. Um, so we're uh, looking at that. We're also um, looking at, like I said, hiring a sales manager as well. Um, and that's all on myself and, and Greg and uh, our internal staff. And there's no real um, resources needed other than time. So, um, Moving on to goal number two, um, again, tied to economic development. Um, we're looking at, you know, creating more of a brand awareness for the radio, um, building the audience um, as well as our clients and sponsors. And we really want to try to become Ruidoso's go-to platform for local updates and information. I think in a lot of ways we are. Um, uh, our, our programming, our original programming is, is extremely popular. Our most popular uh, show, and uh, I'll just say it, is our Mondays with the Mayor. Uh, it, is, <laughs> so at all. It, is the, uh, it is the most popular show we have on, and, and folks really resonate with that because of the, the level and granularity of detail and information they get about what's going on in or the building. Or jocularity. Yeah, so <laughs> so it's, it's, it's great. Like, so. And the jokes. Uh, Dr. Jackson down there using all these big words. <laughs> um, so uh, in terms of building our, our brand, that's really on myself, Greg, and the agency. Um, and, um, you know, we're, we're going to be trying to develop new, um, new programming as well. Um, and try to um, get uh, more feedback from the community about what they want to hear and what they want to see on, on the radio. So um, right now, just to get <coughs> some of the progress, our current sponsors and clients, um, ENMU Ruidoso does have a, uh, they, they give us about $500 a quarter for their sponsored show. Um, and then we have a couple of other um, uh, grant-funded advertising groups that we work with, the Lincoln County Ruidoso DWI program. It's on there twice. I'm not sure why. Uh, hopefully we don't charge them twice. Um, and then moving forward, our goals for this next year um, is try to get more sponsors for our daily programs. Um, so we have four programs throughout the week, not counting the mayor's show, and really reaching out to some folks. You know, For instance, Trad Tidwell does a, a music show on Saturdays, and finding a, a sponsor for that would be great. You know, He just volunteers his time, and of course all the people that come in volunteer their time. Sure. But to find a sponsor for that would be really great, and I think there's some opportunities and lots of folks in the community that would we be interested. We have Lester Jett at DNMU. We have Chamber Chat, mm -hmm. Trad Tidwell. Mm -hmm. The Fishing Show. Oh, yep. Troutman uh, George. Huh? Yep, uh, Troutman George. And then, uh, Mr. Mayor, Fridays, Frank Potter does kind of a weekend weather update for us. So, um, But finding some, <coughs> some sponsors for those would be really great. And we have a really good marketing packet um, that was put together before I got here um, that we just need to get out in front of some folks. So. I think that was Jasmine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it looks uh, very professional, Mr. Mayor. So I think it's, we just need to get that out in front of folks um, more. So. Mayor, one of, one of the things that I was going to recommend is, you know, when it comes to marketing, especially initially getting that set up, um, that may be one of the items that we consider um, RFPing out. Um, I know that some of our, our current uh, marketing efforts are coming up for RFP this, this uh, uh, I can't remember which date, but um, before the end of the year. So, you know, to at least initially get out and, you know, market and get the programs um, sold and then get get some advertisement sold along with it you know, an aggressive marketing campaign instead of trying to hire somebody permanently and making that a, a, a permanent type You're position about breaking it out and offering just a, a, a contractor's job on part-time basis or what 
Yeah, where they would do it on a on a percentage basis or whatever. They would come in and propose how they would approach it, but basically getting a contractor to come in and and sell it, and then the maintenance of it would be in house. But the the initial, you know, the initial sale contact. Yeah, Elizabeth saw for that because she thought that was going to direct it towards her. Oh no, she, she's a heck of a saleswoman. <laughs> no. So I, I agree that we we could use some help with that to really, uh, and that would. Uh, increase le uh, listenership dramatically. Um, so I think that that's probably a pretty good idea. Yeah, and you know, the other part, and I think Tim's going to get into it, is, you know, being able to expand it into maybe FM and yeah. and looking at other options and whatnot. But, you know, if, if, if this is going to be a viable thing going forward, we need to do it professionally and get some professional advice on, on that part of it. All right, um, moving on to our third goal, and this is what Village Manager Dodge was um, talking about, um, exploring options for installing an FM frequency translator for the station. Um, and uh, what, what this is, basically it would not be a, a, an actual FM, it is an FM signal, but it's being derived from the AM signal itself. So it basically just translates it into an FM signal and gives us, puts us on the FM dial. Um, currently, the FCC is uh, not taking applications for these at the moment, but um, there's kind of workarounds for that. Um, I have some, some, uh, some friends who are in the radio business who are kind of doing some pro bono consulting and helping us kind of look at this and how we might navigate it. Um, it's not going to increase the actual power of the radio station. It will still remain at 250 watts, but it is an FM signal, which is different, so it's line of sight. It won't go through... A mountain, but if you see it, you can hear it, um, which that would be good. And also, if we if we pull it from our direct signal from the um, from the radio station, which we could, um, we won't have the issues with um, uh, the ionospheric di distortion that you get at night with an AM frequency. So that if you listen to our AM yes. station at night. What basically what happens is when the sun goes down, it starts bouncing off the ionosphere. And a lot of times you actually have to shut your radio station down if it's interfering with other AM stations in certain areas. So a lot of AM stations don't operate at night because they all start interfering with each other. We don't have very many AM stations around here, so we've had nobody call us from another station and say, hey, you can't do that. So um, that's the reason why it gets a little um, crackly at night. But with this... Um, we would be able to avoid that at least in the immediate area. And the good thing with that is with the addition of the, the light poles and the um, speakers in uh, Midtown, you know, if you're walking down Midtown in the middle of the uh, evening, you don't want to hear a crackly radio station. This, this should fix all that as well. Um, so um, the, the cost of that, if we can find tower space, um, for the equipment and the installation is probably somewhere between about fifteen and twenty thousand um, dollars And that includes all the filing fees and all of that stuff, um, but we do have to find a tower um, And right now we're exploring possibly the tower that's um, up in Wingfield Park um, That's there that it was there for the um, emergency responders um, It's if you're heading up Center Street, it'll be on your left. About a, this, the building. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Yep. So um, it looks to be tall enough, and we can explore and see whether or not that's an option. How because, tall does it need to be? Um, I think it, uh, at least 100 feet. Well, I know 195 when it's about to go up that we've <laughs> no, talked about co-locating co on. Oh, yeah. at Councilor, Horton, are we talking about the, the one Horton at the for consolidated Horton. dispatch? And, uh, Councilor, uh, Mayor, I'm not entirely sure about the legality because that is that's a, uh, dedicated for emergency response. I'm not sure... What we can do with that, we'd have to look into that. We'd have to get with a telemetry engineer and make sure that we're we can do those different cohabitation. The over there on, um, that's <clears> up <throat> on the ski road. What's the one that's up uh, Swiss Shelly Hill up to the right? That's a uh, snow snow what snowflake. That's on the right where the towers are. Yes. Are any of those ours? Uh, the one on the tower on the uh, water <laughs> So you need a line of sight telemetry shot to make that work. Yes. That one's up there. Yeah. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, counselors, we can definitely look into that, and I can see. I know uh, Greg did look into um, whether or not there was space on the Buck Mountain um, uh, Tower because that's where um, um, MTD has a bunch yeah. of their stuff, and he does not believe there's space. Uh, MTD said that they don't think there's any more space up there for it. So, um, 
So there's that. So I, I'm excited about that option. I think beyond the the just enhancement for listenership, um, it will also make selling ads a lot easier. Even though it's not going to be a, a more powerful signal, it's on the FM dial. Very few people, you know, even know that AM exists anymore. Um, <laughs> used to so, be the other way around. <laughs> exactly. Unless you wanted to hear long-haired music. Indeed, indeed, counselor. So, um, you know, this will this will allow our sales manager, if we go that route, a lot easier job of, of selling um, ads if we're on the FM dial. So, questions about that? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, moving on, our next goal again tie the economic de uh, development integrate radio program and marketing plan into our broader tourism promotion strategy through Team Tourism. Um, the responsible party being, of course, Team Tourism and the radio station. Um, and again, you know, the resources for this are, are minimal. Um, really what we're looking at doing um, is just leveraging this valuable resource we have in, in the way of the, the radio station to get information out about events and, and tourism activities and amenities and more doing a better job of working together with um, the Parks and Recreation Group and our new tourism director to make sure that it's being utilized to its full um, extent. I mean, I like, you know, our, our variety of music from Wham to Michael Jackson and Bruno Mars as much as anybody, but I'd love it if the entire thing was filled up with programming for the village, you know. Um, so at some point, I think we'll get to that point where we're really, you know, leveraging it to its full extent and we're moving that way. And I think Team Tourism, the, the group that we have right now, is thinking creatively about ways we can do that. So I'm excited. I, Elizabeth doesn't know it yet, but she's probably going to get her own radio show. So. <laughs> <laughs> So good. Um, I've got a I've got a Monday morning at eight o'clock slot for sale if you want it. So. <laughs> Monday morning without the money. That's right. The high, 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 oh. high, goes to the highest oh, bidder. This is going to be listening with Liz. Is that right? Uh, I, I like it, counselor. I, it's got a, a, alliteration. I like it. So, all right. So I, I'm excited about that and moving forward with that. And that also ties in potentially with these. Um, if if the Lodgers Tax Committee is interested in supporting this uh, small digital signage project, we could actually integrate that into the sales for the radio station as an added incentive. If you buy a radio ad on KRUI, by the way, you're also going to get on the individual <coughs> signs that are in the visitor center at uh, Billy the Kids Center and the convention center and wherever else we might end up putting these things. Yeah. So, you know, just an added incentive for that as well and some value to it. So, um, let's see. Uh, goal, the next goal um, is uh, developing a series of cultural and historical programs highlighting uh, Rudos's heritage. Um, and uh, again, that's kind of t tied to economic development, but really it's tied to um, some of the, the cultural and tourism aspects of, of the com comprehensive plan as well. Um, we already had a, a wonderful cultural program um, run, but um, we, we've um, the person who was doing that, um, Councilwoman uh, Lutterman's brother, um, has had to step down from that. So we want to go ahead and get that back up and do that again. Um, it was a very popular show, and I think it goes hand-in-hand hand also with um, the work that we're doing at the Wingfield House Heritage Center um, and tying it into that. And that we have so many awesome resources for um, people that we can interview um, as a as a trained oral historian. I, when I walked into that radio station for the first time, I thought to myself, this is the nicest oral history studio I've ever seen. <laughs> so we have a built-in op, you know, opportunity to interview folks in the community and things of that nature to, to capture those stories before they're gone as well. And uh, Greg and I have talked about doing both an hour-long um, kind of podcast sort of format for that, um, but also kind of do um, 30 second to a minute or maybe even shorter kind of Rudoso minutes, um, just real small snippets of regional um, and local history that we can put in there. I, you know, we could record 150 of these things and have them canned and just run throughout the day as people are listening and, you know, you know. You're did podcast. you know? Yeah, did you know? What, a podcast, is that video? Uh, or is that just, just, just It'd just be audio. Just so, audio. indeed. You could set it up digitally and do digital recordings and then, you know, create a database of it where you could, you know, have somebody go in and be cataloged and then hit certain videos that you'd like to watch. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's another way of doing it. I've seen it done both ways, video or audio. Works for Joe Rogan. Yes, <laughs> Mr. Mary, yes, it does. So, I mean, we could, at any point, we could put a, um, a video camera into the, 
into the station if we wanted to say, and that would be one way we talked about um, Facebook earlier. I was kind of brainstorming when you guys were talking about that. One way we could do that um, is running it through Facebook Live. So, for instance, for your radio show on, on Mondays, you know, we don't necessarily have to have a video camera. We could simply have a static image, but we could run it through a Facebook Live so it would go live and, you know, um, be ported out that way as well. So there's some, some options that we can look at as well to kind of increase our viewership. So um, I think it works better without a visual for your show. No, I would love to see you for your support. <laughs> yeah, let, let, them, let them wonder what you look like. Oh, yeah. there. That's right. Then they know exactly who it yeah. is. So I didn't hear anything about remotes. Dr. Coughlin, we're glad you feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Mayor, yes, I was actually looking. I, there's two things that uh, new were in here, and I don't see them. Oh, so you did talk about remotes? No, I, well, it's supposed to be in here in terms of expanding our programming. So um, it, we are looking at doing some, um, some more live and remote reporting. Um, we have the equipment to do it. Actually, every one of us have the equipment to do it in their pockets right here. Um, we can live stream right to the radio and get it back to Greg um, right there. The built-in microphones and most um, smartphones are pretty good, but we actually have some uh, small shore um, mics that can plug right into the, your uh, your um, iPhone. So, like, we could record. do a day at the races or... Mm -hmm. If, if Mayor, we had absolutely. some snow, we could do uh, <laughs> a snow report and all those kind of things up there. And uh, a man on the street or a girl on the street type interviews, you know, because that's something that I think we get the public, uh, you know, active. Mm -hmm. Mr. So. Mayor, absolutely, that's exactly right. And, you know, we talked about, you know, obviously with all of Rodney's events and things like that, what we need is we need talent. So if you are interested in uh, becoming a, a roving reporter for KRUI, we would gladly uh, there you go. enlist your, your yeah, assistance. So for any, <laughs> anybody, anybody can do it. Any, you have so point. much more so, time on your hands. So. Except they're usually 30-second segments. Yeah. <laughs> How did um, you arrive on the streets of Rio Doso? <laughs> um, but we, we've even talked about you know, things like um, the uh, next week, the legislative reception in, yes. um, in Santa Fe. That would be a great time yeah, to walk what? around and talk yeah. to folks. Folks. Um, so I, if I can get the microphone, I'll come up and, uh, and do that. I'll be there. We've anyway. done that once so. mm. uh, where we were when we were outside the radio station and she had the microphone mm -hmm. and then I was somewhere else where she had it plugged into her cell phone. <clears throat> mm -hmm. so I know that we have the capability. We just haven't used it. And again, it takes talent, somebody to go do it. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. And um, in line with that, too, Mr. Mayor, one of the things that wasn't on here, I'd like to I really want to start a, um, a live radio program music program um, and I've actually already asked the agency they've worked up a little logo because I'm going to present that to potentially the lodgers tax although I really want to find a corporate sponsor for that to underwrite it um, live music what do you mean um, so what we, what we, we would call it something like Rudoso live and it'd be like a monthly event maybe at the convention center um, where we would have a live concert and uh, focus especially on hyper local um, artists um, and bring them in do a uh, like a one hour concert um, and it would be live on the radio at the same time then of course archived and um, potentially looking at a um, nonprofit partner so in, you know instead of say charging five dollars to get in um, we find a corporate sponsor and then in order to get in you have to bring a non-perishable food item for the food bank or something like that um, and really highlight you know local artists we have so much talent in this area um, you know, it's just amazing. I can think of a dozen people, yeah. you know, right off the top of my head that we could fill an entire year's worth of programming. Yeah. Um, Trad Tidwell, you know, his program, every single week he has an amazing musician on there. And I'm like, oh, I, for I forgot how much talent is in this community. So, yes. Um, so I'll be presenting that as a, as a possibility. Um, but like I said, I would rather uh, fund it through a sponsorship um, than a um, than a lodger's tax. Um, but we'll see how that goes. So. Okay. So would you imagine that being outside the window of the, the events planned for Wingfield Park? Like they're, they're looking at kind of summer-ish, I think I saw, uh, every, every weekend or something? Councilor Coughlin, yes, that would be, that would be outside of that okay. and um, completely separate. Okay. Um, so that, that concert series that, that we're working on is also, so there's, there's three major uh, uh, concerts planned, 22 smaller concerts, um, at least three um, events at the convention center 
And we've kind of left that open to not just music, but, you know, it could be, you know, some sort of performing arts. It could be a comedy show or a, a magician or, you know, I don't know, a professional wrestling match or something like that. Something mm -hmm. unique and interesting to get new people in. And then a, uh, at least a one-day rockabilly um, festival um, as well. Um, and then rockabilly that's... Rockabilly needs to be like a, a week long. A week long. <laughs> so I, I've got some... Rodney and I were talking this morning with managers, so we've got some ideas about that. <laughs> um, but then that's, that's kind of... Um, the way we're presenting is that's the baseline. Um, but if, if the promoter were to come to us and say, you know, we have an amazing opportunity. This, this artist is traveling through from Texas to Arizona and they want to stop in New Mexico, we would be able to then go and say, okay, present this to Lodger's Pack and say, this is outside this original idea. Would you guys be interested in supporting this? Um, so it could be, you know, 50 concerts. If it's, you know, the, the goal is to make it self-sustainable, and I think it can can be. So um, and just grow. So. That's a great idea. Agreed. All right. Okie dokie. All right, moving on to, um, I'm not, I, I feel like I have three kids, and I also have three things I look after. I'm not going to say I have a favorite, but. Well, I love they, two of them. Yeah, so. the, 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 youngest, the youngest might be my favorite. So we'll talk about the Wingfield House Heritage Center um, a little bit. So um, right now, as you see the, uh, the organizational chart, oh, let's go back, sorry, the purpose statement. So um, it was mentioned earlier that, I think Ron mentioned that, we had developed a mission and purpose statement for the Wingfield House Heritage Center. Um, and I, I just want to uh, point out that that was done through a, uh, a group effort by our Wingfield House Steering Committee, which includes Councilor Cornelius, Councilor Letterman, Mayor Crawford, uh, Judge Frank Potter. Um, Tracy Crawford sits on that as well, as well as, uh, um, yes, Elizabeth Potter as well. So um, you guys have, have been steering the boat um, since the beginning of this project, and I was just able to come in, you know, and, and after you guys had done a lot of the legwork. So um, we all sat down over the course of about three hours and really talked about what the Wingfield House means to the community, what it can be, and that's how we first ended up with the name, the Wingfield House Heritage Center. Um, what we were looking for is something that kind of explained a little bit more than just what it was going to be physically. It is going to be a museum. Um, but it's also going to be a place for the community to gather and have conversations about culture and history, where we have been, where we're going, um, to you know have events and cultural events and things of that nature. So it's a little bit more than just a um, a museum. So that's why we landed on the Wingfield House Heritage Center as the uh, the name of it. Um, and with that, the uh, the purpose statement that the steering committee um, developed is as follows, uh, to serve the community of Ruidoso as a gateway to exploring the region's rich natural and cultural history and to create a space for conversation and education about the past so that our community thrives in the future. And Tim, you know, you, you said it, but in the, the mission statement, you know, we, as we were talking and we were just, you know, throwing out words, the mission statement come up with a gathering place <clears throat> and that's what that house house has always been for a hundred years is a gathering place. So I was really excited for it to be in the mission statement. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And I, the other thing in this, the word that really gets me is a gateway. And as you you described your family, there was a gateway. So it was. Came out, people stopped there. Literally, there was a gate there, and it got open yes. and closed. So figuratively, now it's a gateway to the history of Ruido. So, right. and, and I'm really excited about the way this turned out. And thank you so much to the steering committee for for working on it and helping us develop that. So I think we have some good direction. So I'm very excited. All right. So moving on to the uh, organizational chart. Um, you're looking at it. So right now, um, so right now it's the, the steering committee and myself, um, but we are working actively on an operational plan that will identify um, any needs for additional staff, which I'm sure there will be. So um, we hope to have that done um, before the budgeting process starts so that we can uh, start planning for next year. So moving forward to our goals. Um, goal number one fits into our community services goal. Um, some economic development uh, goals as well from the comprehensive plan. And um, this is basically the nuts and bolts of what we're going to be working on this year, developing an operational plan for the Wingfield Heritage uh, Center, um, including a budget um, 
request for annual operations, um, identification of potential sources of funding beyond um, the village support in terms of grants and things of that nature. Um, and that is, uh, that is the responsible parties are myself and the steering committee. And we have already started that process. I, I shared kind of a, a working draft with some elements with uh, village manager Dodd uh, last week just to kind of show them the direction we were going. And um, if you look down here, it just kind of gives you a little bit of update of kind of the things that are going to be inside that operational plan. Obviously, uh, looking at the staffing requirements, um, but that's largely going to be based on what kind of recommendations we have for the programming and such that are going into it. Um, recommended programming, uh, maintenance, annual operation funding requirements, emer emergency management procedures, um, and one that isn't in there and is kind of covered in a in the next section, but it's part of the operations plan, a comprehensive collections management policy um, for artifacts and things of that nature. Cataloging and yes, absolutely yes, Mr. Mayor. So that's going to be a big part of this. And you're going to have in your side a storage facility eventually. Uh... Um, Mr. Mayor, the counselors, what we are we are going to have to have an offsite storage facility. And I've talked to Ron; he has needs too in the clerk's office for well, archival that's... storage. So I think there's a possibility of us working together mm -hmm. to identify a space mm -hmm. and maybe even beyond space, maybe even a person to help with that who could fill both of those needs. But we have such a rich uh, retirement community that has expressed part-time work that they would like. Some of these people are highly educated, have tons of uh, life experiences or whatever. So I think that I would like to, you know, maybe bring that into the conversation, see if it has a place to fit. Mr. Mayor, counselors, um, you know, listening to Anthony talk about the RSVB program, I think there's a serious, you know, possibility of working with getting us as one of the um, the stations for that. Um, right. And you know, my background in museum um, work and management, you know, if we did get a, a good group of volunteers who wanted to come in and learn how to, you know, you if we ended up going with something like Pass Perfect software, which is kind of the standard for um, collection software, I could train them on how to, how to use that. I could train them on how to you know fill out collections forms, how to do um, you know kind of condition reports for things that come in and all of that stuff, and I would love to do that. Passing on that information um, would be really great. So, yeah, there's a lot of opportunities for volunteerism with the Wingfield Heritage Center for sure. So, um, so this operational plan is going to be my biggest focus over the next couple months, um, getting ready for that budget cycle um, in concert with the, um, the steering committee, and I probably will be at a point um, in the next couple weeks where we can have a meeting and I can kind of present a draft copy of that to you guys if you're ready for it. So. Um, moving on, um, as we were just talking about, um, a comprehensive collection uh, management and accession plan and policy. Um, this is critical, as it, especially when you start a museum. If you start off on the wrong foot, what you end up with is, junk. you know, it could be a bunch of junk. I hate to say that because I love junk, but it's, it's the truth. Um, so making sure that we develop a very um, focused uh, collections policy and that we train everyone uh, in, involved with this is very critical because it's, it's tough if somebody shows up. I've been in this situation numerous times and they bring you their, their family's heirloom and you have to tell them, I'm sorry, I can't take this for the museum. And, you know, but if you have a policy to back that up and that explain why, it makes it a lot easier than just saying no. Um, and you know, I, I have a feeling that we're going to have a lot of folks in the community that want to support the Wingfield House Heritage Center and what we're doing through the donation or loaning of artifacts. And don donating is one thing. Um, loaning is a totally different thing. We have to have a very specific policy on that if we go that route. Um, I, I will say this, and um, you guys will see your uh, governing body in this um, plan because um, anything that we obviously gets donated to the, the village becomes property of the village. So uh, the governing body, the council is the, you know, at, at, at any level of a museum, there's, there's the final say on whether or not we uh, uh, bring something in. That will certainly be the governing body in that collections policy to the recommendations of myself or a collections committee or the steering committee or what that might be. So I'm excited about that, but just wanting to make sure that we got a really focused <laughs> policy and more importantly, um, that before we start um, acquiring artifacts, if that's the route we go, that we have the space to, to store them properly. 
Um, there's not, you know, I, I want to be able to, if we do have somebody donate something, be able to look them in the eye and say it's going to be taken care of, uh, because that's what they that's what they deserve if they're going to be donating that to us. Um, so I was going to be mad if Tim won't take this stuff. Yeah, how are the junk? <laughs> Who, who is this? My husband. husband. Oh, I, I, I'm sure, uh, Councillor <laughs> Mayor, I'm sure we will, uh, we, we can make this work. <laughs> Judge Potter has also told me he's basically got a, a semi truck load of stuff that he's, he wants to, to give us. So we'll, we'll figure it out somehow. So. Uh, but we do, uh, we do have a lot of space in the village that I think we could um, turn into um, climate controlled storage space relatively easily. Um, that would fit both the needs of the Wingfield House Heritage Center and possibly the clerk's office and work together on that. Um, it, it would make a lot of sense. And I just I um, just realized this. It says uh, work with the county clerk. I don't think Whitney wants to work with us on this. Uh, she's got her own set of issues, so I'll change that as well. So, um, all right, moving on. If there's no questions about that, I can go into a lot of details about collections policies and things, but we'll we'll get to that at some. Sounds point. exciting. But yeah, we keep on moving. <laughs> it's exciting. Um, so moving on, the complete, uh, completing the restoration of Wingfield House um, exterior and design um, and installing the interior permanent and rotating exhibits. Um, again, that falls on myself um, and the steering committee, but also the capital projects team. I, and I want to give a big shout out to Karen and Zeke and Courtney um, for helping to manage and Ron, of course, for helping to manage this project so far. It's been it's moving along swimmingly. Um, in fact, uh, Thursday, it looks like. Um, we're going to do a walkthrough for the phase one substantial completion, which is scheduled to be done on the 28th. And I think we're in, in we're right there at it. So that just happened today. Zeke contacted me. So I'll get him to send out the information to the steering committee. So if you guys can be there um, and take a look at what's going on. So. And what, what date did you say? Uh, he was, uh, Zeke was looking at Thursday, counselor. So, um, we're, in the we're, here. we're in here Thursday. Uh, I think he was going to do it late in the afternoon. Councillor, I'm not. Just to accommodate you. So. You said the 28th, Thursday's the 27th. I think we're, uh, Councillor Coughlin, I think we're going to do it the day before the actual sub substantial date. That was the idea. Okay. So, um, so with that, um, the operational plan will also mm -hmm. kind of help to identify um, some of the uh, elements that we want to have in the house initially in terms of the permanent exhibits and the rotating exhibits. Um, there, there's more space in, in the house then it kind of feels or looks like. So I think we can do a lot of what we want to do in there um, right off the bat um, in terms of presenting kind of a timeline history of Rio Doso's past and kind of putting into context context <coughs> where we are. Um, but at the same point, you know, highlighting um, the contributions of the namesake family of the house as well. And also giving ourselves space for rotating exhibits um, that highlight all kinds of things um, throughout the community. So I, I'm very excited about that and getting that, that kind of um, put in place. So and I, you know, I, 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 think, I don't think this is overly optimistic. I think it's realistic that based on where we are right now and the fact that we have existing funding to the tune of, I think, about $750,000, which I don't think Ron thought I was going to find out about, but I found out about. So <laughs> now, I know, now I know what we have to work with. Um, I, I think we honestly could have the, the house open to the public by the end of the calendar year. I think that's realistic. So That's great. Uh, I didn't see anything in here where you're doing planning on education with the, kids, the schools and how um, you're going to so approach that. Mr. Mayor, I think that's going to be in, that's certainly in the operations plan as okay. far as um, looking at what sort of programming we're going to be developing. But education is in the mission statement and purpose statement of the of the Wingfield House Heritage Center, and it's a it's a priority. Absolutely. Um, my my wife actually just sent me a um, uh, a message today. She works at E and M U uh, Ruidoso, and they have on the in the catalog they have a um, um, a course called the Lincoln County War Through Film. And she's like, you need to teach this. And I'm thinking, we do need to do some more continuing education out there, um, some of their um, other <clears throat> education and things of that nature. And I think the Wingfield House Heritage Center could be a resource for things like that. And obviously working with the school system, the steering committee has talked about um, working directly with teachers, um, especially in Ruidoso. There's a really... Um, a successful uh, project called Parks to Teachers or Teachers to Parks at the National Park Service um, instituted and essentially what they do is they take teachers during the summer months when they're off anyway 
They bring them to a park, they give them a stipend, and they work with the teacher, and the teacher helps develop a lesson plan that's in line with their educational standards um, based on the park's history. Then they can go back to their own classroom and utilize it. And who better to know what they need in their classroom than the teacher? So that's something we could certainly work out as a program where we bring in educators from around the area, help them to develop uh, lesson plans for us with them, um, and then they can go back out into their um, uh, schools and utilize those lessons, lesson plans to meet the, the standards required by the state and by Common Core if they're using that, um, but utilizing regional and local history to do that, um, which has kind of gone away. Um, I'm not even sure. I, I think it's fourth grade now. Do they still teach uh, New Mexico history, I believe? Mm -hmm. so, um, but we need, we, need a, we need to serve as a resource for those teachers to get information and resources for them to help them with it. For sure. So. Mayor, um, Council, I have a couple of recommendations on this. You know, as, as we look at, um, and Tim talked a little bit about the, the Billy the Kid Center. You know, the, the Billy the Kid Center is a result of the RFPs that um, the state put out for scenic byways, right? Mm -hmm. And it's the Billy the Kid Scenic Byway. There's other, other scenic byways throughout the state in New Mexico, and all those scenic byways they're really talking about heritage, right, and how people got to uh, New Mexico or passing through or, you know, either by um, Route 66 Scenic Byway or, or Mesa Lands or, or whatnot. And I know that Ron's been involved with, with some of those projects as well. Um, I would really encourage um, the steering committee to take some trips and go see some of the heritage sites throughout the state that have been funded. And just, to, you know, trying to, to inspire... Um, some thought process behind it. You know, um, I shared with Tim a couple of heritage projects that I worked on. And, you know, the one that I'm going to talk about briefly, you know, I actually did two of them. It was an RFP that we put out. And I would suggest that we do a, a very similar thing uh, for the outside of, of the Wingfield house. Because when we look at the outside of the house and, and, and the pieces of the property, it really needs to become a, an attractive piece of art that is going to attract you know, people to, to look at it and say, wow, what is that? You know, let's stop in and see that. And it's it's the sculptures, it's artwork that, that you place that's going to depict the history of how people got to Rio Doso. You know, that, that's the way that I envision it. So one of the things, and uh, Tim, do you remember who Rodolfo Anaya is? Mm -hmm. Who is he? Uh, the um, historian from Union. <coughs> yeah. and, and he's, he's the individual who uh, wrote Bless Multima. And he's one of the most popular um, um, historians in the state of New Mexico that talked about Hispanic, the Hispanic uh, culture and how, how the um, Anglo and, and the um, Hispanic culture merged in the Llano Estacado. Mary, you're from the Llano Estacado, right? So you, you know where, where, that, mm -hmm. where that area sure. is. So um, we put together an art project that talks about um, Rodolfo Anaya, and he's sitting on a stump, you know, writing on his manuscript, and leaflets of his booklet are inlaid in the in the sidewalk that goes around the, the, the <clears throat> pond with a golden carp within the pond, and talks about the story of the Llanos de Calo. And you know that's a, a heritage site that we built. And there's another one that we built that, that has a fountain right in the middle of the plaza in San Rosa. You know, um, the San Rosa Plaza, or, or it's a courtyard square, is the furthest west courtyard square in the United States. When you look um, everywhere else west, they're all plazas, right? Santa Fe Plaza, Albuquerque Plaza. You know, it's, it's a difference. So when we start to look at Rio Doso, what is that significance? How did people get here? Was it mining or what? And how can we depict that and get an artist to sell that story within the landscaping of that facility? So, you know, I, I really encourage when you go to Las Cru Cruces, they have a heritage site there. And, you know... Um, I think we've been there, several of us, many times when they've had the Municipal League there. And you, you, we really need to take a look at those properties and see how they approached it and incorporate some of those thoughts into developing the center. But I can just see the way this will give the locals here and the people that grow up a sense of who, where they came from and some pride that I think this community lacks. So. Indeed, yes, Mr. Mayor and Manager Dodge. I think um, in the conversations we had at the last committee meeting, I think everyone's in line with that. One of the things that came out was how do we expand the space? 
you know, it's, it's a relatively small interior space, but how do we, how do we build a space outside that, that allows us to, to do additional programming, but also in a place that has some meaning? And I think that's, that's absolutely a great idea, and we can definitely look into that and see what we can do. So that's exciting. We can put the gate back in the road, and then people will notice it. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I, um, I, I would be very interested in going to see that because I envision, and I had told Tim, I'm really not the one that needs to be talking about this because I have a different view of this uh, house, but um, I see it softer. Um, um, and what I mean by that, uh, different kinds of, of plants and grasses and um, those kinds of things, uh, trees. But when, when you go to Santa Fe next week and you're staying at La Fonda, every, every piece of that hotel is designed separately as a piece of art, as a space. And, and when, so I, I just want you to be aware of that. So when you, when you envision it, you're talking about, you know, uh, flowers and things of that nature. That's all part of it. You're developing an art piece, you know. So whether it's flowers or sculptures or trees or whatever, you know, that that's what you're designing. Okay. Um, I think it's a great idea. Um, in here it says to finalize the interior design plans. We've got them. Are we going to meet on it sometime? Well, I, uh, Councilor, oh, we I think... we got 90 percent. Sure, Councilor. I think what I was, uh, when I was referring to interior design plans, uh, we are, we're, we're at 90 percent of that. And um, what we've done is basically created a blank canvas for ourselves to work, work with. So I, what I meant by the interior design, I meant largely more like the exhibits and things of that nature. I'd like um, to talk about the remodeling phase. Okay. Yes, sir. Sometime. Absolutely. I talked to Susan today. They've got those old looking appliances specked out. I don't think her great grandmother had a glass top electric range. <laughs> I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm guessing, I'm guessing and that's probably what they not. spec. Oh, okay. You know, it was an old gas range. And she probably didn't spend $9,000 on the range in the refrigerator, which is what those are. Councilor, we will definitely, I think um, now that we're um, fi finishing up phase one, we definitely are going to need to get a, a meeting together relatively soon because as far as I know, we're moving right yeah, into old, phase um, two. Wood stove in it. Um, so, yeah. 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 They sent us the 90% yeah. interior yeah. plans. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, Councilor, I'm not sure if I've seen those. I'll have to see if I've I'm not sure. I thought you sent them to me. Oh, yeah. I, I did. That, yes, those. There. Yes, okay. The other thing we yeah. talked about briefly in the, the capital board. improvements meeting the other day was not do all those mini splits, see if we Your can't work up. in a couple out. of egg specs, maybe one upstairs and one downstairs and have it come through the floor, go through the... That's what we had up here. Mini splits in that. I don't think are appropriate. No, Councilor, I, I tend to agree. You know, I think that maybe we could even look at something like a VRF system that has a really small footprint. Um, I helped install one of those when I was facilities director for the historic VRF. sites. Um, it's a, it's a, basically, it's it's kind of like a mini split system, um, but it, it basically allows you to, to run very small um, run like diameter inch PVC rather than large registers. And we put it all throughout the uh, J. Paul Taylor home. Um, or we were about to start it when I left. We'd already finalized the design, but it, you know, very minimal intrusion. You know, it kept the kept the historical integrity of the building together without giant registers. And I agree. The I think the mini splits would, would detract from from that experience. So completely agree. <coughs> right. And then um, real fast, the last thing I wanted to mention, and, and Manager Dodge asked me to just bring this up to you. Um, before, I, before I started with this position, I was actually asked to come in and um, sit and just kind of uh, listen and, and um, give my, my thoughts on some conversations related to the, the Hubbard Museum of the American West. And um, from what I understand, at this point, the museum is not planning on reopening. Mm -hmm. um, but the collection is still there. Um, and that collection is a, a amazing resource for the community and the region. 
And um, with the, the blessing of the, the governing body and Manager Dodge, I'd just like to kind of re reestablish that conversation with uh, the Downs and the, the foundation about what their plans are and what possibilities there are for some sort of um, collaboration or something in the future. Because um, to see that collection be distributed or lost or go to another community um, would just be terrible. Um, and it's, it's just a really amazing resource, and I think it needs to stay stay here it's just one more amenity that i think the the community needs um especially you know in times of, of not as much snow or if it's raining in the summer people love a good museum and trying to figure out if there's a way to, to keep that here so it'd be great i'm pretty sure that part of that collection reverts back to the previous owner of that museum in arizona yeah isn't functioning for a certain <clears throat> period of time so okay that would be a shame to let that happen. Agreed. All right. I guess for that, with that, I'll stand for questions. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. All right. Thank you guys so much. Very good presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. We going with fire department next. Library. 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 Okay, because we just have half the fire department here. I didn't know. They're the. They're on the next team that's coming up, Mayor. <laughs> Mayor, Council, the library's pr purpose statement. The Rio Doso Public Library provides exceptional service and access to literature, information, technology, and other resources for all citizens and visitors who live, work, and play in nature's playground. The library is a community hub, an open meeting space, and a safe space for the free exchange of ideas and for imaginative and creative pursuits. I like it. I think that's been there since the beginning. I don't think it's changed anything. <laughs> um, the next is the organizational chart. It's myself and four others right now. So are we looking to replace the supervisor anytime soon, or are we waiting until budget and the new fiscal year? Uh, Mayor Pro Temp, that's, uh, that department reports under uh, Ron, so I'll defer to Ron. So uh, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Council, Mayor Crawford, uh, we would look at that during the budget cycle. Okay. And also with the the part-time person as well. That is correct. I, th I believe uh, uh, that part-time position was also vacated. Was was that during COVID? Is yes, when it, it was. was vacated. So we will look at that during budget. Okay. My first goal uh, is community services goal. Uh, Related back to that, uh, 1, 1. 1. 1. G, provide a library building that is safe, comfortable, and well-maintained for all community members. That is the responsibility of the director and uh, the custodial staff. This year, um, the first area is about the HVAC system. <laughs> the one that um, needs replacement. Um, there was an energy audit that was done, um, and I believe that funds that are coming down to make facilities <coughs> more energy efficient, there may be some monies there that would help with the HVAC system. I have gone and done some research on my own about an HVAC system and about how much it would cost. Um, Anywhere between twenty and fifty thousand for the unit itself. That is, if we're looking at a unit that's between twenty and thirty tons, because uh, that's a fifteen thousand square foot building. It has a lot of windows, 
and it has a vaulted space, ceiling space as well. So it takes a little bit more to get that going. You know, we, we I mean, this has been a priority for <laughs> years. So, yeah. Is there something else besides the HVAC that we could do that would be less expensive that would heat and no? I don't think so. No, it's just that big, huge package <laughs> unit right outside Ron's window yeah. that sounds yeah. lovely every time it starts up. But if does it does it work? Yeah. I mean, it it's does working. work. We keep putting money into it every year to keep it going. <laughs> it's um, an old unit. It's you know big enough to live in. You could use it as a travel trailer. <clears throat> I mean, it's that big. Yeah. But Mayor, council, I, I, I uh, you know my recommendation is that we just go ahead and replace it. Yes. You get a replacement system in there that it would efficiently, um, you know, heat and cool that area. And just um, through the budget process, that'll be one of our recommendations. Okay. And they're going to have way better control systems than yeah, what they have. Yes. Years. That, that's been the other part is that the thermostats are um, controlled by a system that we no longer have access to. And so that's something that needs to be dealt with as well. Yeah, we want to keep it very simple. We're still having heck with the system that we got in the back, you know, heating and cooling in the right temperature. So we'll need to make sure that we address it, that it's simple. Definitely. We don't want it complicated. No. <laughs> well, good. Okay, so that's going to be taken care of. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Appreciate that. You know what? Math book? <laughs> Well, it's terrible to have something new that doesn't work or doesn't work right. New? Hmm, the one funny. here. It's, oh, it's, the one here. Yeah. It's, we have them in here all the time. Oh. And they're in here adjusting it, trying to figure it out. So they're not off the hook yet. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. It's okay. You've been comfortable with me. I'm very comfortable with it. <laughs> My next item is about um, carpeting and uh, in the children's department, as well as flooring in the children's classroom. I'm happy to say that um, I got the third of three quotes yesterday afternoon. And um, so I've got three quotes in. And uh, the uh, least expensive quote um, also includes for them to move the uh, the shelving that we have. We'll have to move the books, but it includes them moving the shelving down there while they're putting the carpet in. And it looks like a really good quote. And for both the vinyl flooring and for the carpet, it is about uh, a little bit more than $20,000. And we will be deciding on which one gets that. Um, so that, that will be done, and hopefully we can get it done so good. Are and we gonna, do have the funds to to take care. Are of you that. using carpet squares or rolls of carpet? It's going to be carpet squares, and then we're going to get the vinyl flooring like what you have here in Village Hall for the classroom. That'd be good. Um, the other was for the stairwell to be closed off, which that was done in June twenty twenty. The second goal is a community services goal, 1.1H, um, and I changed it to uh, create library building that has a greater ease of access. Um, it was discovered that the building when it was built was ADA compliant at the time and that we're not required to bring it up to current standards unless we build a new building. Um, so what we want is a building with greater ease of access, and one of the things that we'd like to have for that greater ease of access eventually is finding money to put in uh, automatic doors. So it's easier for those that are older, that are on crutches or in wheelchairs, to be able to get in and out of the library building. Um, one of the things that we were looking at was changing the restrooms, but taking a second look at it, um, we do have a staff bathroom that is ADA compliant, American with Disabilities Act, it's compliant. And if anyone who has a caregiver who's the opposite sex, that is where we can let them go to help that individual. Okay. 
Sounds good. So that's what we've decided to do with that. Anybody have any questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, the next goal is economic development goal two. Complete well-trained customer-oriented staff sufficient to serve all users. As we just discussed before, we will discuss um, filling positions. Um, that was the first item there, but we'll discuss that during budget process, so I won't go over that area unless anyone has any questions there. And the next portion of that is um, we uh, increased our budget for travel and schools and we have rearranged and started doing a training program in libraries large libraries you are more specialized in what you do in the different departments in a smaller library you're not specialized you learn how to do everything so we're rotating all the library assistants so <coughs> that they learn children's services as well as adult services they're also learning how to do copy cataloging and interlibrary loan and other reference kind of services. And we're getting all this training as well um, through different ways, but online training and in-house training because this stuff, uh, these are things that I've done in all the different jobs that I've had. And so um, they're getting training on all of these, but we increased the budget so that we could pay for courses that would help uh, train them. And everything's always changing in the library world, so it's a good thing to have that kind of money so that they're constantly learning with the way that things change in a library. Um, we've completed SOPs. We will add new ones as needed and make sure that we update those that we currently have and uh, the training plan is being developed along myself and the youth services librarian. She's doing the training of the library assistants and youth services. And we will de develop a program that um, we'll use uh, from beginning to end. It's still being developed right now. Both of us are learning a lot. <laughs> The next goal is Economic Development Goal 2, Action 2.1C, develop adult programs and program series to support job seekers and potential business owners and entrepreneurs. I must say right now, it's since we opened back up in July, we've been easing into different kinds of programming and still with the training trying to figure out where we're going to go with adult programming and how we're going to get it started. Um, I spoke with an individual who's actually teaching some classes at ENMU, and he's willing to um, have some classes at the library that involve job seekers oh, nice. um, and also um, possible training for those who want to develop small businesses. So that's in workforce solutions or? Uh, no, actually, it would, he just teaches there, and um, I've spoken to him. He came to the library to get a library card, and so um, we had a good visit, and um, it's something that he's willing to do about. I'm going to speak to him some more about that. Good job. Good. Uh, <coughs> uh, we want to develop more adult programs, more use uh, young adult services. We uh, have a lot of things going on right now for kids, and we want to expand that as well. We're looking forward to um, possibly doing a program in April for um, Day of the Book, Day of the Child, that would um, involve uh, possibly having a little bit of entertainment as well as some different stories being read and things for, for children for that day. Um, and there's other things that we want to do as well, special days like Dr. Seuss Day. Mm -hmm. and, um, we want to reach out to the community and we want to be able to try to start doing programming outside the building, going to the school, going to a business, 
uh, a daycare and possibly doing some programming that way. Um, the next goal, is there any questions as far as programming is concerned? That's good. The next goal is community services goal 1.1H, develop more services to serve and support all community members, including those unable to physically visit the library. Something that we've done is we've expanded the uh, amount of money that is spent on e-books and e-audio books. And since COVID began, we have just really almost doubled the number of uh, e-book users and checkouts than we had at the beginning of it. Um, so we've expanded the amount of money that we spend on those. Uh, we're part of a consortium of about 40 different libraries in New Mexico, and they all buy, and they're all that is purchased is shared with all those libraries. So there's a collection of, uh, I believe that I saw yesterday that the whole collection is about 29,000 titles. And this is all done through e-services? E-services. You just yes. have a code, and then you're able to... Uh, you have to actually download an app to be able to um, read the e-books or listen to the e-audios. Um, and and we, they have to have a card. They have to have yes, a you have to have card, a library so. card number and a PIN number to be able to access it. Okay. Yes. So you down, download the app, but then are you online when you're actually reading? Or? No, you have a choice, actually. Um, there's some that will allow you to read it online. Usually it's downloaded mm -hmm. so that you're reading from your own device and you're not online. Like okay, so, so now that particular book is yours permanently or does 30 it, days? Or it's, you get, actually get it for two or three weeks. Yeah. Okay, then it's Is disappears. what it's checked out to you. Then it automatically it self destructs. Back to the <laughs> yes. And if you don't turn it's, it back in, you lose your device. It's just like Mission Impossible. <laughs> it's, yeah, I like your, the Amazon books where, where, where you can. Uh, you can you get it free, but they take it back after X amount of days. That's true. Yes, just like that. And the system works well, and everybody loves it that utilizes it. Uh, we have databases. We don't always keep the same databases. We always go and see if they're getting utilized. And if they're not getting utilized, we see if we need to do more marketing to try to get them better utilized. And those that just don't make it, we try to find new databases to take their places that will be good for the community. Um, right now we have Ancestry that you can only access at the library itself. And we have um, PebbleGo and PebbleGo Next for the kids. We have Tumble Books. We have um, the eBooks for OverDrive. Um, and then we also have access to various databases from the state library um, <coughs> that also have a lot of information and help for job seekers and also for um, kids for homework help and for developing skills that they're um, behind in. The workforce training is something that we were looking at possibly becoming a hub um, that's not going to happen because we do have Workforce Solutions Hub already here in Rio Doso. Um, but we want to look into working with them and any of the businesses in town to either purchase databases or do more than what we're doing right now to help them um, to get more people to apply that, you know, because they don't have enough people. Whatever they might need us to do, uh, I know that one of the things that we do is a lot of the servers come to the library to mm -hmm. take the course so that they can become a server. Homebound services. Um, I looked into this, and the state library has a service for, for those that are homebound. It used to be just for the visually impaired, but now it's for those that are homebound. And this includes um, those that can only read large print materials. Right. Um, so if we have someone in Riodosa who is homebound, 
we can get them an application that they can fill out and send to the state library and become a part of their um, books by mail program. And that's all I have to present to you today. Thanks for your hard work. Very good, awesome. Thank you. Yes. Denise, are there literacy cl classes or is there any plan for that? I'm sorry? Uh, literacy classes at one time were at the library. Is there, is that Right all? now, we do have the uh, Lincoln County Adult Literacy who is renting space there. Um, they have the adult, uh, the literacy coordinator and her assistant that are both working there. And then they have volunteers that work on a one-on-one -on -one one basis, basis with individuals that um, need help with various types of literacy, whether it be reading or math or needing help studying for, to get a CDL license or help for a regular driver's license. These are the kinds of things that they do. Yeah, good. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. Good, Denise. Thank you. Mayor and Council, that uh, concludes your reports from our first uh, meeting of uh, community services. And next we're going to be moving in to uh, public safety. And our team leader on that one is Mr. Cook. Cook. So, Dick, you want to come on up and introduce your team members and start off with your presentations? Okay. We didn't have any team members here. Dick. I thought the fire department was going to go. They got Dick, Dick. Dick's the team leader of that of that team. Oh, he is. So, yeah, Dick, if you come come up and sit in front oh. and, and then introduce your team. Oh, he, he's got to step in like Samantha did with all the others. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Who else is on your team, Dick? Yeah, we already did that. You worked team. with. Yeah, we already did. Yeah, that's all right. Thank you, Joe. Mm. 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 Another one, I think, is tourism, team tourism. Yeah. Mayor, we completed uh, team tourism. They went first. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I was talking to oh. him that she's just sitting in here for her own good graces, I guess. She doesn't have a job, so they're, she they're still. <laughs> There's still eight, 18 um, departments <clears throat> to present. Uh, you know, I'd ask that all the uh, teams stay while their uh, fellow team members are presenting. Mm -hmm. So, Elizabeth, you're welcome to stay, or or uh, you can go if you like. It's very educational. Yeah. Okay. But, um, yeah, if, if we could stay there to support your fellow team um, members as we present. So, thank you, guys. Thank you. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Council Manager Dodge, thank you for your time. Um, <clears throat> purpose statement for Rito's Fire Department is to preserve life and property, be safe, and be courteous. <laughs> Pretty simple. Sure. Any recommendations or changes? Yeah. Like it? Okay. Uh, we'll move on to the org chart. Um, I can go through here and uh, just Mayor, kind of Mayor, just uh, real quick, if I may interrupt for a second. You know, I've, I've asked that a couple of the other uh, department heads sit in or department uh, leadership sit in because, you know, as, as we all know, Cody's going to be transitioning out. So mm -hmm. I want to make sure that the other um, individuals involved with the departments are aware of the process and um, how it's built. So just real quick, um, Dick, if you don't mind, again, just kind of explaining the process just for a couple of the other members that joined us today so that they understand, you know, the tactical and master plan and whatnot. If you don't mind, Mayor. Hey, the, the process we have is that uh, beginning about well, this time of year, we start putting together a plan, and it's for the next fiscal year. And each, the tactical plan includes five goals from each department. Those are what we call the big rocks, the main things. All of the directors and departments have multiple goals in addition to that that kind of fit in as little rocks as you go through the <coughs> But after the goals are uh, talked about and decided on, then the budget's made for, to meet those goals. <clears throat> after it's budgeted, then we actually have a 
procedure where we go through each quarter and every employee that has a goal is actually performed and they're rated on their performance for that quarter. And the first quarter is is July to I'm sorry, yeah, the first of July till September and the second quarter and third quarter and the fourth quarter. So every employee in the department and in the village actually has a goal that's agreed to by their supervisor and there's some of those goals that are paid for performance. Employees can have up to 4% incentive pay per year and those are for performance goals that actually move the department or the village forward and it may be moving from a level three to a level four and maybe uh, taking a course that's a tough course that it actually helps you manage better or something like that. <clears throat> Those performance goals are agreed to by the supervisor and the employee but then they're also reviewed by the deputy or the village manager. <clears throat> and so as you go through your ratings, quarterly ratings, if some employee meets one of those goals, <coughs> then they get the incentive right there. They don't have to wait till the end of the year. And so this is the way that it ties between the comprehensive plan, which is a 20-year plan that's refined into a five-year strategic plan, which is activated into one-year tactical plans, which is a yearly plan and budget for that year. And it's just a reoccurring cycle that goes year after year after year. Of course, after the first five years of, of a fiscal plan, a strategic plan, then everything's looked at again and, and reaffirmed that uh, the next five years is going to produce this. And it just keeps on going and eventually you get into another comprehensive plan down the road and so it keeps you moving forward is basically what it does good job thank you dick, thank you, dick. oops thank you dick <laughs> okay continue with the org chart um, myself at the top and like we talked about pete hall he's one of our captains that's on today and he's part of the leadership and he'll be able to move things forward and uh, he's going to be very helpful in operations and just information over the years. He's been here a long time, so um, I'm glad he's here. Um, so our assistant chief, our assistant fire chief, James Pribble, and emergency manager, Joe Kay, they're um, what we would call command staff. Um, and then our office manager, Elaine, she kind of works above and below all of us to help everything to, to run efficiently. And then below that is more of a, a management supervisor of operations. Uh, uh, our airport manager, Austin Nelson, and then next to him, it's red, our fleet maintenance, uh, heavy equipment mechanic between fire, airport, emergency services, wherever he needed. Um, and just an update, working with HR, there are some, some hopes in the, in the hopper and that we're working through, so um, that is working out. And then our Who, A-shift Who's captain, doing the maintenance now? Um, anybody I mean, and it, everybody. All of us so in the department, within the department take, still, right? We're trying to do what we can in-house and then work with Jerry and Lonnie and, and That's what I was some ask. of it out. Okay. Um, yes, sir. Um, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, um, as, as uh, Chief Thetford uh, said, you know, I think we have somebody in that looks very promising. Okay. That, uh, you know, we should be able to look at filling that position within the next couple of weeks. Okay. Uh, and then our three shift captains that, that take care of operations on the 4896. A shift is uh, Captain Cameron Sidwell. B shift is Captain Jared Wilson. And C shift is Captain Kate Hall. And just a little history with them. Those guys were all hired on the same day, same year. Oh, boy. September of 05. So they've been here a long time. And very birthdays too. Close. <laughs> very valuable guys there. Um, lieutenants, A shift, Chase Tanner. Jerry Corliss on B shift and William Green. And then under those, and we kind of divide it up to kind of shows the fire department side of the operation and the airport as we move down. But uh, our firefighters, Price Bowen, Anthony Franks, Quaid Hall, <coughs> Justin Owen, Anthony Nance, Nathan Fox, 
Lane Southard, Jeffrey Miles, Alec Davis. We got John Herring back from Carlsbad, Victor Perez, Sean Keller, and Austin Tucker. And we do have two vacancies uh, to be filled. Um, and we have some potential candidates that we're going to try to get interviewed over the next few weeks and um, hopefully get those filled and, and be whole by the first quarter of the year. Um, under Austin uh, Nelson out at the airport, uh, we have six line techs, Daniel Bastardo, Anthony Luna, and Jesse Reynolds, which they're, they're all the three airport guys that transitioned during the merge. Uh, Nicholas Shields, Justin Mize, and Kel Frierson. And that, that makes up Redos, uh, the fire department, emergency management, airport, and everything in between as we merge. So you'll, you'll see that this same work chart is for emergency management and the airport. There's, it's going to be the same. We don't have an office manager at the airport? No, sir. That, that position went away? Yeah, well, whenever we, uh, myself and Joe Kay were doing it, and then Goss retired, and then as we set this up, um, with Nelson out there as airport manager and doing some of the office duties, because we have uh, line techs uh, that are on call 24 hours a day that are taking <coughs> care of the operations, this individual is able to stay in the office administratively and answer the phones and take care of the agreements, contracts, and work with our pilots and, and our customers. Okay. Mayor, Mayor Pro Temp, if, if we're to look at the uh, previous org chart, we turned that FT uh, into the office manager position into uh, a line tech a position. A line tech position. Correct. Any other questions on the org chart? Just uh, two vacancies and then uh, fleet maintenance vacancy. Yes, sir. And it's looking really good, and, and that's all just because of y'all support, the pay plan, and then just getting through the processes and getting us together, more staff, less shortages. It's, it's really working out so far. Mayor, Mayor Pro Temp, there is some additional duties that Elaine has picked up in regards to helping to administer the department. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you may be able to recruit out of Deming right now. Yeah. We, we, yeah, yeah. How exactly. come, John? Uh, 14 out of 21 resigned. Yeah, they did as of yesterday oh my or day before. Goodness. Yeah, Monday. Oh, Demi, huh? Due to pay, they was on the news on KOAT. So they, 15 out of 18 resigned for making 12 dollars an hour and no support, and no help. It's a lot prettier up here. Yeah, exactly. Any recommendations or suggestions on the org chart or questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll move into the first goal. First TAC plan uh, for fire protection goal one, chapter 13-2 in the comp plan. Uh, uh, staffing for safety and emergency response, recruitment and retention. Uh, myself, along with the village manager and, and finance and the support of the mayor and the council, we're responsible for that. I'll try to keep you up to date on, you know, just calls and volume and everything that we're doing to make good decisions uh, for emergency response. Um, that's going to be continuous. And, and like we showed last year, um, in the description, just where the department come from, some of the standards through NFPA and OSHA that we follow. But moving through here, you know, I, I looked at from last year, it showed 220 short staff days in 2020. I reevaluated that and looked at our, we had an increase in call volume, but we also mitigated our short staff days in 21 from 220 down to 133. And that was all because of our merge, uh, the additional staffing, and having available crews instead of having, you know, 18, you know, now, now we're 31 whole, it, you know, as the positions fill and vacant. But it made it a lot easier to fill those voids and, and empty seats on trucks, whether it's a COVID issue or we have fires going on and we're just trying to fill seats. So cutting that from 220 to 133, that's, that's significant. Yeah, it is. And, and we're running a lot safer. So um, that, that was the big numbers there. Um, we went through and showed that in 21, we added the four positions in the operations for the line tech and joining forces between the two operations has, has been a success. Um, and then on the next page, it goes into some of the numbers, um, you know, just the call volume increase due to COVID or tourism, special events, as we all know, we're growing and want more people in town. Um, but we put the numbers here to just kind of show our call volume over the years and then the added air ops. Um, a lot of people didn't know and were asking about that. So... Um, we ran 1,899 calls in 2021 through the fire department and emergencies within and around the village. And that includes helping Mescalero, the Downs, Benito, whoever, wherever we need to go to assist until it gets under control. 
Um, we went as far as Capitan when they had a grass fire and needed help. Um, and then the air ops, you know, they're doing over 4,000 air operations, and that may be tugs or fuel or parking or, you know, if there are landing gear issues or just whatever it is. So when you look at that, you know, you're looking at over 6,000 operations in 365 days. Um, and those numbers do include, and, and Austin and these guys will get into that with the airport, but, you know, that does include uh, med flights yeah, and, and emergencies that, that aren't just during the day mostly. You know, that some of that's at night. And, you know, it looks like we're averaging about one a day. Talking to these other Native Air and, and other companies, uh, the statistics are showing we're averaging one a day. So about 360-plus uh, medical flights out of Sierra Blanca a year. Yeah, of course, some days we don't have any, and others we may have five. It just, you know, it's the weekends and, and how that happens. And we're seeing a lot more now due to the, sh uh, the hospitals being full and not being able to take home, or some of the stuff that, that you would have normally kept here and tried to treat, they're having to send them somewhere. So they're flying them to Lubbock, El Paso, Albuquerque, just to get them in a bed and get them out of the hallway. So we're going to see that number go up as 2022 um, comes to a close. Cody, yes, so these numbers also reflect this. Say the 1899. It reflects um, when a 911 calls out for emergency with the ambulance, and do so. Do y'all dispatch immediately as well? Yes, ma'am. So in our system, Councilor and uh, Mayor, uh, when they call 911 and dispatch receives that call, um, it may be an EMS call, COVID, a wreck, a fire, a gas leak. It, who knows what it is? They'll page us out immediately. We'll respond and, and take care of it. But just to give you a reference, out of roughly 1,900 calls, 80% of those are going to be a medical, uh, wow. some kind of treatment, if you will, as a patient. And 30% of those are going to be some kind of fire, dumpster fire, car fire, wreck, grass fire, structure fire, something, uh, hazmat, you know, whatever that is, that's going to be 30%. So out of 1,000, 800 of those are going to be medical and two roughly 100 is going to be a fire call. Okay. Um, so that, that's a little bit about uh, staffing and emergency response. Uh, do you have any questions on that goal or recommendations? Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll make sure, and, and as Manager Dodge talked about my transition, I'm going to make sure that they know what I do, and, and our job is to bring you the information and let you support and give us your recommendations. And if that's airport, our emergencies, our staffing, we want to make sure and, and, and show in November and over the last year in, in 21, um, it worked perfect. So thank you for that. Goal two uh, from the comp plan, fire protection goal two, chapter 13-2, preparedness and emergency response policy 1.1, uh, fire apparatus maintenance and replacement program to improve emer uh, response to emergencies. Myself, uh, manager Dodge, finance, and state fire marshal's office um, are the responsible parties um, and to explain that, we get a lot of our funding through grants and stuff through the State Fire Marshal's Office. Um, working with Judy, um, one, of the, one of the challenges, as some of you that's been here a long time know, uh, one of our loans that we have that is roughly 90000 a year, me and Judy's tried everything. Everything we know that with her resources and State Fire Marshal's Office to get that paid off early and get that... Um, off of our back and out of the shadow, but we're, we're stuck to that to 2025. So until 2025, um, we're going to continue to do what we do, but that's going to open the doors for the village and the fire department to, to make better <coughs> finance choices and get better equipment and trucks in here. But, um, you know, we uh, maintain and, and service most of our equipment, from chainsaws to tools to fans, um, uh, but, you know, there are big trucks and there are certain things we can't do when it comes to emergency vehicles. Um, and so we, we, we farm that out to, to local or sometimes we have to go to Albuquerque or Cruces. But um, overall, um, it works. But it, once we get this uh, yeah. mechanic, we're going to save tens of thousands of dollars a year time on equipment being down and, and being somewhere 30, 60, 90 days trying to get fixed or get parts. Um, um, we do have the truck ordered and an update. This same story. I don't even like to talk about it and tell you, but supply chain issues and COVID. Truck is, is being built. It, it was supposed to be in here in January. It moves back and forward as things come in and trucks are moved around. But um, we should see uh, the new Class A truck here sometime mid-summer. 
So they're three, four. It, one minute they feel like it's September, and then they call and they feel like they're going to be in May. So they don't even like to tell you anymore. But the truck, um, we're hoping to get some pictures this month so we can uh, provide you all that information to see where we're at um, in uh, Wisconsin, I believe. Mayor, um, I, I think I, I heard they got all the parts, and they just got nobody to take it off the shelf. That's right. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. So that's the $650,000 a year uh, Class A, but that's the, yeah, the, the shorter <laughs> bed. Shorter, uh, it's going to go in Upper Canyon. Yeah, it has the four wheel drive capability. And first, that's the one that we saw. Yes. At the, yeah. yes, very exciting. It's a um, good truck. We worked with Judy over the last oh, probably six months. We have 99% of all the equipment needed to go in the truck, and it's in a Connex, it's locked up, um, it's accounted for. And when that truck gets here, they'll be able to put it in service within a few days of just training and equipping the truck and getting all the brackets and everything on. Um, uh, I said a few days, probably a few weeks um, to get that done. Uh, that's my hope. Mayor, I do, I do have a serious question um, well. to ask. Judy, with the, the payoff that you're talking about, is there early uh, payoff penalties, or what's the what's the the issue yes, that there is? They just won't let us pay it off early because it's not written into the debt agreement. But since you guys know them, they might be in a position now to um, maybe you and Ron can call and what, see. What's it. the payoff? Nine grand is. Uh, I think it's two years. Ever. Nine uh, one eighty. No, it's, I think it's going to be uh, it's closer to because it's two years more. Yeah, Ron, let's see if we can sneak in a junior oh, bill for like three hundred thousand. It's ninety thousand a year, so we got twenty-two oh, and three and five. Okay, ninety grand times. So okay. two seventy. I mean, with early, I don't know what we save, but roughly fifty, probably. Mayor, we're going to try to sneak in a junior bill for about three hundred thousand. Sneak, sneak it in. I'm telling you, this is a, a clear example of people making a bad hire, not paying attention as a council way back then. And then letting one person make decisions that has no, had nothing to do with what's going on here. If and we'd had a parade in New change. York City, we'd have been right in there. I think we were. But it wouldn't even make the turn here in town. And we don't even have the truck, do we? Our truck was in the parade. We just weren't there. Oh, <laughs> oh who do we give that to? Uh, it, well, two of the Smills went to uh, Fire Trucks Plus there in California that we never. It was, oh, man. That was 12 years ago. Yeah. I'll, ma I'll make some calls and see if we can get, you know, get that worked out and see if we get some. Nice to in. be shed of that so we can that start would, on something else. That would put the fire department of the village in a great position to reestablish this uh, maintenance and replacement of apparatus. Because 15 year loan, you know, you're going to have those trucks at least 15 years and 15 years, those trucks are good for about 20, so it's almost the life of the truck. Well, our average fleet is 21 years old. The uh, oldest one in your report says 41. 41. My Lord. Um, so, let's see where we're at. Um, we're still applying for grants through AFG, fire, everything that comes up. Uh, most of the stuff that you guys send us and remind us of, Judy, Manager Dodge, and Mayor, always... We're on top of those things. We are applying for them. It's very competitive in the state of New Mexico. I think it's going to get better this coming grant season. But the more money that's filtered in, we've gotten word from the state fire marshal's office, they're going to be able to fulfill more grants with more money for more communities. But the biggest thing that, that I want to let the village and, and everyone know is that the problem, the biggest challenge on grants for the village of Redoso and our fire department is, is they look at population. And we're 8,800 on a good day or whatever that number is. But we know our weekends are 50,000, and we're running calls with these trucks and these crews. It doesn't match. It's on up and ends of the spectrum. But when you put in for these grants and Albuquerque's and Roswell's and, and cruises are showing these big numbers, um, you know, I feel like we're number 51, and they stop giving money at 50, and they tell us our grants are good. They make it through the whole process. They just run out of money. You know, and that, that gets old year after year, and I don't, I don't know how to fix that with these very Well, we're going to start a... Uh, an aggressive lobbying program. I know you were listening last night, so this yeah. is part of the plan that yeah. we're able to get in there and get ours. So we're going. Those are one of the things we're going to be working on: better access, better. Well, I am headed out, and I got nothing to lose. So you just 
give me the word and point, and I can crash the truck into the building. Or I can, <laughs> you know, I do whatever you want me to do. Make sure it's that 40 year old truck. Yeah, I'll use that. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Now you got a new bike, so. Yeah, I'll just use it. Get there, get there quick. Um, so just, it, and this is not so much a dedicated plan. It kind of depends on fire seasons and, and, and funding and the loan and just working with the state and the village. But, you know, the replacement of the Class A engine at Station 3 is ordered and should be delivered, we're hoping, by August and is in service. That's just worst-case scenario. Hopefully it's before that. Um, but then a, re a replacement Class A engine at Station 1, and that's where the two trucks that we're paying on, um, they're almost 20 years. They they're 2008 models. Um, but... They're not necessarily user-friendly in the village, as we know when they were bought. But uh, getting that Class A truck replaced as soon as the other one gets in service, and then replacing one in two Type 6s, which is our wildland trucks and rescue, whether it's cars or, or hiking or people getting in remote areas, um, in the next year. And that'll put us in a better place. Uh, after fire season with our RMP programs, we got things going that can bring money in. Uh, but until that happens, it's just kind of tentative. Any questions, suggestions, recommendations on that? Replacement, maintenance? No? No. Okay, moving on. Uh, comp plan goal number three. Um, Redoso is well prepared for emergencies policy 1.1, which is our fire protection in the village of Redoso, uh, our ISO class two rating. The fire chief, the village of Redoso, uh, water and street, they play a big, a big part of that. Um, Supporting and, and funding to maintain staffing apparatus equipment levels, which will satisfy our ISO 2, which is going to go on forever because we're hoping to move that to a 1, and I think we can. Um, uh, these guys, uh, you know, what this, what you're doing with dispatch and their uh, functions and what they're going to be capable of. Uh, the staffing levels merging the departments together, showing other stations, uh, response times, and the people we have on those response times is going to gain points. And then with Adam and his hydrant program, um, trying to find about 100, 150,000 to help us, help him, if you will, in the village. Repeat that who? Uh, Adam with, uh, I mean, uh, Our Adam sorry. Sanchez. Sorry, Adam, but with water and Marty and those guys. Oh. As production for what they supply to us, but right. then the hydrant system he takes okay. care of. Um, about 100, $150,000, uh, we can uh, contract out to get a third party company in here. What they'll do is, is They'll test and flow, maintenance, GPS, paint as a whole, uh, our hydrant systems, and tell us where they're at. Um, we could do it in-house, but you know how that looks on. We, we just go outside, we get that done once. You only have to do that every three years, but once it's done like that, then you can just keep up with it. And that's water is a big thing on ISO, showing what we can do and what's available. Um, and just an example is when they come in and, and do an audit, what they'll do is last time they picked uh, uh Pine Tree, Pine Top Square, where Schlotsky's and all yep. that is. Um, they go in there and they evaluate the businesses, the fire load, response time, and they'll say, once they calculate the flows, they'll say, you need to be able to flow, you know, 10,000 gallons a minute for an hour. Can you do it? So we work with Adam and Randy and, and village-wide, everybody. Uh, we set up porta tanks, ladder. We, we just show what we do and how we do it to get there, and we were able to show that. But we don't know where that's going to go next time and PRVs and pressures. And, you know, with Eric and all the water he's got going, I don't feel like we're going to have a problem anywhere in town right now. Um, but we have to make sure that those trucks can do that because when and, and our trucks somewhere between 1,000 and, and 2,000 gallons a minute, when you need 10,000, you got to have five good trucks that hold holding tank, water, and then what we have. So um, just to give you an idea of, of what we're up against when we do these audits, you got to have so many people there, so many trucks, flow so much water, and maintain that system safely for 30 to 60 minutes, wherever they choose. It could be at Swiss Chalet. It could be there at Upper Southern Canyon. Egypt, it could be in Upper Canyon. It could be at the Bells Building. We don't, we don't know. Um, and they can pick a random hydrant, and they usually go around town, and, and they just pick one, and they flow it, test it, open it, see if we have it documented. And, and we do. And we work on it constantly year-round. Um, so those are the things um, I feel confident that, that the village and the fire department in the next three years, whenever they come to do an audit, and it could be tomorrow or it could be in three years, they potentially could move to a one, which there again we know will save our residents and our, and our village uh, homeowners tons of money. 
it brings us more money in from state fire marshal and, and we have more opportunities for grants and funding when we show that. So, um, any questions on ISO? Nope. So the next uh, comp plan, fire protection goal four out of chapter 13-2 is implement a community risk reduction plan slash program. Uh, to myself, the assistant chief, and the help of the village of Redoso, um, we plan on, on we're, we're looking at doing that this coming year, as in January 22, to continue it. We've always done somewhat of it. Fire prevention and education is always a priority in the village. Um, we hit it real hard in October with our schools. But, you know, smoke detector programs, etc. we do that year-round. But we would like to, as you can read here, uh, develop a process to identify and prioritize local risk, followed by the integrated strategic investment of resources to reduce their occurrence and impact. Uh, a process to help communities find out what their risks are and develop a plan to reduce those risks viewed as high priority. Um, the steps involved in community risk reduction, conducting a risk assessment, developing the plan, and then implementing, and then evaluating that plan yearly to see if there's any updates or changes. Um, our assistant chief, James Pribble, very versed in this, has a lot of great ideas. He's going to be instrumental in moving this forward. Um, you know, if we can get that survey out, get the information back, and then work on that plan. And, and, it, and, and as you can see below, you know, talking about um, uh, smoke detector programs, elderly fall, fire inspections, you know, there's a lot that goes into it, but we want to know what the priority is of the village and the community so we can make sure and get that in there and show improvements over the years to come. Uh, with COVID-19, you know, there's a lot of uh, in-house programs they're doing around the country. To where instead of running these calls and overwhelm all hospitals, you know, there's grants and we're working on a safer grant that, that offers opportunities with funding and positions that, you know, maybe weekly or, or however that program works, we can go to the house and assess and triage these patients or help them, you know, whatever that is to keep them out of our hospitals and overwhelming our ambulance, fire, and, and local stuff. That's what we want to try to do. Um, so we're going to look at that. Um, any questions or suggestions? Well, when you're logging those kind of calls, do you have any idea like the uh, fallen and you have to go over and I mean I know people all the time that you're having to do that. We can go and get those to we report everything to the uh, INFERS National Fire Incident Reporting System and it breaks it down and that's kind of how we get funding and improve on our grants what we're doing falls we do a lot of falls heart attacks trouble breathing our elevation um, we're not a retirement community but we're kind of a retirement community uh, we have a lot of retirees here but we have a lot of individuals that that vacation or spend a few months of their summer here before they leave and go back to Florida. So they have a lot of blood pressure and, and, and things like that. So we do look at that. And that's what we see with 80% of these calls in medical is those. That, that's what we're running. Heart attacks, stroke, altitude sickness, uh, right now a lot of COVID, yeah. dehydration, <laughs> things like that. So hopefully these programs can help eliminate that strain on, on our system. Is there, are you getting a lot of calls? 911 calls from COVID? All of them. And, and it's the patient, I mean, it's the I person at positive, home? I tested positive, I can't breathe, I think I have COVID, I want to be checked, I, I need to go back to the hospital, I'm coming home from the hospital, and I, okay. I, it is just a okay. lot right now with COVID. So, yeah, but we can run, and we try to put some of that in, in the FYI's weekly a little bit, but not to freak anyone out, and Sure. Uh, staying in contact with Todd at the hospital. And okay. It's a lot of COVID right now. So we're, we're from your previous statement, we're not that short on uh, staffing. Is the hospital still short on staffing? Yes. I, I actually, uh, when Joe Case sent out the COVID update today, I actually emailed him, and I don't, I don't know if it's possible or they're willing to put it out because it's probably not going to look very good. But part of that report, I feel like, should show staffing levels at that hospital. So our community knows how important it is and the transparency that they're, yeah, they may hire however many this week, but that many left or found a better job or went somewhere. Whatever the challenge is, you know, staffing levels should be part of that, that report, I think. Are you talking about nurses or the emergency? Everything at the hospital. Emergency room, you go in there, you won't recognize anybody. Staffing, uh, these nurses are quitting and going to work independent for agencies, and then all we're doing is switching them from one communities to the other coming in, and as a result, 
as long as the federal government sustains this two hundred dollars an hour stuff for nursing, it's going to keep going on until it doesn't. So, and I thought you know, it, it, I thought when they allowed you know they're allowing nurses and people if they don't have symptoms even though they test positive, they're working the hospital force. Mm -hmm. They're working with COVID. It's not even helping. Short staffing. So. Um, uh, and I know several that are going to PTSD, um, psychological counseling, counseling and, all that. and a lot of the stuff. So it's pretty traumatic on them. And, um, they're working six or seven, 12, 15 hour shifts. They're working every day because they're short staffed. And that's a lot of the reason they're quitting. They're just like, well, I can't do it anymore. Right. Now, we had, had did we talk about um, doing in house ambulance? An in-house ambulance? Yeah, like, like, taking over the ambulance. Oh, uh, that no. not not no. We haven't talked about it. You know that that Where certificate did I get that? and uh, that certificate. We did talk about the certificate coming up in I think twenty twenty three, um, where the the contract between the village and the ambulance okay. and, and all that okay, would come up, and then okay. if that's what the village decided to do, and okay. I guess so I, I think could. it's a bad idea. I think we should still partner, but I think our fire department should have an ambulance in it for, you know, we're all, if we need transport, we don't have it. They got five ambulances running and you know how that but, is. But we're not even subsidized by the hospital and the runs that we make. It's all village. No. And the county's it, not subsidized. The state gives us some from EMS Fund Act and, and, we, and we do have some of the state fire marshal's office money that um, if that was a decision or the goal, um, there is funding out there. And Manager Dodge has had some good ideas and we've talked about it. Um, so our There's a lot they could do countywide to raise money, but I mean, uh, our response time is still faster than the hospitals, right? Yes. The All county right. has a one eighth um, yep. authority to implement that would be a countywide tax right. for emergency medical and communication services. But they won't do it for some reason. So, as some of our firemen, they take people to other communities transport. No, no, oh, okay. just the okay. hospital. Okay. Just okay. our hospital. Just hospital. We ride in with the ambulance if they're shorthand. If they show up and know all they have is a driver, we're already treating the patient. We have, whether we have IV started or CPR in progress, we'll okay. load up and work the patient while the driver drives us to the hospital, and then we just show up and pick them up and take them back. And Got it. Okay. We work together. Yeah, I mean, and you guys do an awesome job. I know several people that the, the surgeons, the doctors from you know El Paso. Albuquerque, whatever, will call back and want to know, say, you know, your first responder was the police officer that got him in there, got him out of the chair, got him on the ground, was trying to perform CPR. You guys showed up, hit him two, three, four times with a paddle, revived him, stabilized him, got him to the hospital. They did additional stuff. They said it was a miracle that we have that type of training and staff here in this community. Yes, sir. Yeah, my so. family has um, not enjoyed, but been Used. the recipient yeah. of great services from the fire department before the ambulance got there. So, well, that's thanks to y'all and all the money and training and what you allow us to do and the service that we want to provide, and y'all make that happen for us. So, thank you. He's buttering you up right now. See how that is. Mr. Mayor, working the budget already, man. Yeah, <laughs> Mr. Mayor and Chief, just to yes, update sir. us today uh, at the hospital, we have six licensed ICU beds and three in use. Uh, we have 13 med surge beds, nine in use. We have no one on ventilators, no one on BiPAP, which is kind of, for those who don't know, it's a type of ventilation before you go to intubation. And Vapotherm is kind of in the middle. None of those either. However, the take home is that through the last week, through the ER and the clinics, they had 117 positive COVID tests. So That was just at the hospital. That's just at the hospital. So, no, it's not. Contrary to public opinion, it is not getting better. I don't see it getting better, and I'm only waiting on the fourth surge of whatever iteration this virus will be. Um, I think the only saving grace, if there is one, is that at least with the current infection rates, those that have been immunized and, and with or without their booster are far less likely by... Of those, only six, 10 to 16 percent would ever get sick enough to be admitted. But it doesn't mean they're not sick. It doesn't mean you're not going to get called because they can't breathe. They can't. All of those have to be sorted in the ER. 
as to whether they're oxygenating and, and their temperatures and, and their physical states. And we haven't even, we haven't even touched on influenza. Now, uh, that's another variable in the equation that's going to really impact on everyone, especially first responders, uh, because that's going to trip the wire for the next series of these COVID infections. Because you're, I mean, uh, you're, it was one thing to fight the flu, it's quite another to fight the flu and then fight the COVID too, so. I wish you were America's doctor. <laughs> Instead of, I mean, because I could just say it and yeah, <coughs> dance and, and I actually it. believe you, so. I'm, I'm <laughs> no, but Wayne got tested for curative, yes. positive. He and had Joe called next. Dr. Moffitt to bring him up. Yeah. Yep. She wanted yep. her to go get yep. tested in the hospital just to be sure. Oh, was in the van. Yeah. So I don't know. Emergency says, management? Uh, curative. Yeah. Yeah. I'll stay here for more support. Of course, I like them. I got <laughs> tested in the hospital. Go up there, no appointments. I was the first one in line at 8 o'clock. still out the first one. Yeah. Hey, okay, Mayor, Council. Good job. Good afternoon. Um, Joe Kajabowski, emergency manager. Say it one more time, slowly. Kajabowski. Kajabowski. So we've Kajibowski. had different pronunciations here. <laughs> Thanks for sure. I've only known him like three, four years. I just want to make sure. Joe, I just call him Joe K. Yeah. yeah. That's what I call him. You share it with a great uh, Coach K. So there you go. Yeah, Coach K. So the um, purpose statement, we use the one that, with the fire department and then the org chart, we, we're utilizing the same org chart as well. So the first goal for the emergency management um, for the compound goal policy 2.1 prioritize education and enforcement so residents understand the importance of defensible space, learn how to adapt their buildings, properties, so that residential landscapes and hazards in high hazard areas maintain adequate zones of defensible space in the event of a wildfire. We'll work with the emergency notification systems to ensure residents and visitors are signed up for to receive notifications. Provide links to public to ensure that they have access to emergency resources and fire safety items. Um, the responsible parties is the emergency manager, the PIO, and the fire chief, which we update that our website regularly with all the information we can obtain. Um, we will use the sign around town, the sign out in front of the fire station. We use that to advertise some of the to sign up for um, the emergency notification system as well as fire season issues. Oh, yeah. and website and um, even social media at this time. If I can make a suggestion, because we did this, I don't know, six, seven years ago, with the drought being as it is, and this is going to be a real dry spring and summer, um, we, we did some advertisement at the movie theater. Because uh, I remember uh, Mills Harlan back then that, you know, just making those alerts again of our smoking ordinance and and uh, yes, the sir. worrying about building an outside campfire. Because yes, a lot of our, you know, seasonal and just weekenders, they might um, go to the movie theater. And, and I thought that was a very good, because they have the spaces before the movie yes, sir, the showing those advertisements and... I don't know how how they go about it, but I thought I saw one of those uh, flips in there, and it was really well done and, and very informative, really straight to the point as far as, you know, advertising. Council Mayor, we'll look into that. Myself and the Chief will get with Carrie and see what we need to do to come up with um, some type of advertisement that we can put there. Even if we have to come up with a little funding, we'd probably manage to do a little funding if they have it. An advertisement fee as well, so we can. Yeah, we can look into I'm that. sure there's a fee, but right. so we can we can look into that. Yes, sir. Yeah, because you. Had, oh, I'm sorry. Go, no, go ahead. I, all I was going to say is I had seen, I think it was this week uh, on social media about uh, uh, asking uh, the town, the village, the tourists, please don't put your ashes in the, in the dumpster. In the dumpster, right? I guess there had been there's several fires, dumpster yes. fires. So, yeah, that I, I did see that. Mayor Crawford, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Salas, Carrie Gladden would be your contact person. That's she's the one that set it up. So, okay. she worked with the with the uh, theater. So, okay, right, perfect. 
Sounds like we need to get with short-term rentals and make them provide a metal can of some kind because these people are cleaning their fireplace out to meet their deposit requirements, I bet you. And so maybe we need to set down with short-term rentals and add that to That's our licensing, point. that they have some way to deposit that in a fireproof canister. And not in a cardboard box. Yeah, or a paper <laughs> bag like we've had it done. So, um, again... We need to. That's something that we can put in your plan to reach out to short-term rentals and see how we can come up with something that you think would be adequate. We can do that. You know, uh, you know, I got a short-term rental and I have a policy, and it's noted for the homeowner. I mean, not for the homeowners, but for the uh, guests. It says that the responsibility to clean out the fireplace is the housekeeping, uh -huh. and not yours. So please just leave it. So, Mayor, Council, one thing we did a few years ago, and we can do it again, I think it was 2018, We, I went and personally met with a lot of the um, short-term rental and, and condo uh, uh, rental. Managers, mm -hmm. and we went over the, the code that we had updated and talked about all the fire safety tips, and we had given them like a flyer and carried it up us make flyers, um, and we haven't done that in a while during COVID, I don't know why, I think it just kind of slipped through the cracks, so um, I'll make sure and try to get that going again with Joe Kay. Um, because some that's not on here that we have been utilizing, and I know y'all know because you hear the PSAs, but your radio station. We have a yeah, new exactly. member of our department that puts out a PSA, and we'll make sure that this is one of the PSAs that we do um, during the winter time for, for our residents and our short-term rentals, so we can have that. Mary, you know, I, I agree, and you know, I don't believe the uh, short-term rental has been updated since I was a community development. I think we need to take a look at it, and on the permit, um, when we issue the permit, I think that's one of the rules that we should include in, in the in the permit. But in addition to that, I think there's opportunities that have developed, just like we're talking with Team Tourism and we're, as we're looking at the at uh, the tours, you know, that uh, QR code, you know, if we simply just stick it on the permit and, and you know, put uh, for ongoing activities, the village would also hit the QR code and it puts you to, with the widget, you know. So there's things like that that I think we need to revisit that whole permit. So I'll, I'll uh, communicate that to Samantha and work with the two departments. And I, one reason we got out of the short-term rental business is because the people that we were paying to do that, mm -hmm. they would overload the dumpster that they had loaded up from the previous two houses. They hit ours, and then they'd hit the dumpster at the end of our street. So I still think we need some sort of fireproof mechanism that on how, they need to have a disposal is that a protocol. Pun? Is that a pun? What? Fireproof. Fireproof, yeah. I mean, but I think we need to have protocol on how they are to dispose of the ashes. Because we've had quite a few houses that have burnt down the last couple of years that we can specifically say they did that with ashes. The Coca fire allegedly was started by somebody cleaning out their fireplace. The what fire? Coca Pelle. Coca Pelle, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that burned down 22 houses? 29, I remember. Well, my daughter cleans houses and she says she'll go to the house and they will have taken and just dumped it out the back. Out, on the, out onto the, the deck. Yes. When you had off Carrizo Canyon last year, the year before, they took it out behind the house and dumped it in a little draw, and it caught on fire. Yep. I don't think they realize that 12 or 24 hours is not enough. Mm. Without water on it, yeah. soaking it. And with the high just, grass. And yeah, you get a little bit of breeze on that, and yeah. it comes right back to life. Yeah. Okay, so on... Um, on that first plan um, description, um, utilize social media, local news outlets, and keep residents and visitors aware of fire risk. Um, utilize the LED sign at fire, near fire station one to place information where register for the emergency notification system. Use social media to advertise the links or to find the emergency notification system sign up and emergency preparedness information. Attend community functions, assist residents with signing up for the NS system and then, then discuss the siren system. So we do have a siren system down a little further. So simplify choices and links on resources available to help people respond to emergencies to provide all residents, and businesses, and visitors clear and specific directions to follow so everyone knows the rules. Direct residents to the, to the links on the Village of Ridos webpage for emergency management and fire section. These sites include FireWise, Defendable Space, and Emergency notification links. So we, we've we been working with Carrie to kind of get all that updated so we, it makes it easier for visitors to find the information. So 
we did it in April of last year, so April of this year we're going to go ahead and advertise on the sign to sign up for their emergency notification system again. And I, um, we're going to use social media throughout the year to remind people where to sign up and have the link there to sign up for the emergency notification system. The ENS system calls um, on signing up for EMS, so we can, for the ENS, we can send out an ENS call, make sure people know that they can tell everybody, neighbors, friends, to sign up for the emergency notification system as well. Um, participate in community events to sign up for re sign up residents for the emergency notification system. So any, like the home and garden show, any events like that that um, we used to before COVID, we were going. I was going to those events and setting up a booth and helping people sign up as well. Is this the Call Me Rudoso? Yes, sir. It is the Call Me Rudoso. Um, then we're, I'm going to work get with Tim and the radio station where we're going to work on some PSAs with the radio station, whether it's for the emergency notification system. The fire stuff, we'll get, we'll get in there and do some more. And then share it with the other radio stations. Yes, share with all other radio stations. And then we're in the process of going to be reviewing the evacuation route signs <coughs> and updating any signs if needed. So that's the first one. So the second goal, um, emergency and siren notifications system. Um, we're going to look at the, that's going to be um, the emergency management, DHSEM, and finance. I'm going to be putting in for some grants as they come along to help out with the siren systems, provide a comprehensive sign, signage plan, educational outreach, and enforcement regarding emergencies. We need to purchase, this was pro, last year, back in 2020, 2021, three additional sirens. We actually were able to purchase two, and we got two new sirens put up, one at Pikes Peak and one off of Middle Fork. Middle Fork. So we, we added those two sirens. So we have a total of 11 sirens now throughout the village. Oh, wow. And we have, um, see, I thought I had a year here. I don't have the year of the oldest one. So we're going to start a siren replacement program because we have some really old sirens out there. Like 1950. It says 50 years old, yeah. 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 They're from the 50s. But they don't they make them swimming pool. Oh, yeah, I remember that one. We'll take them down, we'll take them over and put them in the museum. Yeah. <laughs> the Heritage Museum. Yeah. <laughs> Do these operate with a crank? Almost. 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 Not cheap. I don't think it's going to meet the policy. <laughs> so we're going to try to start a policy of a uh, plan of changing two sirens out per year, and they cost about 20000 per unit to change out. So. Oh. They're, they're top of the line, state of the art, new sirens. If you're up in the area of the Swish Lake on the 1st of the 15th of 5, you can hear, hear that one there. Yeah, I do. And, and uh, a big thanks to P&M. They partnered with us during we put these two sirens up. And Joseph and his crew, I must have met with those guys 50 times to get these sirens up the right way the first time. They uh, dug the hole, provided the power poles, biggest ones they had, put them up, secured the siren to it before it went up, and then on their program, hooked the uh, meters up. We had an electrician hook them up, and uh, without them, we wouldn't have got it done. We never knew that. We need to send Joe a belated thank you. They did a great job. Uh, and P&M. If we get Yvonne to do that. I don't want to get Joseph in trouble. He probably did some stuff he wasn't supposed to. But he did. Well, no, I'm just going to send him a thank you that he goes over and beyond. <laughs> He did go above and beyond. And, and we just need to recognize people that, that do the extra. And in the future, they said if we put any more up or, or anything for emergencies like Call that, somebody else? He, no. Yeah, no, he said they'd be more than happy to participate again. Okay. They're pretty effective because I got a complaint this past week. Yeah, you did. Some guy says that uh, we were crying wolf, that yeah. we were just trying to scare people. Oh, yeah. Uh, so they're effective. You can't. Yeah, they are. <laughs> they are effective. We didn't get a few complaints. They're too loud. Well, they're supposed to be too loud. I thought that was the point. Yeah, I can't. I can't hear my TV program while you're. Uh, that's what one guy said. Just a medley of something, you know, a little jazz. Oh, they called. They they said, you know, I said, well, what are you gonna do if there's a fire? And they said, well, I see. I see what you're saying now. You know, it's like, no, stupid is stupid does, you know. <laughs> Got a plan for it. So the one no. thing I want to talk about on the 1st and the 15th when you set those off, yes, sir. we actually, then it correlates to the 1490 because I haven't ever switched over to listen. So is that actually happening? No. Well, it's 
this, Adam, this was just a test. The te it has been. Well, it was with. Uh, uh, poor gentleman passed away. That was with the radio station. Yeah, Harvey Twy. Yeah, Harvey Twy. Harvey Twy. Yeah. So when he passed away, I worked with Tim Keithley, mm -hmm. and he has the ability and the equipment. So we need to work with Tim Roberts. And there's equipment that, that has to be purchased that whenever you're going to send out those broadcast notifications and how it hits and interrupts everything, um, we'll need to get that in our radio station. And yeah. then when we hit them, if there's an emergency and we call and say, hey, go ahead, the broadcast system, then it'll push it out in our area. But I don't believe they have that yet. And I thought about that earlier when he was talking about the FM transmitter. It, it reminded me that. Write it down okay. so that we can get that done because I – we're training people to turn to there, and then there's nothing. But at yeah. least it should say, this was just a test of the emergency right. broadcast system. <laughs> yeah. we do, we do that so put your panties back on and <laughs> you know, get your big old handful. We'll give it a tug. Yeah. Okay, good. I know um, Carrie puts it out on social media as well on the 1st and the 15th to advise people that it's happening, So because I've seen it on, on okay. the Facebook. Now we've had phone calls from uh, visitors. That said, hey, we appreciate y'all putting that out, you know, whether it was on Facebook or on the radio. Because they didn't know what it was. They thought there was an emergency. And they, they went to Facebook immediately and seen that we test. They thought it was a tornado. <laughs> yeah, they have testing in their area, but it's not Tornadoes, a Tornadoes, yeah. 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 So, so it, it was effective on Facebook that people went there and checked rather than call 911 when you're in town or the fire stations. Right. Okay, good job. So the locations real quick, we have Pikes Peak, who's one of the new ones. Middle Fork is one of the new ones. Camelot, um, 311 Cream Meadow, 313 Cream Meadows right over here. 207 Junction, 1000 Sutter, Row Lane behind the Great Wall. Mm -hmm. Station 3 at 433 Main Road, Upper Canyon, right at the end of Upper Canyon. Station 2 is the Siren, and then Wax Pine Road as well at Davis Road. Those are our locations of all of our sirens. The next um, on the comp plan, um, grant funding, village matching funds. Um, we'll work with the fire chief and our emergency manager, the village <coughs> and the finance director, to just ensure that we have um, funding available for any matching funds for grants throughout the year. Um, they can range from one percent, from five percent up to fifty percent, depending on the type of grant. Uh, matching funds in a specific amount cover the percentage of the, of the match. For grants that the village of Ridosa and departments may apply for, these matches vary based on the amount of what is requested. Possibly, you know, we just came up with a number that we had discussed in the area, 200000 to set aside and you know, for possible matches. It just depends on what we put in for and who the <coughs> department is that we put the money in for, what the percentage of the matching funds are. Um, right. This will allow the emergency management department and others to apply for funding through Several agencies, NMDHSEM, FEMA, AFG, state and local grant funding sources as well, and I know that the matching funds are available, so, we'll, so we won't be worrying about where the money's coming from to match, put the matching funds through. These grants will support public safety to include all village emergencies and operational readiness as a priority. In other source, if other sources and other or departments are eligible to apply, they could also utilize this budgeted line item. This is a need annually and should remain in, a, in the budget accordingly. Any questions on that? No. Okay, next. Under the comp goal, policy 1.1, uphold community fire wildfire protection plan. Continue to prioritize interjurisdictional cooperation and collaboration between the village of the village. Lincoln County U.S. Forest Service, BLM, Escalero Tribe, Redosa Downs, Carrizozo, and other agencies within the jurisdictions over land. The village is working with the state to ensure funding to continue forest thinning and fire mitigation efforts. So this is um, updating our hazard mitigation plan and emergency operation plans. Um, responsible parties, of course, are forestry, the emergency manager, Fire Chief and Finance, grant funding is where the majority of this money is going to come from, and some of the matching funds as well. So this is um, the description of the emergency management. We'll work with the village departments and county in 2021 and 2022 to secure funding and update these plans. The hazard mitigation 
plan is due to update in July of 2023. I did apply for the BRIC, the Building Resilience Infrastructure and Communities Grant application um, back at the end of 2020, and they've been reviewing the grants, and we're supposed to hear something sometime this spring, or they said July of 2022, January 2022. I haven't heard anything yet, but on the funding when, when it will be available. So once we get that funding available, then we'll start the process of reviewing the hazard mitigation plan so we can have it reviewed by the end of the year and up for approval so it will be approved by FEMA by July of 2023. It's not guaranteed funding, but it's almost <coughs> guaranteed that this update will happen for this plan with this money uh, based on uh, Homeland Security because that's what it comes from. And the, the funding, this funding I actually um, – Discuss this with the uh, Homeland Security. There are only five or six communities that put in for this plan that year. So we're pretty much guaranteed the money, but we're just waiting on them to. Just waiting the for it to send it to you. Yes, sir. So the this mitigation plan will benefit Redosa, Redosa Downs, Capitan, Carrizozo, and Corona, which includes all of Lincoln County as we coordinate and collaborate with stakeholders to update the plan. Any questions on that? Okay, the next is, um, the next two can kind of be put together, um, evacuation shelters and then alternate EOC and, and fire stations two and three. Um, we're going to need to work on purchasing a backup generator for these locations. So the evacuation for the responsible parties, the emergency manager, fire chief finance, FEMA, DHSEM, a lot of this is going to be based on grant funding as well, trying to get the money because the Convention Center, Community Center, to get generators big enough to power those is going to be fairly expensive. I've got a company I'm looking at trying to get an estimate on to see what kind of grant funding we're going to need to get these backup generators because we do use these as evacuation, evacuation shelters. And um, going down to the next, the last one on my section, the um, alternate <coughs> ESC of Fire Station 2 and 3, those two stations do not have backup generators, so we do have a backup generator at Fire Station 1 at this time, so we need to get backup generators at those two stations. In case we, something happens on the side of town that Station 1 is, we can use those Fire Station 2 and 3 <coughs> as an emergency operations center. So that's going to be the grant funding as well on those generators as well. So any questions on those? Mm -hmm. The generators I've looked at recently have a ridiculous lead time on them, so yes. I, and as I, soon I, as possible, get on the list. I talked to um, one of the, the <clears throat> vendors, and it's a six to nine months out, if not longer, right now, to get a generator. So, can you tell me how they'll be fueled? Uh, most of them are going to be diesel. I just wondered if. If natural gas would be an alternative or not, it's possible. I can look into those. I mean, it's it's something to look at into the, into the natural gas since it's. I thought Station One was on natural gas. It's no, diesel. it's diesel. Okay. <clears throat> My well, if we lose power, how does that affect the natural gas? It's a good it, question. Yeah. It doesn't affect propane. So. Right. It doesn't propane. It doesn't affect the diesel that we put in there. Exactly. And we do have two generators out at the airport as well, but they are stationary. They're not portable generators at the airport as well. So any further questions? No. Nope. All right, that is all I have. Good job, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Keep going. Oh. Airport. in here is not the updated one. On, just on the last one, the rest Thank of the update. So we printed out the last one so we can replace it immediately. Thank you, Ron. Not a problem. We had one staff for all day long. That's not bad. Nope. <laughs> all right. For Austin. If you need to talk. Mayor Pro Tem, yeah. members of the council, we didn't have an airport uh, purpose statement, so I went ahead and developed one. 
and that is to provide a safe and adequately maintained transportation hub serving the village of Rudoso, Lincoln County, State of New Mexico, and all general aviation in an executive business-like manner. Nice. Looks good. All right. Any further questions on that one? Leave it as is. As for the org chart, we're using the same one as Chief Thetford and Joe Kay. And moving on to the tactical plan goals. So for goal one, it's going to be a replacement program for all airport apparatus and equipment. And it's going to be 10-7 air travel FAA part 139 compliance. And so we do have two airport apparatuses <coughs> at the moment. After evaluating the operations of Sierra Blanc Regional Airport, there are needs of replacing several pieces of equipment. The age and the how often they get used is questioning the longevity after our recent FAA inspection. Our fuel trucks, both the age of 1999 and 2000, Rescue 1 and Rescue 2 fire trucks, the age of 1998 and 2006. Snow removal equipment, age 1989 and 1990. The aviation tug and GPU are all aged, ranging from the early 80s to 2000. All this equipment is used seasonally and daily that will need to be replaced in the near future, as it is between 15 and 40 years old. It is imperative to plan ahead and replace all safety equipment accordingly. That being said, we plan and work with the FAA administration and finance to build a program for further growth and emergency response for the longevity and opportunities at Sierra Blanc Regional Airport. We plan and work on replacing the airport command unit, for it is also of age. And we plan on working to purchase an enclosed UTV for airport staff to utilize and retain the longevity of other airport vehicles, which would include most of our trucks that we have out there, out there for utilities. Do you guys have any questions on this one? So with funding, are we going to kind of look maybe at budget? Or is this all going to be looked at with grants and stuff? A lot of it will be looked at with grants, and we'll pretty much have a 5% match with that. Okay. Um, but a lot of it's going to come through the FAA. Oh, okay. Working with, through uh, Dan Moran with the New Mexico DOT. Oh, okay. Thanks, Austin. Absolutely. So the, the priority for FAA and working with the state, as Austin mentioned, and, and he has had meetings, and, and we've scheduled these things over the last few months, their priority will be the suppression or ARP equipment first, and then everything will probably towards under that with grants and funding with them. So the good news of that is they're going to hopefully take care of the larger ticket items, and then everything else will fall under that for us with other opportunities and um, capital outlay. Okay. Very good. All right. Goal number two. 10-7 air travel FAA part 139 compliance. So our number one goal is to remain in compliance with FAA part 139 certification. This way we can continue to get federal funding for the airport. <coughs> Staff and I will continue to work with the FAA to ensure that we remain compliant with our 139 certification and have no findings in the future. There have been negative findings in the past that could be avoided with additional <coughs> funding and now that we have staffing, that should cover it. The certification assists in opening additional outside funding sources, as I touched federal funding. This inspection for certification is the number one priority year-round. That being said, maintaining runways and all aviation equipment for runway 0624 and 1230. Complete and log all training, that includes ARF, extrication, fueling, and medical, and burns required by the FAA, approximately 100 hours per staff annually. Maintain and inspect fire apparatuses and infrastructure for emergency response, maintaining and operating the fuel farm per FAA and AvFuel standards. Notice to airmen, which is also called NOTAMs, 
is required for operational changes and conditions every 15 minutes when posted until corrected and airport is back 100% operational and safe. As of December 2021, the inspection for this year is complete and airport staff are actively working on the remarks. We have two remarks left and they will be extended until around May okay. for uh, painting purpose and purposes and the uh, temperatures. Anybody have any questions on goal three? Mm -mm. <clears throat> All right, Conclang goal four, 10-7 air travel, customer service and income. Oh, did we miss goal three? Yes. We went over to goal two oh, yeah. on our book. You, you did ask us if we had any questions. We just had to read quick. <laughs> yeah, let's go home. <laughs> All right, goal three. Policy 3.3, improved shuttle services to and from the airport. Charter, commercial services. SBRA is in need of a set charter flight from larger cities, which would allow for more visitors to travel to the area. It would also allow, allow business professionals flights as well as other areas to New Mexico and surrounding states to support tourism. SPRA Sierra Blanca Regional Airport is needing to work with local shuttle, shuttle services to set up better availability for services from SBRA to the village. Currently we can have Rudoso Car Rentals, Hertz, Avis, they can all deliver cars to the airport for customers when available. When cars are not available, Visitors do not have a way to travel from SBRA, Sierra Blanc Regional Airport, to the village of Rudoso and surrounding area after arrival. Some of our staff has mentioned that local shuttle services do not want to make the trip to the airport mm -hmm. due to the length of the trip, and we need to work with them to make these pickups possible. And we're referring to Lyft, um, Uber, some of the things that are coming out in Rudoso now. <clears throat> We're going to continue to work with Rudoso Rental Car, Roswell Avis, Alamogordo Hertz, uh, Heather Sigmund with Shuttle Services, as well as Brian's Limo Services. They're all very key assets for us at the moment because they're the ones that provide us the cars to get people back to town. <clears throat> now, do you have any questions for goal three? I mean, that's that's a very important goal because that that service is really needed. All right, goal four, ten seven air travel, customer service, and income. So for goal four, we're looking at trying to obtain additional hangars. This is going to provide more income for the airport and the village itself. Sierra Blanca Regional Airport is needing to obtain more hangars for the customers and ability to rent overnight. At this time, all hangars are rented and there is a large waiting list for, the vac for a vacant space. If new hangars were construction constructed, this would increase the income of the airport and assist with self-sustainability. So how many hangars are you talking about in additional? And that depends on the perspective we're trying to take. Okay. We can build one very large hangar and house three or four different planes, maybe even up to eight planes, depending on their size. Okay. Uh, at the moment, we're looking at a few that are up for sale right now. The biggest one that we could get now could maybe house two planes at the most. Um, however, I think we're still looking into the ability to build a hangar and of the size according to the, um, the building location, right? The, uh, <coughs> and the state and, and the federal money, they're all about that right now. And the right. meetings he's had, um, they're willing to help us do that, be a big portion of that. So it's, it's working right now. And it would be similar to one of those 5% matches. No, I don't know if we have this in our contract or or on our lease agreements and there are we do we have the first option to buy on these two hangers that are possibly up for sale? We don't have first priority, but working with uh, Zach and, and Ron and village management um, and, the, and the hangar owners due to our leasing contract because we own the land and the infrastructure. Right. So the the uh, appraisals, if you will, 
they may be asking 150 or 120 or whatever for them, but uh, we have to have an agreement to work out the appraisal like y'all have done all the land sales to pay appraisal value or, you know, vice versa. So that's how we're having to work it because they can still sell it privately, but we would like the opportunity to do it at, at the appraised value. Appraised price. Um, so and that's what I was getting at. I mean, we could get it appraised and, if it's, and it's up to us to say yay or nay, but at least we would have the first ride instead of it going to, you know, the for sale block and, and yeah, somebody will you offer. You see those coming forward them. in the near future. So, okay. Well, Mayor Pro Tem, that is an active conversation we're having at the moment with um, the attorneys at Cook. Okay. That's in the process of kind of rearranging on how we do that process. So right now you may be able to buy them at the price of steel's just gone nuts. So oh yeah. You may be able to buy an existing one for less money and we could build it. Unless you get a lot of free money. The owners know that too. <laughs> and and yeah. the, do we have a blueprint or an idea of where we would build these hangars if we you know come around there? Have we done that engineering yet or no. None it's, of that? Okay. So this all sprung up when the first hangar came available to buy. Um, so now we're okay. really trying to get our hands onto it before it spirals out of control. And right, right. We're selling left and right. But at least in future, I would say that, yeah, if we could expand or have an area that where we can build more hangars, at least we have that designated um, to to go or move forward when that opportunity comes again. Council Gonzalez. Yes. Um, there is one area um, out there at the airport that we do have that we could build a set of um, small tang hangers at. It's right by the Charlie hangers, that dirt patch in front of the Charlie hangers between there and the private hangers. We could put some, um, like our alpha hangers to, that'll fit twin turbine planes in there. There is one area that we could look at okay. actually actively building some hangers at this point in time. Well, that's good. I mean, at least, like we say, we got an area here that you're presenting, but even more future time, hey, are we going to expand here or just leave it And, and we, do have, some, and we do have plenty of land out there. One of the issues that we're running across right now with going towards <coughs> the west from where the hangars are is right. that land is elevated, and we can't have that land higher than the, tack, the runways. Right. right now it is above the runway, so... We got to work with an engineering firm to see what we need to do to get that down, take the dirt and excavate it down, yes, and then sir. just get it there. Okay. Okay. Thank you. As we continue to to discuss this, um, we discuss there's a continuous wait list for hangar rentals monthly and nightly. The Alpha hangers, which support large aircraft, we currently have four. We currently have a wait list of six needing service. And like we spoke earlier in a recent meeting between Sierra Blanc Regional Airport and the New Mexico DOT, it, is, it was discussed that SBRA can obtain financial assistance from New Mexico DOT to build the new hangers. Any other questions on goal four? No. All right. Moving on to goal five, this was passed out by Ron. We appreciate that. This is going to be vehicle replacement, kind of like apparatus, but just to, just for our vehicles. Um, replacement program for all vehicles. After evaluating the operations of the Sierra Blanca Regional Airport, there are needs of, repla of a replacement program for maintenance vehicles, like the command unit and possibly the purchase of a UTV. We plan to work on replacing the airport command unit, plan on working, working to purchase a UTV for airport staff to utilize the longevity of the other airport vehicles, which include the Ford F-150, 250, and 350, which we plan to replace those as well. And do we have any questions on this? On that funding, do you go through the FAA or what? Or is that, is that going to be budget? That's more going to be this, with the village. Yeah. Like the F-250 and 350 and some of the command vehicles, they're smaller vehicles, but we use them for snow plowing. Yeah. So that's what my up. question was going to be. So for that's our snow removal yes. fleet, right? 
But a lot less expensive than the snow removal equipment through the FA and the, uh, the big Oshkosh style uh, blowers and, and plows. Right. And then the UTB is for people to to maneuver around quickly to greet. Yes. Yeah. Instead of using the big vehicles yeah. and fuel and trucks and yeah. back and forth to remove planes and stuff, it's just easier and, and less maintenance and less expensive to use right. those. Okay. Good job. Cody, on those, you know, Judy did have to take off, so make sure you get with her and, and document that for budget. Any other questions for Austin? No? No. Very good, Austin. Yeah. Appreciate you guys. <laughs> okay. Moving on to our police department. Still in quorum, though. <laughs> Are we going to have a closed session after this? The mayor's no. still here as well. Do what? The mayor's still. What was that, Councilor? I'm sorry. Oh. Are we going to have a closed session after this? It was just listed on today's. Uh, mayor, uh, we just put that as a placeholder, but that's it's what I thought. Well, I'm not asking for one. I just wondered. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Mayor Pro Tem, Council, Manager Dodge. Um, so it's been a uh, whirlwind of events since uh, last June mm -hmm. <laughs> coming forward. So uh, today, being that this is my first uh, strategic planning event and uh, presenting, I've been taking a whole lot of notes throughout the day to make my next one better for whenever I come forward to present again. So um, starting out with the, the purpose statement, um, the one that was there uh, was is to enhance quality of life in the community by enforcing the laws, preserving the peace, reducing fear, and to provide for a safe environment. Um, I would like to propose a, uh, a different, or you know, along the same lines. But uh, the one I'd like to propose is uh, the mission statement of the of the Ridoso Police Department is to enhance trust between the citizens and tourists of the village of Ridoso by implementing key policies and adopting promising practices that will promote safe, effective interactions and ensure partnerships are created to prevent and reduce crime and improve the overall well-being and quality of life for all. Nice. That's um, really Mayor Pro Chief, did you work with your team leader to go over the elements of the mission statement? No. Or I had presented it at the last one, but I didn't know. Okay. Um, uh, Mayor Pro Temp, if we could, we can bring that back to a regular meeting, and we, I just want to work with the, the chief and the, their team to make sure that they're following the elements okay. that are outlined, and then okay. we'll bring that proposal back. So at this time, let's defer that. Okay. 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 Just making a note before I move on. Okay, on the uh, organizational chart, um, as it's laid out, and I have 11 vacancies. I have uh, six dispatch vacancies, and, or I'm sorry, five dispatch vacancies and six officer positions. Um, we've been recruiting, uh, try, you know, trying to affect, and I'll cover that in my strategic plan, um, but it seems like we get one hired and one leaves, or, you know, it, it's just a back and forth with... Uh, you know, competing with different agencies and, um, you know, and then some of the uh, administrative changes that happened, uh, you know, officers did leave with that also. So those are uh, the vacancies that I have, and I do have a couple of promotions that I need to get done, but I don't want to do that up until the point that I get a couple more guys staffed and, and moved into those spots. So uh, most of the uh, goals. Um, hold on a second, okay. Chief. Okay. Uh, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, um, the last time that we looked at this organizational chart, uh, when you came into um, your leadership position, Chief, 
we had the accreditation manager uh, reporting directly to the DC Hill. And yes, you, do you have a proposed change there? Uh, yes, sir, I do. I'm sorry uh, for not addressing that. But I do have a proposed change for the accreditation manager to report directly to the administrative lieutenant as opposed to the uh, uh, deputy chief um, because those two would be working <coughs> in conjunction with updating the policies and getting the department accredited. And are you changing the level of that position? Yes, I am. Um, I had proposed before the, for that to be a lieutenant position. Um, I want to put that to, uh, to an accreditation manager position. Um, it would be below a lieutenant, um, you know, and it could be, it could even be, uh, once the, the uh, description is laid out, it could even be a uh, <coughs> civilian employee uh, for that position. Okay. It, it wouldn't necessarily need to be an officer position to get the accreditation done. Um, airport and and they'll like take of effect immediately, right? I mean, or do we have to wait till budget time and redo? Or um, Mayor Pro Temp, it's a current um, budgeted FTE position. It looks like he's downgrading the position, but I'd like to have a conversation with with Dina and with uh, HR before we act on approving this organizational chart. Okay. Okay. So if we can also defer this one. Is there any other changes that that you've made, Chief, to this? No, sir. No other changes made. Okay. okay. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Chief, I just had a question looking at this. <clears throat> How is the accreditation manager as a civilian going to be looked upon by the rank and file? They're, they wouldn't have a position to where they would be in a position of authority. Um, it would just mainly be a, a clerical position. When you get into the accreditation, there's uh, you have to make sure that your policies and everything are, are followed through. And then you ha the main portion of it is keeping your files up, uh, keeping your uh, the um, standards and making sure that officers are, are uh, following those practices. That would be relayed to the lieutenant at which Matt time the lieutenant would fall down and, and that would be where the uh, rank and structure would come into effect. Thank you, Chief. Yes, sir. Uh, Mayor, Mayor Pro Temp, um, uh, Councilor Jackson, you know, uh, right now and when you look at the accreditation process, you know, through the New Mexico Municipal League, they're revamping it. And, you know, so there's not, there's not, uh, a current program for us to apply to uh, to so you know that's one of the other things that I want to make sure is that before we make a recommendation on that position I want to make sure you know what the rules are what are going to be um, the new standards that they're going to be looking at so um, you know before we approve that change let's let's uh, take another look at that and, and see what's coming out with a new program. And I think uh, after next week at the Chiefs Association meeting, I'll have more information. When I went to the uh, last one in December, they did speak about it, and the longtime guy that ran it, Scott Chambers, retired. So now they're kind of revamping. Scott was uh, set in his ways, and he was kind of the pencil and paper type guy, and now they're at the New Mexico Municipal League actually ordered uh, software uh, to distribute to uh, municipalities that are going through the accreditation program. So it'll make the policy recognition and those types of things a lot easier. So um, I was speaking with uh, Robert, Roberta Baca. She will be the, you know, the person in charge of the accreditation, and she said that there will be more training and more uh, outreach from them to the municipalities than there was before. So they're just trying to hammer out their uh, processes, and they're working with the... Uh, AJ um, to, to get all that stuff done and, and move forward. Um, any any questions on any of that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so strategic. Uh, some of most of my uh, plans you're going to see th that are they're in process from the ones that I put up in June. So you know the main one: recruitment, retention, and turnover of personnel. I mean, we're working on that. Um, 
uh, Lieutenant Urban and uh, Sergeant Freeman have actually set up a committee within the within the police department and and you know just talking back and forth to think outside the box of how we can recruit what we can do to retain our officers and you know just reaching out to the officers themselves you know the boots on the street saying hey you know what can we do to keep you here so you, the one thing and and this isn't doesn't just affect our department but affordable housing is a, a big issue, you know, here um, with the turnover and uh, and then, um, you know, the police reforms and the trainings that have been implemented because of uh, the issues that happened in 2020 that have been passed. So, you know, some that we've had, I think we've had two officers since all that went down that quit specifically because of that. But, you know, the training and things that are coming down that are mandated, they're helping us out. I mean, most officers are seeing now that it's a positive thing that we're getting these trainings, the, you know, body-worn cameras, all that. But a lot of those things we had in place prior to any of that happening. So sure. it wasn't a huge transition. Um, you know, our calls of service, uh, they, are, they were up from uh, 2020 to 2021 from uh, 18,496 to 19,947. So we are busier and, you know, the um, dispatch and, and everybody gets uh, involved in that. Is there uh, any questions with, uh, with uh, number one? Oh, you're, I, was, I was trying to find the, the number on the calls that you had. I didn't see it listed. Um, just one thing, when you get this recruitment thing in process or uh, a plan or whatever, we'd like to to see it because I know we've talked about it with uh, our PIO and marketing campaign for since you before you were hired. Yeah. So, so uh, how long you how long have you been chief? Since June. Since June. So, so. anyway, I just want to keep the pressure on it because I know everybody's got so many different things. So this is my version of a squeaky wheel. So. Squeaky wheel. Yes, okay. sir. Um, so in the second uh, plan, we uh, to upgrade and improve uh, the department and, you know, possibly or put into the goals, the long-term goal is to replace the department. We have taken on uh, some of the small things on the inside uh, of the department and uh, moved around the executive offices and, uh, you know, there's still some work to be done. But there was some bigger fires on the plate that we had to put out uh, before attacking those. The outside of the, the police department, we did address that uh, in the springtime or in the summertime last year. Mm -hmm. You know, and it really made, made a huge positive impact, uh, you know, from the community members and everybody just uh, cleaning it up. And, um, you know, so that's where we're at right now with, uh, you know, pushing forward. There are some things on the inside of it. I know that uh, we've been in discussions to where the long-term goal would be to replace the police department. However, there's some, you know, big issues on, you know, with the jail cells and those types of things. So we could uh, take a look at addressing those and the financial impact that that's going to have as opposed to, you know, doing some of the things, uh, changing little things to, you know, so we're not wasting that money if we're going to relocate anyways or, or uh, add on or whatever. Does that need to come look, be looked at at budget? The, um, the immediate needs or the long term? Yeah, yeah like um, the chief has here with the cell, it needs to be modified uh, for the safety. And see, yeah, and see some of those things, uh, um, whenever we had, um, and in this, Erica Mokayo come down and she went through every oh, yeah. single department in the village, in our department, she actually brought up numerous things that I thought, okay, we could put a Band-Aid on this to make it work, and she was like, nah, it's not going to happen. So there's going to be some... Uh, um, several things that we're going to have to change and look at, you know, as far as like the ADA compliance and, you know, the, uh, making some ramps instead of, ch uh, stairs and those types of things. So all that will have to be addressed, you know, do we, um, and we'll have to talk about that in a, do we want to spend that money to, to get that going now or how quickly are we going to be able to, to, uh, get into something different with that but there are some things that I've been looking at um, DC Hill has obtained some uh, 
some designs, you know, that we'd have to push forward and, and you know, get those things hammered out. $200 million. Mayor Chief, um, did you have any comments on the evidence room and the chain of evidence? So uh, with the evidence room, I have, uh, I have consulted with uh, Southwest Consultants. They have come down and given a quote uh, to redo the evidence room, or not to redo the evidence room, to do a complete audit of the evidence room. Um, at that point, you know, uh, they uh, gave me the quote. I think it was uh, $10,000 to, to redo it all and, or to do the complete audit of everything and make sure that the whole facility, um, the, the only thing that they, I mean, the one thing, good thing about being in an old bank is that we have an evidence vault, and that's like the place <coughs> because, you know, there's nobody going to get into it. However, we do have some of the issues with the bigger evidence and some of our cold case files that they kind of looked at um, that they want to see the process changed a little bit. So mm -hmm. there wasn't too many, um, it wouldn't be too big of a financial impact for the changes that they wanted, but at the end of the day, the audit on it would be the biggest uh, thing that we, we could uh, benefit from. So, uh, Chief, if you ever did, if, if there was an, uh, another department built, police station PD built, would you be looking to still partner with the state police, have them housed there, and also maybe expand them? And if so, then would there be some financial, let's just say, input from the state? So, so there would be. Um, I, I uh, have also been in talks, because this one would be a huge one, is if we could... Uh, house, um, you know, to get everything hammered out completely, you know, how the feds work, but um, I have been approached by the FBI to put a, uh, if we could give them office space, if we were able to do that, then that would be open up our opportunities for federal funding um, with them because they would be housed uh, at the same location. Um, they had a office for years that they ran out of in Mescalero with BIA, and the 31st of last year, um, I, it was prior to that, they told them, hey, after the 31st, you're going to be out. So they're kind of working from Roswell and Las Cruces. So I was approached uh, a few weeks ago. I did speak with Manager Dodge about it. Um, I'm, but uh, I'm working on our end to see what they need to be able to house it. Because if we were able to do that, um, it would open up a lot of opportunities for uh, different funding. So what, what type of a footprint would you need? Three acres, four, two and a half. That hasn't even uh, been, I mean, uh, discussed yet as far as any of that. However, uh, I did uh, speak with Manager Dodge a couple weeks ago about um, attending a uh, workshop. It's a, a two-day class specifically for building a police department. It's put on by a, an architect that does nothing but public safety buildings, uh, fire departments, those types of things. And part of the uh, seminar is grant funding and how to obtain the funds to, you know, to secure the funds to be able to build something like that. So, you know, there's traffic studies that have to be done and a lot of legwork before we can, you know, get to the shovel-ready project. Mayor, you know, my recommendation on, on, on uh, the facility is that, you know, we have uh, an assessment of the current facility conducted to see what it's going to take us to be able to make it suitable for, you know, two to five years you know, something in, in that range, and then also, um, you know, bring on a consultant to start the process of developing a, a concept, and then, you know, going from there. But, you know, even, you know, you say you got a bank vault, but, you know, dealing de dealing with a lot of the materials that you deal with, a bank vault's not an appropriate storage for a lot of your evidence, you know, there's not proper ventilation, you're dealing with, at times, with soil materials. Um, you know, we need to replace that facility. That's the bottom line and get something that's appropriate. And to do that, you know, I think we just need to put out an RFP, find a consultant that has built those type of facilities before, and then start the ball moving forward. Yeah. And then, you know, after your seminar, we probably maybe identify some of the land that possibly the village has purchased or might be interested in. And then we got a bank to sell. <laughs> Mayor, are you okay with that? Mayor and Council, are you okay with that? Yeah, direction? we've got to do something. I was just, yeah. my mind was wandering, who's going to buy an old bank, one? <laughs> Number two, uh, we could just tell Coughlin he's going to have to find a new place and take over the Boys and Girls Club, and you could have the 
Coliseum. The gym is an evidence room because I think you got plenty. <laughs> so anyway, no, but yeah, we we definitely got to do something. Uh, you know, so you're saying within the next three to five years. Um, we start the process now, and, and uh, we start that planning process, but we've got to make sure that the current facility is, is you know, the environment is, is you know, good, you know, fix some of the deficiencies that are there. Yeah. So it's, you know, there's two parts to it. They're, you know, currently in a, a building that needs to be fixed up and, and lived in for the next couple of years. You know, it's going to take two to five years to build a facility. But that's if we had the money today. And... You know, it starts off with the planning, and then we'll start the fundraising. And mm -hmm. you know, I'm I'm, uh, I'm more concerned about the process than than you know eventually raising the money. And the location will be very important. Yeah, but if it's a direction for us to start, you know, moving in that direction to uh, build a replacement well, facility, it's like everything else, we got to get started. So yep. we might as well move forward. We've been talking about this for a long time. So, Chief, let's visit, and, and we're going to modify this, and we'll bring it back to council. Okay. This, this uh, plan. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Well, every, every other bank's been bought by a church. <laughs> no parking over there, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not enough. That's for sure. Okay, so uh, I, I guess we'll table this, I guess, and then bring it back. Well, all the plans are going to be modified. The workshops just for the council to weigh in on the, the tactical plans. And then we're going to bring the whole strategic plan back and ask council to give us a blessing on it, and then we'll move into uh, budgeting from thereafter. Okay. Okay, so the accreditation process, this is a ongoing, you know, uh, living, breathing document uh, process. But the policies we have... Um, we have upgraded some uh, some of our policies. The one policy that I focused on immediately, or the, the two actually, was use of force and uh, citizen complaints with the internal affairs investigations. That was not that was a process that you know just was no. Um, we had IPRAs filed on uh, you know from the past of where were these complaints at or where did they go or what happened with them. There was never no accountability with it. Since June, I can say that anytime we get one, which we have, I can provide every single uh, complaint that was filed, the uh, outcomes of those complaints, and, you know, uh, everything else that has happened with them. Uh, in fact, as we speak, uh, the reason uh, D.C. Hill and uh, Lieutenant Menner are not here is they are actually at an internal affairs investigation class. Um, you know, that way they have the knowledge to move forward and to get the complaints processed and, and those types of, and do the investigations without violating our employees' rights. Because that's the number one thing whenever we come to an internal affairs investigation, <coughs> our employees are who we have to protect and make sure that their rights are not violated during any part of the process. Right. So, um, is there any questions? Any questions on that? So uh, what have we been doing in the accreditation process since we've been in flux with that department? We, who's taking over so, duties? So what that? we're doing, they're going to have basically the same uh, type of guidelines. It's just going to be more modernized once they come back into, uh, you know, once they get the software and everything hammered out of how they're going to proceed with it. But the policies, your policies are still going to be the same. These standards that you follow, they're still going to have to be the same in the proofs that you do. So um, everything is, you know, they're going to have to mirror what our policies are moving forward, and we're going to have to be able to provide proofs. Right now, literally, um, the way it's been for years and years is uh, they send you a thumb drive, and you print them out and handwrite or, you know, sign everything and keep them in a file. Now they're going to have the software to where it'll all be digital, and and we'll be able to, you know, provide the officers um, instead of saying, okay, we just revamped this policy. You got to read, you know, page thirty through thirty three and print them out or whatever. This will the software. It's called Power DMS, and it'll actually once you read it, it'll actually show that the officers logged in. They'll all have their own login, and it'll show that they read it. And then it will um, even goes as far as uh, having a quiz to where it will show that they had to read it and, and everything else. So it's pretty sophisticated technology that they're, you know, the software anyways. It's been out for years and years. But like yeah, I said, they've been using it in the insurance yeah, business now and that, uh, everything else for yep. even, even on the 
<coughs> alcohol service permits the same way. Yeah. yeah. There you go. So, so Mayor, kind of Mayor Chief, um, you know, it's my understanding that the accreditation process that they're getting ready to, you know, put in place is a lot closer to CLIA than what they were using before. There was yep. new standards yep. with the New Mexico Municipal League. So when you're writing um, your, your policies that you've been developing, are you following the CLIA standards? or? Yes, and we're uh, actually, it's kind of one of those deals to where, um, you know, they're even saying why reinvent the wheel whenever there's agencies out there. So what we're doing is uh, we've reached out to Hobbs and to Rio Rancho because they're both CLIA um, accredited agencies, and we're tailoring their policies to fit our needs here in Rio So for the, for the village of Rio Who's in charge of that? Uh, Steve Minner, Lieutenant Minner. Okay, so he's taking over those duties too? Yes. Yes. Any more questions on the accreditation? Nope. Okay, community policing. This has been uh, <coughs> the biggest success. I mean, we got the, took off running with this uh, back in June. Um, you know, and we started our uh, Citizens Academy. We've been collaborating with the stakeholders of the community, um, and it's just been a real success. Some of the things uh, I will put it, uh, redo the policy, like I said, or the strategic plan. Like I said, I was taking notes throughout the day and thinking, ah, oh, I should have, you know, added those types of things in there. But um, whenever I update it and submit the final, you know, some of the things that you'll see on there is the monthly, the monthly newsletter that we, uh, you know, we're putting out. Um, the shop with the cop, uh, you know, that was a huge success. We had 10 kids that we were able to pair up with uh, law enforcement officers right before Christmas time. We took them to Walmart and the community with that. You know, we were expecting to maybe do $100 per kid. We were able to do 250 per kid because awesome. Walmart and, you know, several people just, you know, they, they helped us out tremendously with it. So it was really, really uh, a good event. Um, we want to continue that uh, throughout the year and, um, and raise the funds to, you know, uh, right before school time, you know, because these kids are, you know, we need to be mentors for them and, and uh, you know, get them knowing that the police is on their side because one of the things, you know, during school time, for especially for the youth, um, those adolescent years, you know, the I love as a parent being able to provide uniforms for the kids because the shopping gets done in like five minutes because <laughs> you just put the sizes and the colors and here's what you get. You're not going to gripe about, you know, what you're going to wear. However, you know, during that, it's a, it's a delicate phase in their lives, especially, you know, to, to, for them to uh, get the confidence that they need going forward. And you can kind of tell, you know, on the weekends when you see the same kids wearing the uniforms, you know, we want to be able to at least some of them, buy them a pair of jeans and a shirt, you know, so that that way they're not having to, to wear that, you know, and, and it'll build their confidence and then, you know, uh, build a, a mentorship because yeah. those kiddos are going to be the next ones taking these jobs, you know, and uh, so that's, uh, that's the ultimate goal with, with that. So um, as far as the community policing initiative, it's been very successful and we've been able to accomplish a lot of things real quick. So we've covered a lot of ground. Um, is there any questions? With I, I think uh, along with that, um, I know that uh, Lieutenant Urban, you know, allowing your officers to uh, be a part of uh, the community as far as sports, him being able to, to be with all those kids uh, with wrestling, I think that's a really good idea as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. I got to get at work out of him somewhere, so I figured yep. I'd get it there. <laughs> <laughs> so, are, are you going to have a <clears throat> setup where eventually, I know uh, the like the bicycle officers and those guys in the summer, being able to be in Midtown, you know, once you get fully staffed or closer to fully staffed, um, where they're able to casually walk in, say hello, and all those kind of things, because. That's one of the things I want to make sure that we do is, you know, just to get that face out there and, and that they, when they see an officer, they don't think, uh oh, what happened? Yep. 
No, absolutely. That that is one of the biggest initiatives. You know, once we get fully staffed right now, they're bouncing call to call and you know everything else. But we're getting to that point. We have some people in background that are promising. We just hired a guy uh, Monday. He just started. Uh, so once that happens, hopefully by the summertime, we'll start that initiative. So and, is he already you know, swore in? Not yet. No, okay. sir. I remember. I already made chief. that mistake. Always, yeah. He always leapfrogs <laughs> over me. He goes around me and everything. <laughs> So, okay, that's good. So, yes, sir. So that's, that's what awesome. we're working on uh, right now. Well, you have to work on that because I, I even, I find myself going, oh, you know, <laughs> what's yeah. going on? You what should I do? You just what? need to get Counselor, woke. Um, I still do that when I'm in other towns and I see a cop. I'm like, oh, I better slow down. <laughs> I'm breaking the law. Um, so... Um, you know, in the final, uh, is there any more questions on community policing? <coughs> okay. Great. Um, the, uh, the last uh, strategic plan is updating equipment. I mean, this is always for every single department today. I've been listening to it, and every single department has, you know, that they need to upgrade equipment. Um, what, I, uh, what I did was I knew this was coming up. Uh, I didn't know, you know, that much, and I started asking the guys back in November, hey, you know, get some input from the from the boots on the ground. What do you all want to see? In which you know direction do we want to go with? Um, the couple of things because of the events you know that we have here and just the uniqueness of Ridoso, we're not laid out like every other community to where we're on a grid. You know, we're you some of the roads they're a dead end or they're tight. You know, every you just can't get around as quickly as you could. You know, or as, you know normal normal officers or do in other communities. So one of the things is the parades that we have, you know, and without the, uh, the one thing that I miss because we can't have it is the motorcycle. So, you know, talking to the guys, that was something that they brought up is like, hey, why can't we have a, the motorcycle unit? Well, you know, we got rid of them because nobody wanted to ride them. Remember well, I was, that one that wrecked in at the, the one parade, I rode it back to the office and then the, the other one they want to get rid of uh -huh. so is it the big harley they don't like or would we look at more like a uh, enduro type cool so what uh, i did is had them uh, mm -hmm. you know the the guys that were interested in it i said you know basic they ride bikes all the time and they're the ones that um gave the input on it and it was the harley davisons is the ones that they would uh they they proposed and they gave me information on so um, and I know back then, uh, you know, Lund and um, Bryant were the last motorcycle cops that crashed into each other. Yep. <laughs> and then shortly after that, um, it was, I don't know if you all remember this or anything, but I remember there was the issue that got into a bind because they were paying for the, con they were just uh, leased motorcycles and they were leasing them with uh, finances that they shouldn't be leasing the bikes with so that's whenever that program came to a complete halt um and then it, they never got them back because they nobody ever um asked for the money to secure it to to purchase them outright because we can't lease it with lepf money can't so what does a motorcycle cop a uh, cop's motorcycle have to you have to have on it radio siren radio, yep lights siren, um, I, I mean i'm a harley davidson guy but i can just see one of these enduros they're just flying through the trees to nab one of these meth heads or something, you know, and rope them down, but they're saying they're not interested in those. No, or the BMWs, but the maintenance Thank on, God, you those know, are expensive yeah, too. those are expensive, but yeah, it was the, uh, so they have a model system. picked out. Yes. Which ones? Uh, the ultra glide, Dino wide glide, the Dino. ultra glide, glide, the I think it, I think it fat was bob. The, they, they usually come out with a special for the police. For and it is, it's yeah. a, you know, it's a complete police package because they're not the typical ones. The suspensions are a little beefed up and stuff. So, and I think they were. The See the road glide or street glide road special? Road glide is what it was. It was the road glide. Yeah. If I heard it, I okay. don't remember it. Um, the other thing that was uh, requested was uh, a UTV, um, you know, to help out with special assignments around the, you know, for search and rescue things around the back of Grindstone, um, also for the parades and, you know, getting around through traffic during the busy weekends. Uh, a lot of times, you know, it doesn't have to be 
any particular week, weekend. I mean, there are no events. Well, in Redosa, we always have an event going on, but we used to have those weekends where we didn't have events going on, and there would still be 50,000 people in town, you know, just for whatever reason. So this is um, like a little four-wheeler. Yeah, the, the, the uh, side-by-sides. The, okay, you, you can get one for 35000 with the trailer? Yep, with the trailer. Um, and then... Oh, you know, upgrading the fleet, a purchase of two vehicles instead of, you know, typically we ask for four every single year, but just to upgrade, you know, and keep it going. Right now we're in a pretty good uh, spot with the, our fleet. Um, most everything has been replaced. We have, uh, you know, we're, we're not having any issues or anything like that. So the fleet is in good So the four, they haven't come in yet. No, they haven't. And that's, you know, everything on there is all... <laughs> You know, if we ordered it today, maybe we'd get it in January, but they won't tell you which January you know, <laughs> because of COVID. So uh, I did speak with um, uh, Phil Long with uh, Herman Sanchez. He's the, and he said they're ordered and they're on their way, but you couldn't give me a date of okay. when they'd be dropped. So um, that is all I have for my uh, strategic plan. And so okay. that's all of that will be put. We'll listen to that at capital outlay. Yes, um, we're we're keeping track of all the requests, and then you know as we uh, go through budget, we'll develop our operational budget, and then we'll identify um, how much money is available for capital pro uh, capital projects or equipment, and then the council can make a decision how they're going to handle that funding. So, in the operational budget now, we have like sixty sixty one million. Wasn't that what it was? Yes. And so that is money that's set aside. Oh, I know we've got, it's already earmarked or spent, but that's some of the money we're talking about putting towards this stuff this year, or we're talking about? Okay. Yes. Yes, during, when we're developing the operational budgets, we'll, we'll come back and we'll look at the capital requests. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the cash that we have over that, you know, and over our reserve, We'll make a recommendation on how much money goes into equipment and capital projects and right. planning and whatnot. And then the council will decide which, uh, what they want to fund, Just similar to what we did with when we funded all those projects for the streets department. Streets department Josh. Sometime back. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, Mayor, you know, one of the things I would ask the chief as he goes, go back and, um, you know, we put him back at the end of the agenda and ask him, um, I, you're missing dispatch in here. I don't see anything I see her, about but dispatch. I don't see anything on here. So I, I don't know if you um, just didn't include those, but I think you need to go back and, and develop your goals and objectives for dispatch and bring them back. So, so. do you want me to do a, a separate strategic plan with yes. five goals? For yeah, that's in the also? department. Okay. Yes. Okay, I'll do that. Or Katie. And find out what I, we I need. I thought you had one last year. No, this is all I had. Have we ever... Uh, I haven't heard an update on staffing. Are we still real, sh real short in uh, in uh, we're, dispatch. We're, uh, we're down uh, five. five. On their organizational five. chart. Oh, did I miss it? Yeah. 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 Right under we're his down um, five dispatch <coughs> positions and six officer positions. But you know, as you're starting to look forward in dispatch, you know, you've had ongoing conversations about, you know, are are we going to eventually look at. A consolidated dispatch with the county, and what does that take? What it's gonna, what is it gonna look like? And you know, from from uh, my perspective, as we look at this at this type of an opportunity, and I'm gonna just bring it right up. You know, if they come in, you know, right now, um, the way that you have that board set up, you know, it, it's not a um, an administrative board; it's more of a recommending board. And if you look back yes. at the bylaws, the way it was set, but if you add more seats to that. I, I think, you know, we own the facility, the village of Rio Dos owns the facility, we've made the capital improvements, they're just coming in on the operational end, <clears throat> so they should only have input into that operation. Or, or they buy in. Yeah, or and they buy in. We still maintain, we're never going to give up majority. Yeah, and, that, and that's the point, so are they going to accept, you know, um, you know a, a seat at the table with still a minority vote between the two other participants? Mm -hmm. You know, th those things need to be talked about. And, you know, you need to, to look at it. Is it a true board or is it just we're providing a service to them and they're paying into the service? You know, the, all those things need to be discussed. Absolutely. Put on the table because if not, you're building up false hopes. Okay. You know, there's been discussions on that. I know that there's been a change in, in chairmanship, but, you know, those are the things that you need to consider. Okay. And, 
you know, we just need to be upfront about it. It's not to be territorial, <clears throat> but it needs to be, uh, we need to be realist on how we're approaching that subject. And, you know, if, if they want to come forward, and it's just like I've said before, the county has an authority yeah. to, to impose one-eighth gross receipts tax to provide services throughout the county, including in municipalities. You know, if, if they impose that, then they have the resources to provide communication services and emergency services throughout the state, I mean, throughout the county. Mm -hmm. they, they don't have the will of doing that. So uh, to, to fund the dispatch centers and to fund EMS, you know, we're having to, to pull money out of our general fund that can be going to other services that we provide exactly. to fund those services that are not being provided by the county. Mm -hmm. okay. 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 So we look at the dispatch center, you know, I think... Uh, they're doing a great job, but it's obvious that they need some adjustments in the way that they recruit so that they can fill those positions and they can retain them. You know, and, and if we got to go back and, and reevaluate the, the pay and the incentive of what's, what we're bringing in. Well, if you just let them legalize marijuana, you would have them all hired up. <laughs> we're going to get money from that, too, here pretty quick. Yeah, so. but, but you won't get a dispatcher. Yeah. yeah. But, but we really need to reevaluate that. And come in with some goals and object objectives and how we can improve that department. What we, we have to do, yes. Yeah. I'm getting tired, Mark. Can we break? Yeah, I think we're done. We've <laughs> made these guys sit here all day. We'll get uh, Dick to present tomorrow, Dick, and then. Okay, whatever. Dick, um, we waited all day. <laughs> <laughs> Your team well, did good, Dick. <clears throat> yes, they did. Thanks, Chief. Thanks, everybody, yeah, for thanks, hanging Chief. around all day. It is a fun process. This, this is only second to budgeting, and so. Yep. Um, no. I think you're fine, Dick. You know, you're, you got enough experience that you don't need. Ron and I will hold your hand if we need to. <laughs> Mayor. We'll be reconvening at uh, 9 a.m. Okay. Thank you. Don't we have something else in the morning? Thank you, guys. Thursday morning. We have a Thursday morning. Special meeting. Huh? Oh, it's okay. on the agenda. Closed session? Uh, oh, heck no. On Thursday morning. Mm -hmm. Haircut. Oh, Thursday. I'm getting a haircut tomorrow? They're canceled out. Well, I've got a municipal executive meeting that they called for tomorrow at 1045. That was one of the meetings I had back there is that you got Hobbs, Carlsbad, they are whining on this um, destination tax. Uh, Carlsbad